Hey, hey, one, two.
the position is this. We have a massive preference for using Slido for a variety of reasons, not least that it gives me ultimate control over what we ask, which I like. Uh, if you put your hand up, I might ask you. But we have a micro one of the other issues we have at the moment is because half our team is away at the moment, thank you, Glastonbury, uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, we have a shortage of people to take microphones around. Uh, so if you do put your hand up, and if I do ask you, you're going to have to stand up and shout. Okay. You see, if they could bring that sort of compromised logic to bear on the Northern Ireland Protocol, <laughs> David, we would. I, I don't mind helping with the microphones if you need a microphone carrier. Oh, God, we can't start recruiting the audience. That would be a whole. No. <laughs> we don't do change. I'm sorry. <laughs> change is awful. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Well, welcome, everyone, to. Uh, what we call our annual conference. We had our first annual conference uh, in 2016, about a week before the referendum, as I recall, where our keynotes were Ed Miliband and Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that much of the debate remains exactly the same <laughs> as it was on that day, which accords to my sense of things never changing. Uh, Usual rules apply. If at all possible, use the Slido, please. I mean, we will try and impose that. It makes things slicker. It makes things easier. It makes it easier for the chair to lump questions together, to find themes. And it also keeps our online audience, which I'm hoping is significantly bigger than the audience in the room, engaged and gives them an equal chance to participate in what's going on. Apart from that, I think you all know how things work. And if anything's unclear, you can ask me as the day unfolds. But without further ado, uh, let me kick us off by welcoming Lord David Frost, former Minister of State at the Cabin Office and Chief Negotiator of Task Force Europe. Indeed. That's quite a good title. Uh, David's full remark should be appearing on our website any moment now if you want to either read along or read them later. But David's going to make some remarks and then has very kindly agreed to take questions on Slido if possible from the audience. So David, without further ado, over to you. Great. Thanks, Anand. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to, to be here six years on, uh, as you say. Uh, feels like a moment to think about things. And um, it is a bit of a pity that the debate has not moved on in the way <laughs> we, we thought it might have. But I think it should. And um, I'll say a bit about that as I as I talk. Um, is Brexit working? That's my um, exam question. And um, I'll cut to the chase and probably not surprise any of you uh, by saying up front that I think it is working. Um, I don't think we have any cause for regret about the decision the country's taken. Uh, and the solutions to the remaining problems that we have are not to be found in going backwards, but they're to be found in completing the process and following through on its logic. So perhaps more interesting, perhaps, um, than the answer to the question is why I give the answer to the question. And in setting it out, uh, I want to make five points. First of all, crucially, Brexit is, a dem is about democracy. It's about ensuring decisions for this country are taken in this country after proper debate, and I think that's now beginning to happen. Second, although most of the hard work is done, Brexit is not complete yet. There are things still to do, most obviously in re-establishing arrangements in Northern Ireland which support the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, but not only there. Third, the view that Brexit is hitting us from an economic and trade perspective is, in my view, generated by those with a bit of an axe to grind on this subject and cannot be supported by any objective analysis of the figures. The UK has grown at much the same pace as other G7 countries since the referendum, and as the ONS have pointed out, our goods exports to the EU are at the highest level ever. Fourth, Brexit is not a thing in itself. Um, and this is where we come on to, you know, where the debate needs to change. It's a necessary gateway to what should, in my view, be a project of national renewal. And I think the government needs to get on with defining and implementing that project. And fifth and finally, I ask the question, what about our partners? Does the EU actually want Brexit to work? 
can it rise above the current frictions and work with us as a partner, or will it continue to hassle and lecture us? So let me take these five points in turn. First of all, then, Brexit's about democracy. That's a crucial test. As we all know, the few reliable polls about the drivers of the referendum result show that the most important reason behind it was to ensure that decisions about Britain are taken in Britain. Obviously, that's a slightly simplistic formulation. Every country is affected by external forces, clearly, um, especially a very open one like Britain. So I would phrase it more precisely to, to me something like, to ensure that decisions about the laws in force in Britain are taken in Britain, that decisions about international commitments are made with the consent of the UK government, and that British institutions are sovereign within the UK. And that's what we sought to achieve, the Boris Johnson government, in delivering Brexit after the middle of 2019, and it is, I think, what the government is still intending to do. So the description I've given is, of course, a description of the legal regime prevailing in most countries in the world. Only in Europe is it regarded as an eccentric thing to think that countries can manage their own affairs and relate in a constructive and open way with others uh, without depriving themselves of self-government, without sharing their sovereignty, without accepting some degree of formal supervision from outside the borders. And it's a pity that that's regarded as an eccentric view in Europe, because my view is that national democracy and the nation state are not just the normal way, but the best way of organizing a country's affairs. Where people have political debate, where they talk openly and honestly about the trade-offs between different options, you get different levels, better levels of engagement in politics generally, you get greater buy-in to the results. I think we are beginning to see this in Britain. Look at an area like trade policy, uh, hitherto highly technocratic, run by lobby groups focused on Brussels rather than London, but I think now much more the subject of debate in our own parliament, with more discussion about the trade-offs and the options, and with the rapid creation of lots and lots of lobby groups, notably in agriculture, perhaps much more quickly than I had thought, in fact. Moreover, in Britain, we can now change everything by elections. We can change things for the worse or the better, and it's the job of politicians to win the arguments and stand by the results. In EU countries, many things can't be changed by elections, especially for countries in the Euro. Trade policy, monetary policy, much of fiscal policy, employment policy, much of environment policy, and so on. So I don't find it particularly surprising that we see such churn in European party structures or we see such high votes for anti-system parties like those we saw in France over the weekend. So in my view, democracy counts. Brexit automatically delivers democracy. So in that sense, it is working. Second, unfortunately, Brexit isn't fully complete yet. We are still paying the exit bill. Uh, though it must be said that the sums involved, though large though they seemed at the time, uh, obviously seemed dwarfed by the subsequent cost of the, the pandemic and the payment and debt we've taken on since then. We're still subject to Court of Justice jurisdiction until 2024, not only in Northern Ireland, but also in the rest of the UK, uh, for any infringements before our exit. And the EU has indeed already begun one such case for, in my view, transparently political reasons. It's only really at the end of 2024 when the money is paid largely and the court role has largely disappeared that the last relics of the EU system have disappeared. Though even then, we're still committed to supporting this so-called independent monitoring body for citizens' rights, at least until 2028, and even then we can only wind it up uh, with the EU's agreement. But of course, the biggest problem is in Northern Ireland, where the delicately balanced compromise that we tried to put in place in 2019, recognising we were running high levels of risk in doing so, has come apart much more quickly than certainly than I thought, and I think most people thought. It's unfortunate that given all the sensitivities, in my view, the EU has refused to look at that compromise again and has refused to help us put together something that would properly support the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and enjoy proper cross-community consent. In these circumstances, I think the British government has no choice but to act as it is doing. 
its responsibility for the integrity of the country and for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement must be paramount. Third point on the economics. There's a lot of noise around at the moment. Uh, it's unfortunately quite difficult to have a reasonable and rational debate about what the statistics are telling us, uh, if anything, and I don't think they're telling us much at the moment. Because of the determination of a small group of people, uh, for example, the European movement to latch on to any number, usually out of context, and treat it as evidence that Brexit is, quote, failing. And I think only when this culture war has finally abated are we going to be able to have a sensible discussion about the numbers. Uh, but meanwhile, let's do what we can, looking at trade and the broader economics. So on trade first, I think the crucial point to make is that a decline in trade numbers is not the same thing as a decline in GDP, although you could be forgiven for missing this when you listen to some uh, anti-Brexit campaigners. It is, of course, true that some academic work has tried to establish a clear linkage between trade, productivity and growth, and it's that work that underpinned the 2018 Government Economic Service report and whose zombie figure of 4% GDP decline is still quoted by the OBR and others as if it were an actual fact. In my view, and not only in my view, that of other economics, uh, economists, economists, this link is overplayed. Those studies primarily look to the effect of opening up badly run ex-communist, ex-authoritarian, semi-autarchic economies in which opening up was producing huge improvements in the policy regime generally and in which the gains came from these broader improvements, not just from trade. It's in my view much more questionable and in my view far from established whether small changes in trade make any meaningful difference for advanced economics economies at the production frontier like the UK. And we are talking about small changes. There's a huge amount of noise in the figures, obviously, uh, because of the pandemic, because of supply chain disruption, because of trade diversion, because of the ONS measurement changes, which mean there's a discontinuity between this year and all the earlier figures. And now the war in the Ukraine, which has brought significant changes to oil and LNG flows via the UK. So it's hard to be confident what, if any, changes in UK trade are due to Brexit. Obviously, this is going to become clearer over time. Uh, but meanwhile, I think anyone who draws firm conclusions from the figures is not really being honest with the data. What we can be confident about, I think, is that it doesn't bear the catastrophism that some seek to attribute to it. And as I said at the start, the ONS said this month, I quote, EU exports have increased for the third consecutive month in April 2022 and are at the highest levels since records began. They also note that our trade in services surplus is actually increasing, despite all the predictions. So overall, it's obvious um, one wouldn't be being intellectually honest if, if one tried to deny that leaving the customs union and the single market will have some impact on trade. Obviously, it will. Uh, for what it's worth, I think it's reasonable to assess the figures we've got so far as plausibly showing our goods exports are maybe 5% below what they otherwise would have been. But the performance is continuing to improve, and this may change further as figures and trade normalises. And I do not think it's going to have any measurable impact on our GDP one way or another. As for GDP itself, uh, the study produced by the CER again last month has had a lot of attention. Um, unfortunately, I don't believe it's, it's sort of doppelganger methodology is particularly sound or a reliable basis on which to draw conclusions. Graham Gudgeon of Policy Exchange has produced a lengthy analysis of the problems with it, which I, I won't repeat now. But, but I, I will just note the fact that it changes the doppelganger group for different purposes in the study and has also changed the group compared to the previous version makes one doubtful about its predictive powers, uh, as does the fact that it doesn't properly factor in differences in the cyclical positions of different economies or huge differences in the policy regimes over time, such as the Biden stimulus in the US. In my view, at the moment, the only sound conclusion we can draw on GDP is the one that policy exchange do draw, which is that, and I quote, 
A more straightforward comparison with the major economies of the G7 reveals there is no obvious Brexit-related lag in the UK's economic performance measured by per capita GDP. The UK economy has grown at much the same rate as the G7 average since the Brexit referendum in 2016." End quote. Fourth point. Brexit should be just the beginning of a broader project of national renewal for this country. Brexit is a gateway. We have to go through it. It isn't a thing itself. It's, the crucial thing is what it frees up by way of choices, by way of agency for this country. And in my view, one of the, the harmful effects of EU membership, I've said this before, was that it gradually deprived our policymakers, politicians, civil servants alike of agency. It fostered a belief, not always or even often acknowledged, that we weren't capable of solving our own problems on our own. Every policy initiative had to be Brussels proofed because of the reach of the principles of EU law, non-discrimination and so on. The creep of EU law in areas like citizenship squeezed out areas of discretion. And there was generally a strong habit of consulting Brussels on many issues because of the potential impact on competition law, possible state aid effects and so on and so on. And I think we can actually see the effects of these habits now we've left. Our policy elites, I think, have lost the habit of defining goals, creating strategies to deliver them, crafting policies that support the strategies. They found it very difficult, and we can see this now, they found it very difficult to draw up genuine proposals for liberalisation and changes in policy regimes now we've left, even on pieces of legislation that we opposed when we were members. It's almost as if we've forgotten how to govern. I've no doubt this is going to change over time, uh, where there are immediate pressures and immediate challenges, we are showing we can and do act differently. This was true on vaccine policy famously, where although we may have had the formal right to forge our own way as an EU member, I've no doubt we would certainly not have done so. It's even more obvious at the moment on Ukraine policy. We always said that outside the EU, our ability to act quickly and decisively, to lead and set a policy agenda, would be more important than having a one-eighth share, or whatever it is, in the policy of a larger entity, and so it has proved. But the task now is to devise a meaningful programme of supply-side reform focused on boosting the productive capacity of the economy and to drive it through. And I made no secret of my view in recent months that so the government has not tackled this anything like energetically enough so far. And if Brexit is to produce a visible economic payoff, then the government's going to have to raise its game very significantly. I do hope that the process Jacob Rees-Mogg launched yesterday will kick off a different approach. Uh, and we look forward to this Brexit Opportunities Bill, which is going to follow. The crucial thing for me is, will it have a robust sunset clause or not that really changes the incentives and makes a real difference? Finally, my final point, does the rest of the world actually want us to succeed? Actually, of course, most of the world seems blithely unbothered about Brexit one way or another. Certainly doesn't see it as any sort of difficulty uh, for them or for us. In the US, the party split on Brexit is, I think, gradually waning, uh, despite the noise on Northern Ireland. We've heard a bit less sniffiness from Democratic Party elites and think tankers since the start of the war in Ukraine. And this, I think, has made them realise our value as an ally and our capacity to shape events, in part, independently. The question is obviously really about the EU itself, by which I mean the policy elites, of course, not the average European citizen. So far, their, ob their observed behaviour isn't particularly encouraging. It is, of course, open to the Commission and their allies amongst the Member States to insist on every word of the Northern Ireland Protocol and to take us to the Court of Justice if they want. We could, of course, open arbitration ourselves for the refusal to deliver on the commitment to join Horizon, but we don't behave in the same way to the EU as they do to us. It's, of course, open to them to police UK goods trade as if it had not come from a friendly neighbour with a highly reputable and transparent policy regime, even though we don't do the same to them. It is, of course, open to them to treat every UK tourist as a potential overstayer, to refuse any change to standard Schengen and future ETA terms, to forbid use of e-gates, and so on, even though we don't do the same to them. 
And through all this, we have to take lectures about the decline of trust and international law, while at the same time, the Court of Justice asserts its own superiority over international arbitration rulings, and the EU itself ignores WTO judgments when it suits it. And when it has been German policy to ignore warnings about Russia for many years, and as a result, major EU member states continuing to pay large sums for Russia for energy, which helped finance this evil war in Ukraine. In these circumstances, the lectures we take land badly and do not help. The question the Commission have got to ask is whether any of this is actually in their strategic interest. Do they want the UK as a friendly and collaborative neighbour or a disgruntled one which is looking elsewhere? Do the Commission and key member states see it as in their interest to sustain the current UK trade policy, which is actually a massive trade preference scheme for the European Union, or do they want us to actively look elsewhere? And an interesting question, would Poland and France, to take two countries at random, would they give the same answers to those questions? The EU may feel is stronger if Brexit sort of fails in the sense that further secession will look less attractive, and that's obviously been a big driver of their policy. In reality, though, the EU will be weaker because it will have shown itself to the world as an entity that lacks self-confidence in its ability to reform itself and find collaborative relations with its neighbours. And in that sense, the West overall will be weaker, not stronger, if the EU insists on going down this road. And that bigger picture for the West does matter. It's so important that we find resolution to these issues in a collaborative way. In my Churchill lecture in Zurich in March, I set out areas where we could find, if you like, a new entente cordiale, with the EU more open to changing the protocol, us being more willing to look at foreign policy collaboration with the EU, and some mutual de-escalation on various border and visa issues. That still seems a possible way forward to me, but it does take two to do it. It's really up to the EU how it wishes to proceed. Uh, and to conclude for our part, our destiny is now in our hands as a country. We can, and I hope will, succeed whatever the EU does. It will just be more difficult for everybody if it insists on being difficult rather than collaborative. It would be much better to put the history behind us on both sides and concentrate on making this new relationship work. There's absolutely no reason why that can't happen. It just takes vision. It just takes will. Thank you very much. David, thank you. Uh, judging from the smoke emanating from this iPad, you've provoked uh, <laughs> I thought quite, I might. I must quite a few people. Yeah. Can I just say, which I forgot to say right at the start of the day, that please do vote for the questions you want posed to speakers or panellists, because that makes my job a lot easier. Uh, and it makes it easier to be populist if you can just show your support for uh, which questions. I've got a couple of questions just to, to kick us off. I suppose the first one is to turn the question, your exam question, on its head and say, what evidence would convince you that Brexit had failed? Not that Brexit has been done badly by whoever happens to be in power, but that actually you were wrong. I mean, it's... it's it's an interesting question. I think, um, I'm not sure I ever, it is ever going to be clear in that sense, whether it's succeeded or failed, because so much else is going on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, extracting the causality about this um, is, is always going to be extremely difficult, I would say, and the counterfactuals, and we, we know about that. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one, one piece of evidence of failure would be if we are still debating this in five, six years' time in the same way. I think, you know, if it's to succeed, it needs to settle in the British polity, and mm -hmm. there needs to be broad consensus that this is how we're going forward. I don't think we're quite there at the moment. Um, but I, I am not sure we'll ever get kind of economic um, evidence Mm -hmm. one way or the other that is going to, to prove this. The tests are broader, the tests are about democracy as well as economics, and as I say, that's already established. Okay, and, and, and the second one, you said uh, this is about democracy, and you seem to define democracy as decisions being taken in the UK. Mm. 
But an important question there is by whom? Because for some people, what you've seen post-Brexit is not just the UK taking back control, but the executive ex executing an enormous power grab, uh, either by its attitude to the courts or by its use of statutory instruments or by the sort of bills that you see in Parliament replete with Henry VIII powers. I mean, for decisions to be democratic, who should be taking them? So, I mean, it certainly doesn't feel like that when you're in the executive, I've got to say, <laughs> that, uh, you know, that we suddenly uh, were able to kind of make our will tell. Um, I don't think it has been like that. Um, I think it's very exaggerated. I don't think anyone particularly, you know, thinks Henry VIII powers are ideal, but sometimes they're the only way through to, to achieve things. Um, I think that... Um, the point is these things are open to national debate. The precise balance by, between the executive, the legislature and the courts, um, and obviously that latter point has come out, has already been mm -hmm. discussed quite a lot this morning because of the Bill of Rights. Yeah. Um, that, that all those questions are up for national debate and can be changed by national debate. Uh, I think this country has proved pretty good historically at resolving those questions through normal politics and finding a balance between the different powers that, that works. And I don't see any reason why we shouldn't, that shouldn't continue. So for me, it's certainly not about, you know, exerting the power of the executive. It's mm -hmm. about bringing the balance home so it can be discussed meaningfully in the UK and if necessary changed. Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a question here from Paul Giles. I mean, it goes back to the referendum, which I suppose on anniversary day we can do. If you go back to that campaign of 2016, he asked which of those, based on which criteria from the Leave campaign can you now argue that Brexit is working? So, I mean, linking today to then, I suppose. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know, um, you know, whether it's an easy answer to give, to be honest. After we didn't le actually leave the EU until four years after the, the mm -hmm. campaign, or at least the, leave the economic uh, aspects of it. So we have, you know, a, 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 such evidence there is, is based on a very short, short period. I, d I don't know whether there's a lot of value in a, a kind of rerunning what was said during the, the, the referendum campaign now. After all, you know, a, an immediate economic crash was also predicted by the Remain side, and that definitely mm -hmm. did not happen. Um, so, you know, I think you, if you went through the, uh, the leaflets and the commitments, you'd probably find both sides' as predictions had been, mm -hmm. some had been validated and some invalidated by events, but that's just real life that happens. I don't think it changes the fundamental issues that were at stake in that referendum campaign about democracy, about control, and so on. Okay, I mean, I, I buy the point about this being about democracy, but can we just I think we should, we should turn to some of the economics now. Uh, and the question from Jill Rutter, which I think sort of gets to the nub of some of these debates, which is, would, would the government, you, you accept that Brexit might cause some uh, problems economically, though you dispute the scale of them. Mm -hmm. Do you think one of the problems we have is because government is just fundamentally unwilling to acknowledge any of those problems, it makes it harder to tackle them. Wouldn't it be easier if everyone was just a bit more honest? I, I definitely would. I mean, it's a general problem with government, obviously, that it finds it difficult to acknowledge failure. Yeah. And, you know, that's why you get so many zombie policies being kind of continued and while well, the world moves on. Um, and I, I don't think the, um, the Leave campaign, I, I mean, I don't mean during the referendum, I mean generally, um, I don't think it's really helped itself by uh, kind of ignoring some of these trade-offs and certainly as long as I've spoken publicly I've always said that there is uh, if you go back to my Brussels speech at the beginning of 2020 in that I said obviously there's a cost in leaving mm. the customs union the single market I think it'd be much better to be honest about these things and show where the um, the possibilities for doing things better really existed rather than sort of pretending that um, nothing is is going on and that's why I, I mean, as you, you well, you, you, you heard what I said in the speech. I don't think it's reasonable to say, um, you know, as some 
pro-Brexit people do that um, nothing to see here in the figures, don't bother looking at them, you know, there's, it really is not important. I mm. don't think that's fair. You have to look at the figures, they're telling you something. I just don't believe they bear the constructions that are put on them at the moment. I mean, I should add that quite a lot of people in this debate don't actually go, go further than that and simply make ad hominem attacks on the people who are raising the figures rather than actually talking about the substance. I, mean, I think that's true of both sides to an extent, but I don't know if you saw the report put out by the Resolution Foundation yesterday. I've seen reports of it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we now have some evidence, don't we? It's not, we're not just talking about forecasts. And what was quite striking in that report was two things, I think. Firstly, that they said that economists had been wrong to forecast a fall in exports to the European Union because they seem to be holding up quite well. But the data suggests a relative decline in UK openness and comp competitiveness, mm. which over the medium term would have severe consequences for the economy. I mean, what did you make? I mean, you haven't read it, yeah. so it may be an unfair question to ask you. No, but I mean, I think it's based on the same um, uh, a sort of fundamental economic view that I was critiquing in the speech, that there is a linear connection between openness and... Um, uh, and growth. And I don't think it's it's like that. Um, otherwise, I mean, for one thing, you get to the sort of reductio ad absurdum that the, the logical conclusion is that is that every country's better off if it imports and exports all its GDP and mm -hmm. imports it all from somewhere else. Uh, if, if there is that direct link, at some point, that link no longer is, is true. Um, and I th certainly think at the production frontier margin, it is it makes a sort of relatively little difference. Second point, though, um, you know, the degree of openness in our own economy, the degree of competitive forces bearing on it is to some extent in our own hands. You know, we should have a much more active competition policy in this country. Um, there are plenty of areas CMA could look at and for whatever reason chooses not to, we should be getting down our own tariffs much faster so there's much more competition uh, on our own market. There are lots of things we can do mm -hmm. to, to change that balance and we definitely should. It's obvious that leaving a customs union a single market has an impact on openness but that's not the only thing that's going on and that's why I'm you know, a little bit frustrated that the government isn't moving faster to do some of these things that actually would, would make a difference. I mean, would you accept that Brexit is having some impact on the cost of living crisis? I, d I mean, honestly, I don't know. I, d I don't think you can, you can say that if you look at inflation figures across Europe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 they move around all the time, but they're all in a, a band where there is a serious inflation problem and if you isolate food prices in some European countries they're going up higher and in some countries they're going up more slowly so honestly I don't really think you can say that I don't think the data um, stacks it up at the moment okay uh, we've got have you are you not able to access the Slido I've run, I, I've cycled 40 miles here. all right if you've got a very quick question then go ahead Question time or Parliament, uh, people could be, uh, if, they, if they lied, for example, they would be tasered. <laughs> Do you agree with it, that premise, David? Uh, if so, would you like to take the uh, clinical trial first? But more importantly, I suppose you're not. You have, if you don't have a that. question, can you sit down? Because we're short of time. And oh, there are... Does he agree or disagree with the question? That's the question. Thank you. Um, has Brexit devalued truth in politics? No, I don't think it has. Um, uh, I, 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 I think British politics has changed quite a lot in the last um, 15, 20 years. Um, and I don't think Brexit has been a big factor in uh, the content of our political debate. I could make just as many critiques ad hominem and otherwise of, um, you know, how we got into the Iraq war and so on. I think there are uh, uh, tendencies and processes in the way we do politics that are a bit problematic, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. Uh, but just one comment on this truth in politics and, you know, is somebody lying? Are they telling the truth? I think 
I, I do think this oversimplifies it. There are relatively few questions in politics where somebody says something is black and it's actually white. Actually, it's usually more complex than that in policy terms. It can be, it depend, very often depends what you are trying to do with a policy, uh, whether it um, is successful or not, whether it works. I, th I don't think there are, it is possible to say very often that you know, statements are clearly misleading, clearly wrong in black and white terms. I think you have to bring context to, to these things. You have to look at what people are trying to do. And a proper political debate will um, make sure the truth comes out. And I've said before, you know, on the question of COVID, what everyone thinks of lockdowns and all of that, what happened in this country, and it didn't happen in many others, was that it was not possible to shut up a group of uh, a segment of political opinion that said lockdowns aren't working, we don't need to do it again in uh, last Christmas. And in the end, that won the argument. And, you know, that strength of political debate, refusal of some groups to be shut up, a force of debate about things takes you in the right position. I think that's a much better way of solving things than having some, you know, kind of body, a grand version of full fact that says you're telling the truth and you're not. Okay, well, seeing as you mentioned full fact, I mean, surely it is wrong that the Prime Minister can repeatedly make the claim that is factually wrong about there being more people in employment than pre-pandemic, having been corrected by the Office of National Statistics, corrected by full fact, and then serially repeating it. There's something wrong with that, isn't there, in our politics, that that can't be stopped? Well, I don't, I don't know who would stop it. I mean, I wish, I wish you wouldn't say things like that that are obviously <laughs> not true. I'm not going to defend making um, factually incorrect statements, but, but in the end, um, you know, it's for the Prime Minister's own party and, and MPs mm -hmm. to decide, you know, is that how they want to do things or or is it not? I don't think you can have a, a kind of um, a body of platonic guardians that comes down and says you can't yep. say that. Okay. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left and we can't end this session without talking about the protocol, I don't think. So uh, I suppose the first question, I, I hear this is a question that the current Foreign Secretary hates, is why are you not applying it? You signed it. And not only did you sign it, but the government's own impact assessments told you how the EU would approach the implementation of this thing. And a bunch of Brexit supporters who had in part based their case for Brexit on the fact that the EU was unnecessarily legalistic can hardly credibly turn around and say, we never expected the EU to be so legalistic. I mean, wasn't so this all... Very, would, very predictable. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it like that. I wouldn't say that, you know, we, we, we never expected it. Um, what I think we could reasonably have expected, because there are provisions in the protocol requiring it, is a more sensitive implementation of some of the provisions. For example, the provision that says everyone should try and minimise checks and controls at Northern Ireland ports. Mm -hmm. you know, that, nobody's ever really tried to do that on the Indian <coughs> side, as far as I can, I can see quite the reverse. We have the, um, whoever it was, the, the Commission's auditors coming and complaining about the fact that people's luggage isn't being opened when they mm -hmm. go from GB to, to Northern Ireland. That's, that's not what it's, what it's about. Um, but I think there's a real, there, I, I do think that the, the real world test is important, that you know, whether you like it or not, um, we hoped that this protocol would support the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and would be supported um, in time by both sides. And it hasn't. It hasn't been supported by both sides. It is undermining the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. We have to look at it again. I think there's just a kind of real world thing going on that means you've got to do this. And as I said before, um, uh, you know, our treaty with France over juxtaposed controls, which is quite a sensitive question, has been renegotiated three times, usually at French request, because we've had the circumstances of change. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see what is so unreasonable and unusual about this that it should be refused. OK, I mean, that's the sort of border issue. But what are, I mean, one of the things in the current debate is, uh, and that was in your command paper 
uh, when you were still in office was the desire to remove the role of the European Court of Justice. But the European Court of Justice hasn't done anything yet. So what could possibly have changed about the role of the court in that agreement uh, since you signed it that makes you want to remove it now? How do you justify that? Well, I, I, I mean, the, the protocol includes two provisions, obviously, mm -hmm. for um, dispute settlement. It does include normal arbitration and it includes infraction. And I think, you know, it is reasonable to expect that in a circumstance like Northern Ireland, you might use arbitration before immediately going to the court, um, which is in principle an internal EU mechanism. I think that it is true no issue has got to the court yet, but we've now got three infraction cases. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the EU's knee-jerk response over the imposition of grace periods was not to open discussions, it wasn't even start arbitration, it was immediately to go to an infraction process which will end up in the courts. And I think the, the real world way this has been used um, means we're right to be highly suspicious of the role of the Court of Justice in future in this protocol. I think it was more, I mean, maybe we're naive, perhaps we were, um, but for me it was a long stop arbitration is the normal way of resolving these things. If it was egregious kind of ignoring of things, um, that's different, but it's not been used like that. And, uh, you know, after one of these, if the EU asks for urgency, one of these cases is going to be in the Court of Justice pretty soon, and we will be presented with the reality of this question quite quickly. But do you think unilateral action via the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is the best way of either resolving the dispute with the EU or of dealing with the genuine problems that there are in Northern Ireland? I think it's the only possible remaining way, unfortunately, after, you know, it's now nearly a year since the command paper last year, mm -hmm. um, which I, I think was a reasonable way of resolving it. Um, of course, we were willing to talk around it, uh, but there's been no serious discussion of the, the, pro the, the problems that we put forward. The ideas the EU put forward last autumn and repeated by Marosh a couple of weeks ago, I mean, they don't get close to resolving the politics of the, the issue in, in Northern Ireland. And I just don't see what, what alternative is, is left, to be honest. Would it not have been less incendiary to try Article 16 first? Well, I mean, I must, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued as to why Article 16 isn't there. I, I think there are some traces in, for example, the government's legal opinion that suggests they mm -hmm. haven't ruled it out as, as a way forward yet. And obviously it would enable you to act much more quickly than the bill does, because it's obviously going to take some time to go through. Um, so I'd, I, my impression is it's not ruled out as a, as a way forward if things continue to deteriorate but but it is it is only a provisional solution i think what the government's put forward will be a definitive solution at least in uk domestic the uk domestic legal order and that is important for clarity okay and, and finally i mean in your in your speech you set out what is a very ambitious agenda for brexit of national renewal do you think this government which is increasingly weak, within which we have a Prime Minister who is spending, it seems, most of his time battling for his survival, is capable of delivering anything like that vision? Well, I hope it is. Um, I mean, that's partly why, anticipating that, is partly why I made my comment about um, uh, uh, people have forgotten how to do strategy and politics and define goals and so on. I think this is a general weakness in our governing class at the moment as mm -hmm. we get used to having our hands on the the levers again in a way that we haven't in the past um i you know i i'm not sure what more i can say other than um i don't think it's got to grips with the problems so far and i hope it will in the next two or three months Are you confident I'd, let's let's see what happens Okay. <laughs> David, thank you very much indeed for coming and speaking to us today. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks. I'm hoping that the next panel will appear as if by magic on the, right. on the stage. We can go and get ready.
You can get him. We should flank him. Flank him. Hello, hello. I'm going to call this call this session to order. If we far too much chatting and enjoyment going on in the audience. We soon put an end to that. Um, right. Well, this session is about geopolitics, and it's really about how the Ukraine conflict uh, has changed the international landscape. And of course, uh, given the topic of the conference, uh, Europe and the UK's uh, interactions. Uh, with one another and, uh, and with uh, Ukraine uh, to the east and with Russia, of course. And I think hopefully we'll also find time to consider the effects, the, the geopolitics in the sense of energy, energy supply and to what degree that dominates uh, the European response or conditions it. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have a, a great panel. Uh, Professor Margaret Macmillan uh, on my right, of course, who many of you know. I know she was in the earlier session, uh, formerly of St Anthony's. Uh, but as you know, a distinguished author on war and the history of conflict, and Sir Simon MacDonald, who headed the Foreign Office and was therefore our Chief Diplomat and Permanent Undersecretary at the FCO. And joining us online, we've got Ben Tonra, Professor of International Relations at UCD School of Politics, and Dr Maeve Ryan, Senior Lecturer in History and Grand Strategy at King's College London. Now, uh, what we're going to do, I think, I I'll get each of the panellists to just give us a minute on in a sense, their sort of standout impression of, of how the um, conflict in Ukraine might have shifted the geopolitical landscape. And then we're going to pick up some of those and work with them. And, and hopefully, obviously, we will have time for questions at the end. So, Margaret, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind giving us a minute on um, how you think the landscape has shifted as a result of the conflict. Yeah, well, one of the things historians try and do is see what is different and what's the same. And what I think is different um, is what Russia has done, I think, is, first of all, it's, it's created a Ukrainian nationalism stronger than anything it could have imagined. And that is going to now be a geopolitical factor, I think, in, in the center of Europe. It has made itself much more dependent on China. And I think that is going to play out, um, I think, for Russia and possibly for China. Um, this was not the way it was meant to happen, of course. So far, Putin's aggression seems to have revitalized the West, or at least parts of it, and we're all aware of the divisions, but that's the nature of a democratic alliance. But it seems to me that the Western countries, and this, of course, is not a geographical term, it's, it's more a, a values term, because it includes Japan and Australia. Um, Western alliances and countries in the West have had to think about what they think is important and what they think isn't, and they've had to think seriously about what they do about war, and I would say the final thing, and, and there are lots of others, but the final thing I keep thinking about is that we're now seeing war back again as an instrument of state. Um, we've seen since 1945 very few state-to-state -state wars. We've seen occasional acts of aggression to seize territory, but by and large in the international community, and I believe such a thing exists, we have not seen seizure by force of territory recognized. And norms matter in international relations, and I think Putin's war has just blown straight through that. And it looks like he will hang on to at least some of what he has taken by aggression. And that's a very dangerous precedent because there is pretty much no border in the world that can't be challenged. And I think what he's done will give encouragement to others. Right. A lot of food for thought there. Simon. Thanks, Mark. Um, two points from me. One, I think it uh, shifted the essential focus of uh, uh, foreign policy. Uh, from the actual strategic problem of the century, which is the rivalry uh, between China and the United States, 
I think that is still the big picture, that at the end of the century, we will people look back and say that is the thing that shaped events more than any other. But in the short term, it's now all about Russia, even though, as Margaret says, China is there in the background at the same time. Um, a second thing, for more parochially, for the UK, it's, it's dramatized for me quite early on uh, the disadvantages of being outside the European Union um, because uh, every conflict needs a forum in which the key conversations take place amongst um, uh, the key players of the international community. And from outside, it seems to me that the EU is, as, is using this crisis um, to drive forward its agenda uh, the EU sees itself as leading this uh, crisis response, and in some ways they can make a really good case, and part of that will be on display today at the European Council when Ukraine will be invited to join the EU, even though that moment is far in the future. The political signal of that moment is very, very important. And as I say, we are not there. Um, there are other things being cobbled together. Actually, the country that's leading the international response is the United States, um, but more than any crisis I can remember, the Europeans are sort of pressing to be co-leaders, uh, and not to be part of that action feels to me a penalty for the United Kingdom. Thank you. Uh, Maeve Ryan. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, I suppose... I think about the um, Ukraine crisis, the global energy crisis, quite interlinked way. And I would say these two interlinked crises are not in themselves likely to uh, remake world order. Um, but I would say that they, in some fundamental respects, will lead to very serious changes and challenges to that order. Uh, and particularly just by accelerating trends that we already uh, knew about, we were already worrying about. Um, sometimes it's in uh, some unexpected way. Um, and I'm inclined to think about order in this sense in two, uh, two different ways. One is the kind of aspirational future world order that we talk about, that normative world as it should be, the values and, um, and the ideas that we're holding up and the kind of future we as the West are interested in trying to build. Um, and then there's the impact on the more kind of descriptive or, um, uh, or sort of uh, uh, yeah, descriptive sense of ordering systems, the kind of... Um, uh, physical and tangible infrastructures um, that help to govern and direct flows of, of, of people, money, data, and, and so on. And so when we look at the stress of this crisis on that more tangible, let's say the real side of, of ordering systems, we see some really profound stresses and shocks and, and those that have you know, really quite significant geopolitical implications. So, I mean, some of the obvious ones around st uh, stresses on supply chains, uh, testing again, the resilience of some of these systems, um, showcasing you know, what we've seen actually several times in the last few years about the need to think really smartly about what the future looks like, how we protect uh, some of those critical supply chains, food, uh, medical supplies, and many other things too. Um, stresses, of course, to energy markets and the nightmare scenario maybe is what we're seeing playing out here, that nightmare scenario that many warned of around too much uh, integration of Russian uh, hydrocarbons into European energy markets. Um, and of course, major stresses in international law. I mean, it's the sort of the really big one about what do we do um, uh, as an international community to adapt to and respond to Russian uh, strategies of brutality, mass atrocity crimes, you know, what are the consequences that need to be um, in the system to maintain the credibility of systems in international law against these sort of uh, unignorable patterns, really, of war crimes, crimes against humanity and so on. But then in the more immediate sense, the stresses to international legal and financial systems that have been created by um, essentially attempting to disconnect Russia from uh, from international uh, ordering uh, systems and to try to isolate and and, uh, and uh, remove Russian connectivity. This is a profound and very serious experiment, uh, experimental phase that we really don't know what the consequences are going to be. I don't think there are many useful uh, analogies to draw on here, and there are you know plenty of other sort of shocks to various other types of systems too. And then on the more aspirational kind of normative sense of, uh, of order, the implications for that, you know, the crisis um, has, asked, has raised some really important questions about how we think about and try to uh, shape future world order. And here in the UK, the, uh, the integrated review of 2021 uh, centred this 
strategic objective of shaping the open international uh, order of the future. And that reflected the fact that you know, these trends, uh, these, these shifts in international order and some of these geopolitical challenges didn't begin with the invasion uh, of Ukraine in, uh, in uh, February 2022, or indeed the invasion of Ukraine in 2014. These have been trends that have been going on for some time and, and reflect a need for states that consider themselves to be part of the West to um, help to keep open and, 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 and create viable alternatives for states that are uh, seen you know, in the sights of some of these aggressive state actors, Russia, of course, and, and also China, seeking to uh, remake the rules and, and norms of international order. So I would say the Ukraine war has, if anything, accelerated some of these trends and, uh, and has kind of underlined the importance of that as a strategic priority. Um, and as, as you know, as, as Margaret mentioned, you know the you know the the, the, um, the existence of Russia as a key state threat, as, as a source of disorder, China as a systemic rival. These are all, um, you know, I think accelerating and will continue to accelerate uh, in the years to come. So the question I think is is not uh, if, but precisely how, in the aftermath of Ukraine, we as the West um, want to tr seek to shape that order and, and and see how it can be shaped. Um, and I would say that's shifted slightly as we as we observe the responses of some international stakeholders. Um, and I think, you know, finally, that I would say that the, the war has probably helped to shape the way uh, openness and resilience are being conceptualized um, and how some of uh, some of the conversations we're having around, uh, you know, changes we can make, decoupling strategic industries and, and developing more autonomy, pursuing strategic advantage in, in science and technology, amongst other things. Um, so I think that imperative towards thinking in a more smart way, in a tougher way, um, uh, and in a slightly more integrated way, both within our own um, uh, sort of state entity and also uh, across the various alliances. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you, Maeve. Uh, ben Tonra? Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. Um, I think I'd have to start with, uh, with quibbling a little bit with the framing of the question. Um, I don't think it's a Ukraine crisis. I think it's a Russia crisis. Um, and it's a Russia crisis, of, a, a crisis of Russian imperialism, a crisis of Russian militarism, and at least to some extent, a, a crisis in terms of the socio-political decay of the Russian state and Russian society. Um, now, we were warned of this. Many colleagues in Central Eastern Europe and the Baltic states told us that this was potential. Um, many of us didn't listen or didn't listen hard enough and didn't take the necessary lessons. And now we're going to have to pay a much higher price as a result. In terms of what's changed, I'd say that I put two things on the table. One, cycle, the first, psychological. And that is to say that all the old assurances of European security are now torn up. Uh, we have to recalibrate, we have to rethink, we have to reassess. That's happening very effectively in some parts of Europe, particularly in the North and the East. It's happening very badly in some places in the South and the West. And I think the big problem for us is, is Germany. Um, I think Germany has recalibrated at a rhetorical level, but we're seeing the challenges in terms of putting that into practice. And the second change that I'd highlight is, is the institutional one. Uh, and what we're seeing here is a, is a far greater overlap now, just in terms of pure membership between the European Union and NATO. I think that has implications for each institution respectively. And I also have, think it has implications for US-European relations. Now, we have been very much blessed by the presence of a committed Atlanticist in the White House, but we can't assume that that continues. We can't assume what happens in 30 months. And while I appreciate that the, the point that's been made about the centrality of the United States in European security, uh, I think it actually makes the conversation about European strategic autonomy all the more salient and all the more urgent. Because as I say, we don't know what happens in 30, 32 months. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. Well, I mean, you touched there on sort of assumptions or, 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 or variables in the coming months uh, and year or two. And I, I think they are uh, enormously important and, and uh, potentially have vast impacts in this. And I'm just going to pick up actually on both of, uh, on a couple of things you mentioned, Ben, and then, and then um, we'll take it forward with Margaret and Simon and then come back to you two online. But the first of those, uh, when Ben described this as a crisis of Russian imperialism, uh, and clearly there's a big historical dimension to this question about Russia and, and being able to find peace and its neighbours and their fears. Um, <laughs> Does this change uh, dramatically if Putin were to die or, or, or fall from power in the next year or two? Or is it wise to assume that any future Russian leader would also have some of these things as, as part of their agenda? I think we, I, speaking for myself and, and most of people, the people I know, we've all been hoping that something will definitive happen to Putin um, and not in a good way. I mean, you know, no, with, there's been all this speculation. He doesn't look well. He looked a bit puffy. Is he gripping the table too hard? What does it mean? 
Um, the trouble is, given the people around him, he's likely to be succeeded by someone as imbued with his worldview and as, as thuggish and as willing to use the sorts of methods that the Russian army is using in Ukraine and that he used in Chechnya and Georgia and, and Syria, inclined to use those methods. Um, you know, I think there is, and I, I, if I can just, I'm not putting in a plug for history exactly, but what has struck me during this crisis is how often historians have been asked their views, um, rather more than political scientists, I think, um, <laughs> which I'm just noting. Um, but I think, I think to understand Putin and, and therefore to understand the people around him who presumably share his worldview, we have to know what that view is. And it is not the same view as the West, and it's not the same, or Western Europe, it's not the same time frame. I mean, I think he really means it when he says, my predecessor, Peter the Great. He really means it when he wants to reconstitute what he sees as the greatest extent of the Russian Empire. And I think, I suspect that those around him will probably think the same sort of thing. And that's certainly what the official media is promulgating, and that's what's being written in Russia. So, um, if our assumption is that either Putin stays or someone similar, or uh, heaven forbid, worse, comes in, so uh, defense budgets, attention, all of those things in this part of the world remain conditioned by that. Um, then, of course, Ben mentioned the possibility of a Trump presidency. Uh, what does all that mean for the European dimension of defense, uh, for the Indo-Pacific tilt? Um, are we just spreading everything too thin? Should we be circling the wagons in this part of the world with both soft and hard power? Or do we have to be in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific? I mean, what, what, what are our horizons going forward, right. Simon? Well, Mark, you've asked me so many questions. You've allowed me to <laughs> say what I in want one. to say. Um, uh, first, on, on Putin. Uh, uh, as Margaret says, he is comparing himself to Peter the Great. But what is also interesting in Russia, and they do it with all their leaders, is who other people are comparing their current leader to. And other people are comparing Putin to Peter the Great, who is at the top of the tree. Um, so it, it, I think it's significant if he goes, whoever succeeds him is, is not going to have the same authority immediately, whatever their wishes. So his departure, whilst you know, doesn't change everything, I think it would be uh, significant. Um, second, yes, we do have to look at our budgets. Uh, this is ex extraordinarily difficult um, because our economy is growing very slowly. Uh, since the financial crash of 2008, our uh, uh, sort of base economic growth has, has, has gone down by a whole percentage point. It used to be about 2.5, it's now about 1.5. This is separate from Brexit. Uh, and this means that uh, the UK is only doubling its economy every 60 years now. Um, new government spending mostly comes from this extra money and there's not very much of it and there are many other things that we need to spend money on. Uh, and as a country, we find it very difficult to have that conversation across the full policy piece. Um, but if the defence budget is to grow, and I can see a compelling case, well then other budgets will have to decrease and decreasing the social care budget or the education budget or the transport budget will be immensely controversial. Uh, last point, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, European strategic autonomy is on the agenda, but personally I find it very difficult to believe in, especially in the new circumstances, because the United States, however you look at it, provides 40% of defense capability in the continent of Europe. And so um, if Europe is to be properly autonomous, Europe has to replace that. And I don't think that is uh, imaginable uh, in the short term. Uh, last point on the tilt. You see, tilt was already a significant word in the integrated review last year. Tilt is something small. You know, if you read the detail, our neighbourhood remained the most important part mm. of our world view, and we've been reminded this year of just why. Um, let's bring it back to Ben, just picking up on what you've said, Simon, which, which uh, uh, the difficulty of replacing that 40% of capability that comes from the US in Europe. And Ben, what you said about when you described the German approach to the crisis as rhetorical, 
I mean, if in this scenario in which it looks seriously like uh, we're, we're, going, we're heading for a second term Trump presidency, I dispute that, but go. Yeah, OK, well, uh, uh, well l l give us both variables in that case, uh, 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 a Trump presidency or not, uh, shifting US perspectives away from Europe. How does Europe, if you like, fill that security vacuum? Ben. Sorry, Mark, is that direct to myself? Yes, indeed. Yeah, well, very, very quickly, what I'd say is, and I agree with Lord MacDonald, you know, I, I don't underestimate at all that the difficulty of filling the 40%. The question to my mind is, what if we have to fill the 40%? Um, perhaps it's not Trump in, in uh, Trump, Trump 2 uh, presidency, but perhaps it's even worse. Perhaps it's a smart Trump. A smart <laughs> Trump backline. I mean, there are a lot of people in the Republican <laughs> Party who are, who are designing themselves as Trump Mark II, and they are smarter than he was. Uh, so there's not an unreasonable possibility that you have a U.S. administration that is not just reluctant, but refuses to subscribe to the Article 5 security guarantees on which European security is based. And Europe then has to find 40 percent. And again, I don't underestimate that difficulty or that challenge. Absolutely. Um, uh, let's bring Maeve back in. Uh, Particularly, uh, um, obviously, I know where you're speaking from, Ben, but uh, if th there's a sort of Irish dimension here, too. A lot of people saying Ireland uh, feels rather bare now in security terms, particularly if it, if it all has to come down to a, a sort of European dimension. And there is a question which, so I'm going to mix these in from time to time from Catherine MacDonald. Is it not confusing to use the word Europe when EU is meant, particularly in the context of foreign affairs? But uh, my question, I suppose, Maeve, would be, for a country like Ireland, which is not in NATO, um, how, how does this evolving security uh, environment play out? I mean, does it create a pressure to join NATO or does it uh, create a pressure to intensify European... Uh, oh, uh, I've made the mistake that Catherine MacDonald um, flagged up. Does it intensify the pressure to intensify European Union defence cooperation? Uh, well, that's a great question. And um, before I answer it, I would just like to throw my weight behind uh, the the uh, the joy it is to be a historian and always ask sure. you know your opinion, and also to be able to weigh in constantly and say things can get worse. They can get so much worse, <laughs> and they may get so much worse. You know, the possibility of what might happen uh, with the collapse of a Putin regime is far from it's far from clear that that would be in our interests in the West. And, you know, I would just echo what my fellow panelists have said about this. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with Shashank Joshi from The Economist recently about this, and, and he, he pointed this out exactly that, you know, the um, you know, we can't discount so many worse things happening, you know, the the um, the appearance of. Um, a stab in the back myths, even in the case of a Russian defeat, the appearance of a stab in the back myth that favours authoritarian populist successors. You know, the, the possibility that you know, we see an unwelcome degree of continuity between Putin and, and whoever his successor is, and that things basically get an awful lot worse. The collapse of the Russian state and violence and fragmentation that would come from that, and then all the questions around the custody of nuclear weapons. So, yes, things can get worse, and we should hold our nerve, um, but be mindful of that. So, to your question, um, about Ireland, I mean, I, I'm afraid my accent might be giving you the uh, mistaken uh, <laughs> impression that I'm really plugged into Irish debates. I've been living here for well over a decade, and I'm afraid Ben would be far more qualified to speak to the mood in Ireland on this. Um, I would be giving you much more my my own view about what Ireland should do and the future of Irish neutrality, but I am mindful that Ben has, has written with far more authority than I have about Irish neutrality. I would like to see the conversation move forward, and I would like to see um, the question of neutrality um, engaged with and, um, and interrogated in a serious way and not simply assumed to be part of Irish identity. Again, coming back to the historical point, there was, you know, there were reasons why Ireland uh, assumed a neutral position at the time it did, and it's far from clear to me that that needs to be uh, a, a permanent feature of our, our role in the world. And I would like to see that debate happen uh, as soon as possible. But Ben, perhaps you could... Yes, you could absolutely. Tell us ben, ben, come back <laughs> on that. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this very, 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 very short. Um, I mean, Irish neutrality is an irrelevance um, in terms of the in terms of the, the geopolitics that we're talking about. I mean, this is an entirely domestic conversation, uh, as as Maeve says, wrapped up in identity, wrapped up in history, wrapped up in old animosities. I think there is a new realism uh, coming about as a result of Ukraine, and I think a debate has started, particularly about Ireland's European engagement. But more importantly, in terms of geopolitics, to see what's happened in Sweden to see what's happened in Finland, yeah. to see what's happened in Denmark, really does underscore the earlier point about this overlay and overlap between, between NATO and the European Union. And while I don't want to have a face-off between historians and political scientists, um, I, can, I can match you disaster for disaster um, in, terms of, in terms of the analysis of 
from international relations on what's going on. And as a final point, just to bring China into the equation, and I'd be curious to hear others' reaction, I wonder whether Russia really has now declared itself as an Asian power. Um, and, and, and the border between East and West now is in the Donbass. Because Russia, to me, seems as though it has, it has made that strategic choice to become China's coal pit, China's gas field, China's timberland. Uh, and Russia now is China's laboratory to see what it looks like when a modern state is torn from globalization. And China is looking and watching and drawing lessons for the potential of its own special military operations in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, perhaps even in the Philippine Sea. So we really are looking in geopolitical terms at something that is really striking and has huge consequences, not just for the world, but for global, not, not just for the West, but for global politics. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pick up another one from the, uh, from the uh, tablet from Martin Westlake. Is Macron uh, right to argue that the West must necessarily think about and plan for post-conflict engagement with Russia? Now, he, he came out with this line about not humiliating Russia, and then he, he seems to have changed his position on his recent uh, visit to Kiev. Um, but this question about uh, accommodation or in some sense not, uh, not humiliating the country or somehow finding a modus vivendi when the guns do fall silent, I mean, how problematic is that, do you think, Margaret? Well, it will be. I mean, there'll be such bitterness in Ukraine. Um, every time they look at a picture of a village that's been destroyed, you know, and people will know people who, who've been killed. Um, I think it's premature. I think Macron has his own motives. Um, you know, he, the French have always had the memory of Napoleon. I think it, it, and he seems to me to suffer from that syndrome, perhaps more than some other French presidents. And, and this idea that they can be the arbiter of, of Europe. I think it was premature to start saying this. I think he's right that when finally a military solution and, and an armistice is reached, that there will have to be serious thought given, and perhaps before that, to how Russia is dealt with. Um, and I think it is important to separate the Russian people from the Russian regime mm. and, and not see all Russians as, as tarred with the same brush. But at this point, I think since Putin's and his agents have shown absolutely no willingness to negotiate seriously, I don't think it's actually all that helpful to say, you know, we have to really think about how we deal with what happens after. A lot is going to depend what the military, a lot is going to depend on what the military situation is on the ground when the guns stop firing. I, I want to sort of develop the Macron thought in a way, Simon, which is, um, I, I mean, I think one thing which one could almost see going on in his mind during some of those statements is his desire not to inflame that significant sense of French public opinion that is Russophile or even Putin admiring. And in the sort of horseshoe of French politics, you have that both with the far left and the far right. Uh, and of course, we know they did well in Parliament. People also talk about that, that tendency in the SPD in Germany. I just wonder to what extent, as we try to shape some sort of relationship uh, with Russia uh, in the, on the ruins, if you like, of, of, of all these Ukrainian communities, that sort of desire to accommodate, and not to humiliate, uh, becomes difficult for the UK in a way as an actor in this to, to, to sort of acknowledge or in some way fit in with. Um, okay, I agree that the domestic politics are easier for Prime Minister Johnson than either Macron or Schroeder, um, that the UK has never really been a Russophile country mm -hmm. and British business is not nearly as dependent uh, on Russia as business in either Germany or France. Um, you know, one of the not very publicized facets of the last three months is that French businesses have kept going in Russia. Mm -hmm. They have not closed like McDonald's or even uh, a lot of German businesses. Um, so, yeah, Macron does have um, a challenge because I. I do not think he should appease that part of domestic opinion. Um, humiliation is, is a really loaded word. I, I don't think we're in the business of um, humiliating Russia. I think we're in the business of ensuring that Ukraine does not lose uh, and that Russia is not left in a stronger position militarily um, compared with before it began this adventure. And it began this. There was no um, uh, plausible 
provocation in my analysis. This was a war of choice for imperial reasons. So Russia being back in Russia's rather uh, extensive borders, I think is an, an okay place for us. And I would not call that the humiliation of Russia. I would call that Russia being in its own borders. And, and just quickly following up, it, it's pretty clear that whether it's about allowing grain to, to, to go out through the Black Sea again, or indeed coming up with a sort of enhanced armistice, Minsk III, whatever you want to call it, the Russians will demand the lifting of sanctions. And I think we should resist that as long as Russia is on Ukrainian soil. Um, so part of the task which uh, Ben has alluded to is, is you know, separating uh, Russia out from the Western economy. Um, this is really difficult, but I think is important for our medium term. Uh, the Germans are doing this. I mean, you know, people pile in on Germany. Uh, I was there for um, five years uh, in the last 10 as British ambassador. Uh, I can tell you that this is an earthquake in German politics. And even though the actions ha haven't caught up with the Titan vendor rhetoric yet, things are underway. And I think, it, you know, we could give them a few months or the rest of this year before we make a judgment. But they are committed uh, to massively increasing their defence budget by 100 billion euros. And they are reducing their energy dependence. Um, and one of the most impressive European players on, on all this uh, policy uh, since the invasion has been Robert Habeck, who is the vice chancellor and the head of the Green Party mm. in Germany. Uh, and I think he is looking like a very strong and plausible and even more important leader in Germany in the medium term. Yeah. Right. But, uh, I with your assumption or, or, or desire that we shouldn't uh, reduce sanctions on Russia, um, I wonder whether that uh, accelerates and intensifies the emergence of separate blocks, increases Russia's reliance on China in all sorts of, uh, both as an energy market, but also in, in terms of its supply chain issues. Maeve, um, you've got geopolitics in your, in your job title, so uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you... Uh, whether you think an intensification of a sort of almost two-system two, um, uh, world, a, a divided world, rules-based order on the one side, uh, Russia, China on the other, is, is an inevitable consequence of this. And where does a country like India uh, fit into that? Mm. Um, really interesting question. Um, I mean, the way I think about international order is, is, is kind of multi-layered. So the rules-based dimension of it is just one of the layers. And I think you know, the challenge to what we think of as Western ideas and, and, um, and, and uh, uh, let's say, convergence with and, and, uh, and the ways in which we've profited from and benefited from a rules-based international order, uh, I, you know, I can absolutely see the risks that there might be, uh, you might, what might emerge from this, um, particularly if things continue to go uh, as badly for, for Putin as they have, that we start to see this, um, you know, the, the 4th of February joint statement between Moscow and, and Beijing kind of playing out as a genuine um, close convergence, even kind of, um, I, I wouldn't go so far as necessarily to say alliance between Russia uh, and China, but that's obviously a source of major concern that we start, to, that we see, you know, the emergence on the Eurasian landmass of, you know, a major block of, of authoritarian uh, aligned states, you know, suck, sucking in a kind of a centrifugal way um, uh, other states of a similar kind of alignment. Um, I think for, you know, not just for India, but for broadly um, those across the Indo-Pacific region, this has, you know, this is raising some really important and interesting questions. You know, it's, um, as we, you know, we saw, uh, you know, really noticeably um, a non-committal response from some actors in that space. Uh, and I think everybody's basically just waiting to see how that shakes out. I mean, um, you made an, uh, an allusion um, uh, earlier on to the, uh, to the ways in which um, Russia is, is kind of is playing out as a laboratory uh, for some uh, for China and some, some experimental ideas about the way in which that power access might evolve. I think it, it's it's fair to say that it's really difficult to know at this point how that's going to play out. Uh, what what will be the, the the nature of that convergence and and what what will be its offer to other partners? I mean, when you look at India, 
Um, it's possible, I think, to overstate the uh, the alignment between Russia um, um, and India. Obviously, um, Russia provides a huge amount of military hardware and, and maintenance, and in that sense, very, very difficult to disentangle the defense relationship. But in other respects, actually, the, the relationship is re relatively underdeveloped, and I think there's scope for some optimism that if the West um, you know, uh, if the UK, you know, and, and various other allies with their Indo-Pacific strategies actually bring a significant offer, a sustained offer, something that isn't just a flash in the pan, but that is genuinely integrated across the piece and, and, and offers a genuine and viable alternative to states in that region, then I think we could start to see some really interesting movement because they're far from, you know, ciphers or drones that will fall under some sort of inevitable great power sphere of influence. I, I, I'm, I'm, not a, um, I'm not a fatalistic at all about that, but I think we need to be tough. I think we need to be smart. Smart. I think in Britain we need to we need to work really intelligently with the EU in that respect, um, and I think we need to make sure that what we're offering in that region is a viable alternative and offers you know something that keeps that free and open uh, international order that we all speak about so much, and we need to put our money where our mouth is. And that's going to be difficult in the coming years. That's going to be difficult to generate the uh, the capital required to do it. It's going to be difficult to generate the public consent and to explain to people who can't pay their energy bills or who are uh, using food banks why it is that we need to have a, a forward presence in the Indo-Pacific. That's going to be a hard sell. And we need to think very carefully about how we do that. But it's very important. Maeve, thank you. I, I'll correct myself. Of course, you don't have geopolitics in your job title. You have grand strategy, <laughs> which you've just demonstrated uh, uh, with that magisterial answer. Ben, uh, can, I, can I bring it back to you? I mean, I guess the, the immediate future, and, and indeed some of these questions about how much we can, uh, in European societies, commit to defence, given all the other headwinds, will partly depend on how this current round of fighting ends. Uh, and uh, how we see that happening. There's a question that's come in from Dilip. Why is the UK pretending that Ukraine is winning or can win the war with Russia when it's consistently been losing territory in the Donbass for the last two months? Now, uh, without necessarily agreeing on all the assumptions there, uh, I would say it is apparent that uh, most Western countries have simply adopted this rubric of uh, well, you know, it's up to Ukraine, essentially, to consider the question of, of territorial uh, concessions. But it, it is surely becoming uh, clear that Ukraine is unlikely to reconquer those lands it's lost in, in large part uh, in the coming months. You don't agree, Simon, but um, we'll, we'll give you a shot on this in a moment. Um, let's say it's going to be very hard for them to reconquer any, uh, in substantial part their lost territories. So when this comes to an end... Um, to what extent should countries like the UK uh, and other uh, EU countries, US, be trying to shape the armistice or, the, uh, or, or should they live up to their rhetoric of simply leaving it to Ukraine uh, to decide the terms on which the, the guns fall silent? I think, I think Ukraine has paid and is paying a sufficient price that that is, that is their entitlement, that they, de they determine the terms of a cessation of violence, if a cessation is to happen. And let's bear in mind again that a cessation of violence is not the end. We have, we have similar conflicts, similar frozen conflicts in, 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 in other parts of the Caucasus and in Eastern Europe. Um, and this is, part of, this is also part of the, Russia's grand strategy. They have, they have created, fostered and maintained many of these frozen conflicts. Um, so again, you know, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine is, is, is my view. Now, of course, you know, Ukraine's partners have a, have a say in terms of in terms of how that might be shaped or at, at the margins and, and what support logistical and, and, and economic and financial they provide to Ukraine. But I think, to be blunt with you, I think Ukraine is entitled to that 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 decency and that courtesy to determine its own future. Simon, uh, obviously you you're nodding in agreement there, and that seems to be the political imperative in this situation. But one hears that the five billion a month needed to keep the Ukrainian economy afloat is becoming harder to collect each month. So the European countries might adopt that line as their political line, that this is all down to Ukraine, but they might be more reluctant to support the country in various ways. I mean, how does this equation play out between backing uh, and therefore having some kind of influence versus unconditional support? A couple of points. First, this is the most important thing we're dealing with politically in the world. 
And, you know, the idea that we can't scrape together the money to keep the basic Ukrainian economy on its feet, and that would cause us to think, oh, well, let's give Russia what it wants, I, I think is pitiful. I mean, you know, the big stuff costs, the big stuff involves pain for ourselves, um, and I think our government and governments across the West should be clearer about that. But I think this issue is that important, that it requires quite some sacrifice from us. But as all the panelists agree, the, 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 the country, the people that are sacrificing most are the Ukrainians, and they are sacrificing everything. Um, and second, the idea of the end. Uh, I think this is something we just need to uh, uh, unpack a bit, because even in, in the short term, uh, I see uh, at least uh, three distinct phases, I mean in the next nine months. Right now, the Russians are clearly doing better than they were at the beginning in the area of operations where they've concentrated, in the Donbass. So at some point in the next couple of weeks, Severodonetsk will fall to the Russians. But they have, both of the sides have really fought each other to a standstill. I mean, they've, you know, they're just exhausted. And at some point in the next couple of months, they will need a pause just to regroup. And maybe that will look like the end. I do not think it's the end, because I think both sides will very consciously be regrouping. Uh, and one of the things that will be happening on the Ukrainian side is all the kit that has been promised by NATO allies will arrive, and the Ukrainians will be trained in the use of that kit. So then you have a period that lasts probably through most of the winter. But come spring next year, the third phase, when they start fighting again, but the Ukrainians, I think, will be much more capable than they are now. And that is why I was shaking my head at the idea that they, they can't take territory back. Because I think uh, with, for that phase, uh, in the first half of 2023, they, because they are fighting for what, <laughs> their own territory, they, they are fighting for their lives, they are fighting for their dead countrymen, I think that I could easily envisage greater Ukrainian success on the ground in 2023. It, Margaret, you mentioned in your opening remarks the, uh, the sort of crucible of Ukrainian nationalism and how from this fire something very strong is emerging. And it, it, it felt, it's felt at, at times in recent months very sort of mid to late 19th century to me, sort of blood and iron and, and, and out of this is coming this uh, extraordinary nationhood with the, with the Russian speaking citizens, uh, for the most part, just as signed up to it uh, as, as the Ukrainians. So. Uh, how does that and the kind of long war scenario that Simon has laid out, uh, where possibly we're, we're preparing them for the next round during any armistice, uh, uh, affect Western policy or define Western policy during the coming months? And should it, in a sense, be, as he's implied, a, a blank check? Well, I agree with Simon on this one. I do think it is extremely important because it's not just what happens if Putin gets away with it, because he's already clearly got his eye on Lithuania. Um, he's got his eye on Moldova. Um, Belarus is sort of more or less under his thumb, but if it steps out of line, he'll squash it, um, which is why I think the Finns and, and, and the Swedes have, have done this mm. extraordinary reversal. I think they've recognized what this means. Um, and I think, yes, what's happened in Ukraine, and, and it is not always, but it, it can be a war that, that brings people together. And I think it's made Ukrainians who had, goodness knows, their divisions before the war started. I mean, I think Zelensky's approval ratings were 25%. But he has, I think, helped to create a sense of that we will stick in it. And one of the things I think that has told very much against uh, Russia is, is that factor which is so difficult to count. And I think that's why a lot of us, a lot of the analysis missed it, was morale and fighting for something you believe in. I mean, the mm -hmm. Russians are throwing in, in raw recruits. Apparently, I was talking to a couple of people yesterday who, who've been following it very closely, and they said that you know, captured Russian soldiers have often had no training. They've just basically been sent in to fight. Now, what that must be doing to the morale of, of Russian forces, and conversely, what it must be doing to the morale of Ukrainian forces, I mean, I think you know, we, we will see, I think, a much stronger Ukrainian nationalism. And what will be interesting is when peace comes, will that shift begin to shift the focus of, of Europe eastwards? Because you have now a much better relationship between Poland and Ukraine 
you know, which had its problems. But that relationship, I think, has also been strengthened. So we may well see a much stronger sort of sense of who they are and purpose among those countries over in the East. And that will affect Europe and affect the, the, the balance of gravity in Europe. I'll come back to, to, to Maven Ben in a moment, but Simon, just listening to what Margaret was saying about President Zelensky, um, the, the, the Ukrainians have clearly paid a terrible price. Uh, even after 2014, it was, it was, in a sense, impossible for them to contemplate signing over the Donbass to Russia as, as part of a deal. It was an immensely problematic uh, political question in Ukraine. And all the more so now, we assume. I mean, is there a sense in which uh, continued warfare remains a kind of dominant national imperative for both Ukraine and Russia, that, that, that they have no reason to resolve this conflict? Uh, I think they have every reason to resolve it, but what you're describing will make it very difficult for them to resolve. Uh, but uh, as Margaret said repeatedly, the emergence of strong, coherent, uh, enduring Ukrainian nationalism is one of the key things that has happened. And Zelensky, the clown, the actor mm. who had terrible approval ratings at the beginning of the year, is now as important to Ukraine as Winston Churchill was to the United Kingdom in the Second World War. He has been completely transformed by the invasion uh, and, and I think has won admiration, deep admiration, way beyond Ukraine's borders. So as he sort of embodies this new spirit. Uh, so um, uh, Ukraine is a factor in a way that Mr. Putin really didn't consider before he started. For Putin thought of Ukraine as a, a sort of a, a, a renegade province. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was naturally, inevitably part of Russia in his mind. And he thought history supported that view. Well, the facts created since the 24th of February all show him that he's wrong. <laughs> mm. He also anticipated, because of 2014, that there'd be a big collaborationist yeah. uh, well, movement among Russians and Ukrainians, which was also yeah. a, a huge miscalculation. One interesting thing is, is the difference between Crimea and the Donbass. I mean, Crimea yes. was always more Russian, and even um, in, uh, under Ukraine as an independent country, Crimea had separate arrangements. It was an autonomous republic within Ukraine and was only Russian since the 1950s. Khrushchev, a Ukrainian, gifted this um, territory to his home province because he didn't think it mattered. <laughs> but it turns out it mattered a lot, but it's still different. I, I, I can envisage a negotiated uh, settlement which sees you, Crimea not returning to Ukraine because that is the democratically expressed, internationally supervised wish of people in Crimea. Yes, I mean, uh, there is a conflict obviously between the Russian uh, view that they've annexed it, it's now part of Russia, and the fact that the rest of the world does not recognize that uh, and regards it still as part of Ukraine. Um, we've got just under 15 minutes left. Um, and I, what I'd like to do in this last uh, uh, sec section of the, um, of the discussion is come back to a sort of very UK-centric uh, perspectives because we've been on the broad uh, uh, landscape there of geopolitics and we've discussed all this uh, at a high level. Um, and I think I'm right in saying I'm only supposed to take questions through this device. And we had one earlier for Maeve, which is about uh, the legal order and the fact that the UK attitude, whether it's to the Northern Ireland Protocol or through the Bill of Rights, uh, could be seen by some as being rather challenging to legality and treaties and all the rest of it. Uh, and I wonder to what extent, in your view, Maeve, that plays into uh, either empowering or weakening the UK as an actor in this crisis going forward? Um, sorry, I'm just mindful that there's some traffic noise outside. So if you hear some honking horns, I don't know what's happening in Southeast London today. But anyway, um, 
So I, I think it's a really interesting question and a really important point to make, you know, that uh, it's all very well kind of holding forth about what, uh, you know, the, the highest principles of international, uh, uh, you know, moral and, and just behaviour should be. And then uh, and then turning around and being seen to contravene international law quite fl uh, flagrantly, or at least talk about it or threaten it. So, uh, yes, it's absolutely a very valid question uh, to be asked. Um, I guess... Uh, the, I guess the, what I would come back to here is you know, when we're speaking about Ukraine and when we're speaking about the sort of principles that we're holding up um, in terms of you know, uh, Britain's uh, position on this, I think Britain has actually behaved quite well on this. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a, one of those um, moments in foreign policy where uh, you, know, you, can really, uh, you can really look at this as, uh, in, in lots of ways, um, you know, really standing with the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian people um, in a really meaningful way. And I would say from, from a very early stage, and, I, and it seems to me anyway, uh, from, from at least from the outside, not, not involved in the process, it seems uh, to have made a material difference to the outcome of the war and the ability of the Ukrainian people to defend themselves. And I think it's really important not to get away from, you know, the, just the basic facts of what happened has happened here. We have, uh, as a European, um, uh, as you know, members of this European system, we have watched uh, a, a powerful um, um, uh, state invading a, a democratic uh, neighboring state, who, who's uh, whose only crime, if it were, as it were, is to have uh, sought to pursue uh, a different path and a path towards uh, to, towards democracy and, and towards you know alignment with its Western neighbors. Uh, we've seen over 12 million people displaced. Um, and you know we've seen major major implications you know uh, holding in in lots of ways um, the world and especially the global south uh, hostage um, through uh, you know through the, uh, the blockade um, of Ukrainian food exports and so on. So I think it's absolutely right that a state like Britain should stand up and take a strong moral position along with other allies. Uh, I, I I don't think that that excuses bad behaviour in other respects. And I think uh, you know I, I think uh, threats and uh, and um, uh, um, and problematic international legal behaviour. You know, uh, I think that they're slightly separate things. Um, I, I don't think it undermines the fact that we should be standing with the Ukrainians. We should be recognizing the fact that they're the ones who are taking the most risk. I strongly endorse um, Simon and Margaret's points here. I don't see functional normalization with Putin uh, or with, with any Russian government um, in, in a way that does not immediately um, um, uh, fulfill the desire and the expressed wishes of the Ukrainian people. I don't think that we should be driving that. I don't think we should be deploying any principles of international law or any arguments about pragmatism. I think that would be, frankly, uh, um, uh, an insult to all the people who have sacrificed their lives and their homes uh, to defend their homeland against this completely uh, unwarranted aggression. I think that you know, allies have been surprisingly united and focused on our response. That's one of the quite positive things that seems to have come from this. And if you were being really positive, you might say that some of the shocks to the international uh, energy markets and um, and so on might lead to, you know, uh, more sustainability and better you know, unity and, and, and other major transnational challenges. If you're being extremely optimistic, but the core of this is that uh, allies have been, uh, sorry, the uh, NATO allies who have been supporting Ukrainian war efforts should continue to do so. Should continue to arm Ukraine. And under international law, we're absolutely solid on this. We're we're, we're simply um, uh, we're simply uh, using our Article 51 right to help a state that's been uh, defended or that's been uh, invaded, to help them defend themselves from unprovoked aggression. So I think we need to stay the course and remember that, that that's the role we have to play. Uh, and I think we need to remember that if we want to be credible, and for all the other reasons I mentioned too, about you know the, the role that I think the UK needs to play in, in, in other strategic theatres, including the Indo-Pacific, I think we have to be serious about our credibility too. And so I think, um, you know, I, I think behaving well and subscribing to international norms um, uh, would be beneficial in that regard. And I would be very keen to see that happen. Margaret, uh, while we're on this sort of UK centric topic, um, you, you referred to a sort of French uh, uh, historic concept of being the arbiter of Europe. Yeah. And I wondered to what extent do you think we have fallen into a sort of, uh, you know, Castle Ray 2.0 balance of power? Do, do we have any illusions like that? Or are we uh, accepting of our limited role in this and, and can take credit from being a a leader in supplying certain weapons to Ukraine very early on in this crisis and having influence because of that? Well, I think you do have illusions of it. I mean, it's a long-standing British policy to try and keep a balance of power in Europe and to intervene where possible. Um, I just don't think you're doing it very well. I'm speaking, I'm speaking as a Canadian, I'm seeing it from the outside. But, you know, if you want to um, help to build a, a unified European response to what's going on in Ukraine, and the British certainly have, I think, been very active in, in giving weapons to Ukraine and continue to do so. But if you want to build a unified response, 
at the same time as picking quarrels with Brussels, it doesn't seem to me the most useful policy. Um, you know, that, that you, you are on the one hand um, threatening to tear up international agreements and you know, the, the, the rhetoric is, is getting silly, I think, and I, I, Brussels is, it has its own share of blame for that. On the other hand, you're saying we must all stand together. Um, you can understand why the European powers, the other European powers are a bit bewildered. Mm. Ben, where's the sweet spot now for the UK in terms of, you know, pursuing its uh, national agendas in this regard versus uh, trying to convene a, a, a more coordinated European response and, and uh, you know, ensure that it's a, a thought leader, I suppose, in, 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 the, in the Ukrainian uh, war? God knows, Mark. Um, I had, <laughs> I had, I had the great privilege of, of going to your to your embassy here in London um, to, to celebrate the uh, the jubilee uh, of Her Majesty, um, and you can imagine that the kind of audience that gathers for for a British embassy garden party is not full of rabid nationalists and republicans, um, even in Dublin. Um, and the tenor of the conversation, quite genuinely and, and heartfelt for, for people who believe both in the Anglo-Irish relationship and, 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 and the UK as a, as, a, as, a, as a power, our question was, what the hell has happened to you? Mm. Um, it, it, it's a question that, that, that is quite profound and very serious, um, but it is, not, it is not the Britain that we recognize. Um, and I did hear um, uh, David Frost earlier in, in a quite a what I thought was quite a defensive and prickly kind of intervention, um, speaking about how you know far right populists have 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 shattered party systems uh, elsewhere in Europe. Um, well, far right populists have captured one of your major political parties, and and <laughs> it is it is a genuine conversation piece to ask you know where is British democracy going? Because for those of us in the field of political science, you know your foreign policy is a reflection of who you are. Um, and there is, as I think Margaret has suggested, something of a discontinuity in terms of what Britain wishes to present itself as and what its politics are delivering. Mm. Now, I've left Simon to last on this because it, my, my, I'm convinced that with his experience at the Foreign Office, if anyone can square the circle uh, or the multiple geometric uh, shapes that we've been talking about, about how on earth does Britain... Um, have a major influence on policy while at the same time pursuing national interest and uh, <laughs> emphatically making its points over Northern Ireland, the other things that Ben was talking about. I mean, what would your advice be to the Prime Minister over the next few months as to how to sort of calibrate U Ukraine well, policy? Well, a couple of points. First, on Northern Ireland, an agreement can clearly be made. Uh, both sides need to move. Uh, that means both sides must compromise, but if both sides do compromise, there will be an agreement. Uh, at the moment, not only in London, also in Brussels, there's a feeling that the other side is the one that needs to make all the movement. Yeah. And I just don't think it's right. But I think you know, this is very, very important. There is a, a lot of attention on this issue now. So I think both sides are incentivized to make the agreement which is there for the taking. Um, second, we've got to stand up for what we believe in. I agree very strongly with what Maeve said, that um, uh, it's, it's not difficult, I think, to make compellingly to a British and then an international audience the case for supporting Ukraine right now. Uh, but we, and we are, I think, putting our money where our mouth is. I think we were, um, uh, if you like, early adopters. That, uh, the British were supplying uh, impressive kit and training uh, from even before the uh, invasion. And I think that has helped uh, the Ukrainians. And I think that is one reason why Zelensky has a strikingly uh, warm relationship uh, with Prime Minister Johnson. Um, but even in Ukraine policy, where I think we're doing the right thing, we need to have uh, and we need to recognize that we need better connectivity with uh, Brussels. Uh, one area of policy where the UK really drove things when the UK was a member of the European Union was sanctions policy. Uh, so my opposite number in the EAS, she, she looked at me in almost despair, thinking, well, when you go, all my expertise in this crucial area of policy is going to disappear. And sanctions is, is not a completed picture yet. 
And so the idea that you know, we, we've got what we need and we now need to defend that, I, I don't accept. The, the sanctions picture is, is, still needs uh, further work, and that further work needs closer cooperation between London and Brussels. Yeah. Thank you so much. You, you've brought us out on time, as it were, Simon, which, uh, you know, uh, it's a broadcasting skill as well as a diplomatic one, so thank you, thank you very much indeed. I will admit uh, that I've failed miserably to engage on the question of, of energy supply and how that conditions the Western response. But I know that you've got Helen Thompson and a, a, a great panel following on who will absolutely be all over that. Um, so I'm, I'm making my apology in a slightly half-hearted way. Uh, but uh, I hope you'll all join me in thanking uh, Margaret, Simon, Maeve and Ben for giving us a fantastic tour of Oregon. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you for your questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're such a good chairman. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's us clear. Well done, very good. Thank
Okay, welcome everybody back to our second panel of today. Uh, we've talked about geopolitics. Uh, now we're going to look at the economic implications of some of those geopolitical events that people earlier were talking about. I'm Jill Rutter. I'm a senior research fellow at UK and a Changing Europe. And I'm delighted to be joined by three present panelists. Uh, on my immediate left is Jonathan Portes. Jonathan is a senior fellow at UK and a Changing Europe and a professor of um, public policy at King's College London. Former chief economist in the cabinet office, quite relevantly, as well during a previous big international crisis. Not a causal connection there. Um, <laughs> on my immediate right is Stephanie Flanders. Stephanie is very well known to you as a big economic commentator, currently senior executive editor at Bloomberg and head of Bloomberg Economics. On my far right, Helen Thompson, Professor of Political Economy at the University of Cambridge. And we are hoping that we will be joined virtually by Rathine Roy, Managing Director of the Overseas Development Institute, to bring us a perspective, a perspective from, uh, if you like, beyond the West. Uh, we're having some problems connecting with him at the moment, so he's not there, but we hope he is going to join us. For people watching online, can I just say you have a superior experience to people in the room. You don't get the pastries, but you do get to see the virtual panellist. Um, unfortunately, here we just get to hear the virtual panellist uh, when he uh, joins us. But I'm going to kick off with actually where the last panel ended. So Mark Urban, who was chairing the last panel, said, and of course then there are all these issues around energy supply. Um, you know, energy is back on the agenda very, very big time. Now, uh, Rathine has joined us, I can confirm. Hi, Rathine. I have just introduced you as uh, joining us. We're going to kick off with uh, me asking Helen. Helen, I keep on getting asked to do panels about are we back to the 1970s, which I just think is a bit insulting because they think that I'm the only panellist they've had on who's old <laughs> enough to remember the 1970s. But are we basically doing a repeat uh, of the 1970s, or is this energy crisis a very different energy crisis from the 1970s? Well, I think that the, the basic phenomenon that has occurred, which is that we have energy-driven inflation, and as usual, energy-driven inflation produces food inflation, and then, at least in some sectors, actually fewer now than was the case in the 70s, you start to get demands for higher wages. That is a pattern that is recognisable from the 1970s. But the bottom line is, is this energy crisis, in my view, is like multiple times worse than the energy crisis of the 1970s. Um, there are various reasons um, for that. The first of them is that in the 1970s, the supply of oil itself wasn't actually particularly short. What was going on was, in, Beginning in war conditions, the Yom Kippur War, the supply of oil was geopolitically restricted um, by the Arab oil producing um, states. And then later in the decade, um, by the Iranian Revolution and the Iran uh, Iraq War. But this time around, there were clearly issues around the supply of oil before we get to the war, to Russia's war um, against Ukraine. And the bottom line reason for that is that for the 2000 as the world economy depended upon shale oil. And shale oil hasn't got the capacity to increase um, production in, in the way in which it did during that decade. The second difference is, is that this is a crisis about gas and coal, um, particularly gas supply. In fact, you could argue, in fact, I perhaps would argue, that the gas crisis at the moment is worse than the oil um, crisis. Um, and that wasn't the case in the 70s. Gas was much less important as an energy source then than it has become now. The third reason why it's fundamentally different is, is because the 1970s energy crisis was a Western affair. The only countries that were really otherwise caught up in it were Japan, Singapore, Australia. Um, so countries quite strongly allied in one way or another with Western countries. Um, this is not, this is a crisis for the whole world, and particularly the fundamental thing that makes it different is the volume of Asian energy consumption, not just Chinese, 
energy consumption, but particularly Chinese energy consumption. So you can see the prelude to the energy crisis most clearly, I think, last autumn in events in China, where China had to engage in um, electricity um, rationing on quite a significant scale, and the word went out that China's uh, had to secure, the people in charge of energy in China had to secure energy by whatever means necessary. So that puts us in a very different world than the one that existed in the 70s. Well, that's a fairly grim mm -hmm. picture. Uh, thanks, Helen. I'm not sure thanks is quite that. And one of the comments that, uh, that was on the radio this morning was that Russia, in a sense, was preparing for, uh, put the energy squeeze on Europe. Let's start off with Europe through the winter um you know do you think that's right there's a sort of bit of a battle to see how much you could stockpile gas now pending a rough winter is well i think there's several things here first of all is is that if you look at what gazprom in particular was doing through the course of 2021 that putin was preparing for that for the war in this respect last year as well um, because gazprom wasn't providing um, gas be beyond the long term um, contracts, it wasn't providing gas in the spot um, market. So Putin, in my view, has long known what he is doing in, in trapping Europe into this position um, where gas um, is concerned. It's, it goes back through the 2010s and into the, into the 2000s and the ways in which it's, Putin helped to make it difficult for European countries to import gas from elsewhere until the American shale gas boom um, occurred. But I think what you can see now um, with the pipelines and Nord Stream pipeline in particular um, is, is that various reasons are being concocted, or at least half concocted anyway, um, to make it very, very difficult for European countries to store up for the winter because he understands that actually um, gas is Russia's ultimate weapon in this war. Okay. Rathine, Helen said one of the big differences between the 1970s was a Western energy crisis, but this one's a global energy crisis, uh, compounded by that for a lot of lower income countries is the impact of the Ukraine war on food exports, grain exports and implications for food prices. Why 10% inflation might be difficult for us and bad for a lot of people at the lower end of the income distribution. It's presumably much more existential for a lot of poorer countries who are really, really very dependent, seeing very big inflation. So, you know, what do you see as the really big areas of difficulty that the conjunction of food and energy inflation is imposing on the world beyond the West, if you like? The world beyond the West is a big place, and we need to differentiate it a bit. Uh, Let's start with uh, Asia. I would say that the countries in difficulty in Asia are not in difficulty sui generis because of either of these shortages that have been caused by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. They were already in difficulty for some time, and the conflict has compounded those difficulties. A good example is Sri Lanka, uh, which took a number of entirely internal steps screw up their own economy, uh, combined with, I suppose that's a common feature, but it particularly affects many developing countries, combined with sort of sectarian authoritarianism that uh, led countries to make unwise investment choices. Contrast that with Bangladesh, which has not made bad choices and is therefore fairly comfortable, uh, notwithstanding the crisis, uh, despite being a food and oil importer. Uh, some countries have actively benefited from the crisis in some ways, hmm. such as India, which has benefited from two things. Historically, India is both an importer of oil and an exporter of refined oil, hmm. because Europe and the United States, in their wisdom, have prevented Iran from expanding its oil refining facilities. And so India refines oil and sells it right back to Iran and makes a tiny profit on this. So when oil prices go up, that counterbalances the inflationary impact of oil prices going up in India. Uh, India, contrary to popular opinion, many countries actually, has actually been heavily taxing fossil fuels, uh, subsidizing some elements of fossil fuels like cooking gas for the poor, that's targeted, 
there are very heavy taxes on petrol and diesel. And in fact, the problem now is fiscal, which is you can easily lower the Im negative impact of rise in oil prices by lowering taxes. That would affect uh, the government's ability to spend more. But if you like, therefore, the, the, the focus of the problem has shifted to the government. How much of a fiscal hit does the does the uh, does Treasury take? And this is also true in a number of other uh, countries uh, to some extent. China is comfortable, obviously, because I don't know why people haven't got this, but China began stockpiling. I think the first speaker alluded to this, but China began stockpiling materials, minerals, assets, imposed a ban on exports of rare earths last August, well before the conflict. Maybe they knew something I didn't. <laughs> that has caused far more suffering uh, and tension in the Asia Pacific than the war itself, which has had an accelerative effect. But China sort of, you know, cleaning up the market six months before the war broke out uh, has been the main problem in Asia. Africa has different problems, of course. Africa is still reading from recovery from COVID. Its commodity markets have been shut out a bit because of global recessions. If those rise and the money is spent wisely, uh, then, uh, you know, I think uh, some African countries should be okay. The trouble in re the, 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 the region in real trouble is the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region, because they are disproportionately dependent on Ukrainian exports of wheat. And second order, they were dependent on Indian wheat exports. India just banned its wheat exports. Silly thing to do, but for food security reasons, apparently, despite sitting on a 14 month stockpile. But that banning of uh, food exports will affect the Middle East very, very badly. And, you know, the Middle East is already the zone of suffering, much ignored by the rest of the world. And things can only get worse there, which will actually have repercussion effects then on stuff that the Europeans worry about and Preeti Patel worries about. You might have to expand flights to Rwanda because there will be more migration from the Middle East as a result of this suffering. And uh, therefore, uh, so, so the differentiated picture is that there are swings and roundabouts here. And countries that are able to exploit the roundabouts, either by an intelligent strategy to expand their commodity price, uh, commodity exports, uh, will benefit. Uh, countries that uh, do not will not benefit. What is very clear is that uh, the long-term moral exhortation by the Europeans to move away from two things: uh, one is fossil fuels, and the second is nuclear energy. The latter I've always found very puzzling. Uh, is now finished. The day Germany started using coal again, I think any sort of moral imperative or exhortation to worry about climate change and fossil fuel uses for climate change that comes from anywhere will be met by extreme skepticism, and that has a huge global cost. I think if you're looking at developing countries as a whole, certainly India, where I come from, no one's going to ever listen to that kind of crap anymore. That's interesting. I want to come on to whether uh, whether net zero is dead as a sort of global objective uh, a bit later. Um, but before I get to that, um, Stephanie, uh, a very interesting and very differentiated picture there from Rathen, which I thought was really, really fascinating about the different winners and losers, if you like, from this. But when you're looking at the sort of global economy generally, uh, if you're sitting in maybe one of the big institutions, what, to, what are people assuming about the length of time they have to be coping with the Ukraine crisis and with this sort of current crunch? Do they see it as temporary, a hiatus, or are they, are they basically sort of baking it in for the long term? Well, I think um, it's one of those things where they were hoping. There were lots of temporary scenarios that I saw when it first stopped on February 24th. Um, and then certainly with our economists, you know, I've got this group of economists, global economists, as well as all the economic reporters around the world. And the economists kept finding that, you know, Putin had basically powered through their first two scenarios before they even got into work. And it was sort of so you'd get to the sort of it's going to be a short sharp and then the medium and whatever. So they are we are definitely into a more of the sort of expectation that it will drag on. And I think the main question, which has already uh, been been highlighted at the, at the start, is whether it gets ratcheted up with the real, the, the sort of nu the so, so called, the so-called nuclear option that isn't a nuclear mm. option, which is the Russians actually cutting off Europe or severely rationing the gas to Europe. And for all the reasons we've heard, um, that's quite hard to prepare for. I mean, it was one of those things where if he, if Putin had cut off the gas in the last few weeks. 
um, there was, given the reduced demand for gas, you know, we were looking at a relatively modest hit to the economy. But that assumed that you could replenish before the winter, which would obviously be a big question mark. So there is an assumption that if that happened, you immediately trigger a recession in Europe and you've significantly worsened the situation that's already pretty tricky. You know, we're already threading, you know, from a market perspective and from a sort of global economist perspective, the path to a soft landing, to avoiding um, a recession for the global economy, um, the major economies of the global economy, rather than a few that are, that are um, particularly badly situated. Um, that, that line is getting narrower and narrower all the time, um, in part because so much of this crisis is about real stuff out there that can't be changed very quickly, you know, getting those wheat shipments out of Black Sea or bringing Iranian oil mm. supplies online. You know, this is a very, it does, it, there are important differences. I thought it was really useful to go through the differences mm. of the 70s. But of course, what it has in common with the 70s and not with most mm. of the recessions we've mm. lived through is it isn't about what's in people's heads, you know, people's confidence in the future or worries about the financial system. It's actually real stuff out there that has to change, which central banks can't necessarily control. And I would just to follow on the very good comments about the developing world, um, we shouldn't forget the fertilizer piece of this. I mean, that's the first thing that, you know, high prices for oil automatically have meant a massive increase in fertilizer prices, which had already happened long before uh, the Ukrainian invasion. Um, they had uh, already seen, I think, a 200% increase in fertilizer prices. Now that, you know, that's tough on the people who have to pay the prices, but what it's really doing is deciding who gets none. And who will get none is quite a lot of African countries, and they will be feeling the effects not this year, but next year and the year after from not having that fertilizer. So I think, you know, that's the sort of slow burn aspect that we shouldn't underestimate. Um, but I, the only thing I would say is I've just come back from Qatar, which is, of course, one of the great beneficiaries, of one of the richest countries in the world, now getting even richer um, as a result of this crisis and, of course, desperately trying to get more LNG on, online um, to, to help the Europeans who had turned their noses up at Qatari supplies a few years ago. Um, but there's great, as Helen knows, there's great limits to how much they can do in the next three or four years. Thank you, Stephanie. That's uh, fertilizer reminder is a very useful. Jonathan, I wanted to just come to you as part of this first round, maybe pick up a question that's come in. Reminder, post your questions on Slido and I will pick them up. It's a relatively uncrowded field at the moment, so get your question in now. Um, a question from Yvonne Esterhazy, who's asked about David Frost's comments about Brexit not, not damaging uh, the UK economy and disputing that. Let's not rehearse and go into a sort of head-to-head -head rebuttal of that. But I just wanted to ask you whether you thought Brexit had made it harder or easier for the UK to cope with this, you know, if you like, much more troubled world economic picture that we're seeing now. We know some things like, you know, we have much better gas LNG terminals than the rest of Europe, so we're not as vulnerable to that, we're not dependent on Russian pipelines to anything like the same extent, but equally not necessarily part of the European energy market, much harder to cooperate there, but has this made it harder or easier for the UK government to cope? Um, I would say harder, but only at the margin. Um, that is to say, uh, you know, not being part of the single market not having the sort of mechanisms of cooperation um, with, that existed within Europe um, make it you know, somewhat, uh, um, somewhat harder. And, and we're seeing that in the, the sense that inflation here um, appears to be, uh, inflation here, as in all advanced economies, is primarily a global uh, phenomenon, primarily driven by the sort of factors that we've just been discussing. But there's a sort of additional impact from Brexit on top of that, um, as our uh, um, research that, that uh, uh, we recently published showed. Um, so it's making it a bit more difficult. Um, and then on top of that, I think, uh, there's a sort of additional layer of difficulty, which comes not from Brexit itself, by, but by the way that this government has chosen to handle Brexit and the way in which that has poisoned our general relations with our European partners. Uh, and that needn't necessarily be the case, right? And we, uh, uh, but uh, because of 
things like the Northern Ireland Protocol issue, um, it, it is currently making it more difficult than it otherwise would be. So, that, so there are two additional marginal ways in which it's harder. But you know, to be absolutely honest, look, if, if, if we were still in the EU, we wouldn't be in a totally fundamentally different economic position now to the, to the one we are in, I think. Helen, I um, just want to come on to the sort of energy, energy issues in the West. US obviously can run its own energy policy, but we've seen sort of quite ambitious plans in the EU. You might, whether you think they're ambitious enough to wean itself off Russian gas. How realistic do you think those sort of plans are? And what does it say for UK EU energy cooperation? Is that a sort of important element going forward? And who's it more important for UK and EU if we're looking at a, you know, future where Russian gas dependence isn't the place you want to be as a consequence of the geopolitical issues we discussed in the panel before? Well, I think that it's basically extremely difficult for European countries significantly to reduce their gas dependency on Russia in anything, possibly even in the medium term and certainly in the um, short um, term. I mean, Germany's obviously in the most difficult position because it's the one major European country that didn't have any and still doesn't yet have any liquid natural gas um, ports. But the bottom line here uh, is that there isn't sufficient supply elsewhere in the world to compensate for Russian um, gas. The only way of dealing with that problem then is for there to be a really significant reduction in gas consumption. And you can see the beginnings of that happening um, in Germany as they've moved, I think it was this morning, into level two of their, whatever they call their gas um, strategy, which will encourage uh, industrial firms voluntarily to, to cut production down. It doesn't get to the actual rationing um, stage yet. But the corollary, the inevitable corollary of reducing demand for Russian gas in Europe is reduced energy consumption in Europe because there just isn't supply in the world to, to, to change um, that. I think you should also, you should also realise, though, that there's much less reduction of actual um, consumption of Russian oil in Europe gone on than looks and part of that is the reason that we've you know, like already um, heard which is, is that um, Indian firms buy more um, Russian crude and then it gets refined there um, in India and gets sold back as petroleum products back into Europe and suddenly it doesn't count as Russian oil any longer but it really is um, Russian oil. So actually there's a lot of shuffling around of supply going on and a lots of shuffling around of where the refining um, takes place that turns it into products like um, diesel. So the world economy can't do without m much reduction, with, with, with very little reduction in, in, in Russian oil. We can simply reconfigure the supply chains around that. In terms of the potential for um, cooperation between the UK or deeper cooperation between the UK and the EU um, going um, forward. I don't see any reason for there to be any um, Brexit reason not actually to cooperate. But the underlying reality is, is that all European countries are going to be in some kind of competition with each other for supply, regardless of whether they're in the EU or not um, within the um, EU. So when the German um, finance economy minister, um, Habak, goes to um, Qatar to try to negotiate, as it happens unsuccessfully, a, a long-term deal for Germany. He's not going to negotiate it for the EU. He's going to look after German national interests in what is a German national um, emergency. And that, as we are right now, unless something fundamentally changes, that is the world in which we live in, um, in which European countries compete with each other as well as with Asian countries um, for liquid natural gas supply. And, it's, and as we heard earlier, just because it got buried with lots of interesting facts, India is trying to limit wheat exports or has in fact limited wheat exports. So that the sort of that same issue we had uh, in COVID of the vaccine sort of grappling over vaccines, unfortunately, is now going to play out potentially same. over food and energy. National interest trumping uh, efficiency and comparative advantage and things like that for or in the short run at least. Ethical 
or ethical behaviour. Yeah, no, we had a question about whether it was ethical for China to be stockpiling world maize supplies. I think somebody put in, I haven't verified this fact, that China has stockpiled 70% of world maize. Whether anyone wants to come in on that, but a uh, question about the ethics. I want to come to. It's been come stockpiling people for years. So <laughs> I, don't know I wanted to come onto, the, onto net zero. I was going to do that later, but I'm going to do that so we can move on a bit from, uh, from energy after that. Um, lots of questions coming in on net zero, some about the response, which is in terms of burning fossil, more fossil fuels. Ireland coming in for a bit of grief there, I have to say, uh, to anyone watching in Ireland. But also Dilip suggesting that actually this will give a Philip, shouldn't say that really, this will give extra impetus to some of the technological change that ultimately will get us off fossil fuels. We've got COP27 coming up at the end of the year, I think, you know, an African COP as opposed to a Glasgow COP. Uh, I think some interesting thoughts in Africa that Rathine was talking about, about uh, how fair was it to ask lower income countries to forswear some fossil fuel supplies as a route to development when they really hadn't contributed that much to uh, overall problem. Where do we think net zero now stands? Rathin, you were commenting on this a bit earlier. Do we think that it's actually the impetus, this fairly weak impetus out of Glasgow, is now dead or is there going to be a different direction? Where do you think we are? Well, I think the, the fact that Germany, for very good reason, I'm sure, for domestic purposes, is now has now reverted to using coal, that the anti-nuclear theologians in Europe, principally in Germany, I know that Strasbourg is trying to stop this, are contemplating going back to nuclear shows very eloquently developing countries that uh, fundamentally European countries or rich countries are not prepared to pay the price when the going gets tough in terms of trading off discomfort to their citizens to achieve the net zero target. And in effect, what they have interpreted, what they have to do, given that, as you said, they did not contribute to this problem historically, is told that in the common good, they must accept incremental discomfort in the form of possibly lower growth rates to trade off for climate change, uh, to, to temper climate change. That proposition is now dead in the water. I'm worried about that demonstration effect because this is bad faith. The assumption always was that powerful countries had the means and the political capital to not revert to coal having forced for it and having gone in for you know non-fossil fuel alternatives. Not just they have they not gone back to fossil fuels, they're going back to coal now. Uh, so this coal is a bad thing, uh, is no longer credible. So India, for example, had, a pro, had, had negotiated, and I think India came in for a lot of criticism on this, uh, to phase down, not phase out coal. It is now clear that Germany has not phased out coal, has no intention of phasing out coal, and will use coal the moment a minor discomfort to which it is suckers. That is, I, the way I put it politically, mm. is that uh, Germany is not willing to for its people to wear overcoats uh, to burn less coal. Uh, and it would rather burn coal than uh, ask its people to wear overcoats in winter like their forefathers used to. That's a terrible message. Uh, I just also want to say there's no such thing as an African cop. There are cops that are happening in different geographies, but they're driven as usual by the OECD. Uh, and the developing world tends to be reactive to them. So I think the, the, the prospects for net zero from the vantage with which people have been arguing for net zero, which is an energy-focused vantage that does not look at how you can achieve net zero with a different set of production inputs and, and a different pathway to prosperity. That is gone. I'm actually not too displeased because for your typical climate person, you know, between now, for the last 15 years, it didn't matter whether a unit of energy in India was used by some rich guy for air conditioning or by a poor person for lifeline or life bulb energy you know, to light up a light bulb so they could study or read, as long as it was clean. I think now the question of what energy is being used for will come in and how, therefore, we can have different pathways to a net zero future, which allow for better and more shared prosperity, might well come on the table. That's a huge intellectual task, but I'm glad that the opportunity has come. So that's the upside I see. I never liked this unimodal focus on energy and climate change. I see the debate on increased and shared prosperity and climate change coming closer 
as a result of this crisis in the showing up of, I must say, the hypocrisy of Europe when they've scuttled back to coal at the first sign of discomfort. That's not a bad thing, I think. Stephanie, do you share that, uh, that view? I think it's... I mean, it's a, it's a point well made about the, the hypocrisy, and I think it sort of goes to some of the, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, um, someone who's been heavily involved in this debate, but one thing I have noticed is that a lot of the most sort of hard-headed thinkers about how the world is going to make this transition have always said that it won't happen unless it's co more, it, unless it's much cheaper than it is now. You know, when you look at the UK's rather implausible expectations around how fast people are going to change all their boilers and everything. I mean, it's just, it doesn't seem, just doesn't feel real because, you know, each house is not going to, regardless really of who pays, um, it's just not practical for every house in the UK to spend £2,000 or whatever it might be. To so you just know that ultimately there will have to be a cheaper way to do that if we're going to do that. Um, and to some extent, sort of medium term, if there's a sort of structural increase in the energy, the price of energy, you might get to that point of parity between the sort of quote unquote climate friendly path and the less climate friendly path sooner than you would have done. But in the short term, you, ob you, know, you obviously have a much dirtier path mm. to get there. So maybe it's, you know, I don't, whether or not that nets out as better or worse for the environment, I think it's for others to judge. But I do, I do think it's about, it's a dirtier, but potentially slightly faster path to that kind of more realistic approach um, to, to net zero. I mean, Jonathan, the UK government's been even more reluctant to ask people to put coats yeah. on than I think the German government has been. But do you think that I this mean, is actually giving impetus to net zero? Will economics ultimately solve this by just making fossil fuels? Yeah, I, I mean, yes, I, I, I mean, I don't, of course, disagree with what said about the hypocrisy. But I mean, the economics, sure, you know, you've got a, a sh severe shock to both the current cost and the expected future cost, risk, and uncertainty of fossil fuels. Mm. Um, I think it's very, I mean, just from a purely very simplistic economic point of view, it's hard to see that that is not good mm -hmm. for uh, the long-term path towards net zero. I mean, just imagine what's the opposite of the current shock. Suppose that a small, stable, open, democratic economy um, had discovered a huge reservoir of oil and gas underneath it. Um, and had offered to sell that at the prevailing world price to anybody who wants it on long-term contracts. Um, that's the sort of the opposite of the current shock. Is that bad for net zero? Absolutely, that's clearly disaster for net zero, right? Um, so it seems to me the mirror image of that has to be, uh, regardless of the sort of current turmoil and politics, has to be good. But if it, but short term, you're going to see a lot more coal short term, it's missing. and all the dirtiest power stations they've immediately. I, I'm being in a non, I'm, I'm, I'm being a non Keynesian yeah. here, so and saying in, in the long run uh, I, it will work out. So it's one of the areas where we have to remind people that uh, that in terms of climate change impacts, the area under the curve matters, not just the yes. 2050 endpoint. We yes. get there in a horrendous way. We may make our problems worse. Just wanted to pick up a quick politics question, she said. I know this is a session on the economy and we will get back to it. But Helen, um, you, I think, and David Runciman, when you were doing your Talking Politics podcast, now sadly demised, um, used to say this is going to be a decade of politics of climate change and that was going to dominate. We've seen some climate impacts. We saw interesting results in Australia. Uh, many of us never thought we'd see Queensland voting for Greens, I don't think. The emergence of the teals um, uh, there because of wildfires and bad flooding. We've had the recent heat wave in India. Uh, which I think a bit of a disaster scenario, one of the books about potential for action on climate change. You know, are climate impacts going to start changing domestic politics, do you think? Well, first thing, I should make a little bit of a distinction here. David thought it would be the decade of the politics oh, right, of climate okay. change, and I thought it would be the decade of the politics of energy. <laughs> okay. I don't think that these two things should be separated out <laughs> um, from each other. I think it's actually pointless to try to think about climate change without thinking about energy because you can't address climate change without fundamentally changing um, the energy um, system. So I think you can see that the 
climate aspects of it, you know, it does have a, a political impact. Mm. You know, floods have a political mm. impact. They have done, you know, like mm. historically, and that they will um, continue um, to um, do so. I mean, look what happened to George Bush's presidency mm. after Hurricane, after Katrina, mm. after um, Katrina. And I think if you look at the domestic politics mm. of China around climate, then quite mm. a lot of it is to do with pollution, mm. air pollution, as it is to do with um, climate. But I think this goes back to the, the, the net zero um, question. It seems to me that um, the good thing about the present situation where the climate aspects of it and energy transition is concerned is that it's actually been a, a wake-up call, not necessarily on the necessity of it, because I think lots of people thought that anyway, but it's made wishful thinking much harder than it was before. Um, because there was a great deal of wishful thinking in the net zero, the way it was being conceived. And the fact that it depends on technological breakthroughs about which nobody could ever have any idea when they were going to happen was not something that was being um, engaged with. So what the, not just the war, but the prior energy shock last autumn, I think, began to do, but the war has really um, solidified, is force policymakers, politicians and policymakers, to try to think about energy across the board as a system problem. Uh, is to say, now, that isn't at all to negate Ratin's very good point that there's a great deal of hypocrisy at play in the way in which um, Western countries have been willing to go back to coal um, so um, quickly. But in a way, that is also just like facing reality. The reality is there has to be a present tense fossil fuel energy strategy to deal with the supply problems around those three um, energies, and that will involve engaging with levels um, of demand, and there has to be a coherent strategy for the energy transition and trying to reduce our dependency upon um, fossil um, fuels. And the more realism that comes into both sides of this, the better that we will do. And I think the problem with net zero 2050 politics before the last six months or so, a bit more than um, six months, is, is that there just wasn't actually an engagement with the energy questions at the centre. If I could just add to that, Really interesting. Uh, you know, yeah, if I, if I may just add to that, just a sentence uh, to add to that very important point of the Thompson made. So what's going to happen now is that the countries that are in the major emerging economies that are in transition, India, Indonesia, I don't, I'm not yet sure about Latin America, South Africa is out of it, they've been given a deal, are not going to shut down their coal fired up options. So the idea of it's phased down was that we'd actually close coal mines. Uh, they will not close them. And they will keep them there to be used to handle short-term things. That's a takeaway from what Germany and Europe has done. And therefore, the, the sort of rather messy, immediate short-term future may be compounded in the future by messier short-term futures. There will be other crises. And the message we're getting now is coal is an option when there's a crisis. And we will keep our minds open. We will keep our coal plants open. Now, in a country like India, which has lots of legacy coal, once you keep them open, the cost-benefit analysis of moving to renewable energy becomes distinctly more unattractive. So we are going to have to work much harder and provide much more attractive deeds by next panel and another conference exactly about this. It's with the Church of England wanting to invest in, for, in, in renewables in India. And I said, well, your deals would have to become even more attractive because you just made coal more attractive as a consequence of this crisis. Okay, well, that's, I'm gonna move on from energy. Um, if we'd been doing this conference a year ago, We'd have been talking about COVID and the recovery from the pandemic. Now, generally, most of us seem to be treating COVID as slightly over. We've got a big conference here with lots of people attending in person rather than entirely online. But obviously, that's slightly different in China at the moment with its zero COVID policy. But I just want to ask Stephanie, maybe coming to you first, has the world economy adjusted, recovered from COVID? Where are the sort of still lingering COVID after effects to, to be seen? And has it actually restructured the economies in any significant way? Well, I think, so there's a lot there. There's kind of, are we, uh, what's, what are the headwinds for the global mm. economy right now? I and mean, obviously we've just been talking mm. about uh, some of the, mm. the big ones. And, but the fact that China was still dealing with, is, is stuck in this very difficult, uh, sort of dead end situation with its uh, COVID zero policy, you know, has clearly been another factor which kind of delayed the supply chain uh, 
um, revival that uh, everyone was was hoping for. And of course, the, you know, the fact that supply chains are snarled up has added to the inflation issues that we're facing. So it is all it is all tied up together. I mean, I think if we just get to the sort of has the global economy changed rather than the sort of immediate, are we going to have a recession? By the way, probably yes. Um, but on the has the global economy changed? I mean, I do think the combination of all the US-China trade wars, um, this energy and transportation shock that we're seeing coming out of the Ukraine crisis and uh, COVID altogether has changed the way companies look at these extremely complicated global supply chains. Um, I don't think, you know, people talk about globalization in reverse or the, all, the, all countries turning inward. I don't think, I, I don't think it's that. Uh, and certainly it's really hard, we found on the ground, actually individual companies finding it very difficult to unscramble their relations with China. And they think they've changed their supplier, but then they realize the supplier in Vietnam gets 40% of their inputs from China. So it's, it's pretty difficult to do. But um, we are seeing sort of a change in the nature of globalization. You know, it was really driven by trading goods mm. until the global financial crisis. Then it's more or less, you know, it's been easing up ever since then, really. But services and data um, is still, that trading services and data is still growing much faster than the global economy. So that bit of globalization is actually still quite turbocharged. In fact, if anything, mm. people are reaching for that more if they're paying more for their workers now at home. Um, they're looking for more ways of using service sector, um, you know, outsourcing service sector work um, to other countries. So I think so. All that piece is there. I think the thing that the, the when people really talk about the end of globalization, they talk about a particular U.S. dominated vision of globalization, which I think is we are moving away from. And the reason we should worry about that is it means organizations like the G20 that used to provide a way to navigate this new global economy with the big emerging market economies and the big developed economies. You know, that's basically finished, at least for the foreseeable future. You know, you've had in the summer that when they tried to meet in the, in, uh, sorry, a few months ago in Washington, there were these walkouts by half of the people because they didn't want to listen to Russia. Of course, there's no joined up G20 policy on the Russian invasion because Russia, <laughs> China, Lots of countries that haven't engaged in the Russian sanction regime are all in the G20. So I think you know that's a piece, that's a change, that's partly COVID, that's partly all these other, that's the US-China relationship. Um, but some of the other things, I think the sort of economic forces that are still driving closer integration and causing big companies to still have lots of complicated supply chains, I think that will still be there. So Jonathan, I mean, we heard this word uh, I think from Janet Yellen, this friend shoring um, that people would sort of draw in and basically, you know, just make sure that only reliable countries, maybe everybody would supply everything from Canada or whatever, uh, that you would you know, rethink in terms of that. Is that a sort of realistic option? I'm, you know, following on from the geopolitics session earlier, are we going to see a sort of division of the world into the sort of China, Russia? Asia sort of block that supplies itself and a sort of, you know, separate Western block that supplies itself and the two would pull apart. Do you think that's a way things might go or is that just totally... I, 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 I don't find that particularly plausible, no. Um, uh, it may happen for some limited uh, uh, goods, you know, mm. vaccine production or whatever countries will feel that they need to um, ensure they have some capacity, um, but more generally, um, you know, it won't be driven by the economics, put it that way. In other words, businesses won't do it on their own. Obviously, if there is, a, a, you know, a, uh, uh, the, the, if, if, if conflict between China and the US becomes, um, you know, a, a genuine Cold War or even a hot war, then of course that you will see that that will feed through into the economics. But I don't think it will be drawn, driven by the economics or by regulatory decisions or whatever. Uh, the degree of interdependence is too great. Um, neither uh, side of that divide could go for anything remotely approaching autarky or self-sufficiency without inflicting huge economic costs on themselves. So it won't be driven by the economics, is the short answer. Rathin, how do the supply chain issues look from the sort of other end, the people supplying into, uh, into the West, the people who are, do provide low-cost labour? of uh, which we've all benefited from over the past couple of decades? 
Well, it's I completely agree with the mention that the bottom line, I think, as it's seen, at least in the countries I've talked to in the non-G7, G20 is this. If, if the West and the US are going to decouple from China, many, many things are going to become far more expensive. So either they'll have to consume less of those things or they will have to put up with more expensive consumption. And I think the consensus is that there is no evidence that the West is willing or able to pay that price. In which case, any attempts by the West to decouple from China will not happen. If the West does not decouple from, uh, let me say G7, does not decouple from China, then the question is moot because uh, then there are no two blocks. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that you've obviously got is, you know, higher prices here, higher prices there, higher prices if we decide to <laughs> disentangle at least some sort of critical supply chain. So inflation is very much back on the agenda. Helen, do you think, you know, our policymakers are prepared to deal with inflation? This used to be an absolute dominant theme when uh, I, maybe even Jonathan, first joined the Treasury a billion years ago, that inflation was the top economic problem, things like unemployment, some ministers were perhaps foolish enough to say was a price worth paying for getting on top of it. Um, is inflation now back as a permanent feature or is this really a product of temporary squeezes and as transient perhaps as central banks were thinking last year? Well, I think that this is quite actually a, a difficult question because you've got to disentangle um, the question of whether high energy prices and consequently high food prices is going to continue, to which I think the answer is yes, unless you have severe demand destruction, mm. which would mean we'd be in mm. recession. From the question of are they going to keep going up on a month-by-month -month basis such that it's actually inflationary on a month-by-month -month basis? Because if you look at the period of the world economy between 2011 and, 2000, and mid-2014, um, you actually have steady high oil prices, which is not something that had really happened before, not over that length of time. So the initial um, period in 2011 was inflationary, hence why the European Central Bank raised interest rates twice that year, but then stopped being um, inflationary. You just, the world had to live with high um, oil prices. And I, I think that it's just really impossible to tell whether that's, um, whether there are month by month increases um, on uh, likely to, like, like to, likely to materialise over the next um, year or so, and that's partly to do with not knowing like what, where, if and when the war is going to end, and on what um, terms. And I think it's also to do with how China grapples with its zero COVID um, policy, uh, because they are China's policy is definitely acting as a brake on oil prices. Um, at the moment. I would say generally um, that uh, policymakers and central banks in particular, they're obviously not all um, central banks like Bank of England was independent in the late 70s and the early um, 80s, dealt with the inflation last time um, by high interest rates. Um, and actually, in the British case, for a bit of time anyway, with allowing sterling really to appreciate uh, mm. as a, as a um, currency. Um, but that option isn't really available this time. I think it'd be very hard for any country to engineer uh, an appreciation of their currency given the strength of the dollar um, at the moment. And there's so much debt in the world economy in all kinds of different ways that high interest rates aren't actually an option. I mean. Again, I don't think anybody really knows where the ceiling for interest rates will be, but I don't think it's very much higher than what that they are now without causing a whole set of other um, difficulties. And then the other thing that happened to bring inflation down last time was actually the big, inc sorry, the big tumble in oil prices that began sort of from 1982, but was really accelerated through 1986. So the energy causes of inflation went away last time and they went away um, because 
significant new oil um, output came from North Sea and from um, Alaska. And that can't really happen this time, I think. I mean, you can't actually see something that could increase oil supply as much as the shale boom did during the 2010s. And anyway, um, we're supposed to be in a world in which there isn't going to be lots more investment in um, oil, which even if it were to take place would still mean oil not coming, being produced for maybe at least five, probably 10 years from where we are now. So I think in that sense, you can't really see a parallel from the 80s on either front. Monetary policy can't do the work that it did that time around because interest rates can't possibly go as high as Volcker or Thatcher sent them. On the other hand, it's quite difficult to see where there's going to be a significant increase in oil supply that would force the price down. So Stephanie, is that, is that your reading as I mean, well? Do we have to live with... Well, permanent? Helen's right, though, what she started with is the key thing. Yeah. So there's a step change. The world's got more expensive in these two mm. dimensions, and that's probably not going to go mm. away, and there may be structural mm. reasons why that happens. It is still in central banks' control mm. what happens after that, um, and it depends on... Uh, yeah not just so if, if we assume some kind of stabilization mm. in this it may be at a permanently higher level mm. for energy and food prices which is i think plausible and that's obviously what mm. central banks are hoping for um you still have to have people be convinced that central banks are going to be successful and that this is going to be transient in their heads they have to be sort of not necessarily holding out for the full price, full wage increase, or if they get, maybe they want a, uh, a, but you know, a bump this year which reflects this, but they might accept a hit later down the road. They might just take a one-year um, sort of compensation settlement or whatever it might be. Um, that depends on, you know, that we are still. That depends on us still being in this post-80s world where inflation is the number one thing that you mm. want to control. Um, in the 70s, when you look back, and actually the inflation was creeping up through the 60s and the 70s, and you look back at the contemporaneous um, archives, mm. they thought the same thing then. Every year they thought mm. it was going to go back because there'd been very low inflation mm. post-war. And they just thought it was going to, they had that in their head. So they'd gone back, they were sort of, they kept thinking, oh, this is just going to be temporary. And it's chastening um, people who have gone mm. through the archive. I know people mm. who are working on this at the moment, mm. you know, that it's just all the same things. You know, well, it'll mm. all come back. Mm. This is just temporary. So I do wonder, you know, if you looked at how policymakers mm. have responded in the last year, you would not conclude that inflation was still the number one thing that we were worried about. It's quite the opposite. We've had 20, you know, at least 10 years of inflation being too low. So people's reaction initially was, oh, thank God, we've at least we haven't got that problem mm. anymore. Not, oh, we have to clamp down on this because we're going to mm. go back to the 70s. So I think you know, there is a, there's a worry that you will, in the economic parlance, have an unanchoring of inflation expectations. Mm. That's not, we haven't seen that yet, but that could happen. I do also think the long-term forces, going back to what we were saying, globalization, I mean, the globalisation was partly about lots of disinflationary forces, things that on the margin lowered prices, you know, cheap labour in China, um, very cheap, you know, low energy costs for a lot of this period, very cheap transportation um, in terms of, you know, container ships, you know, cheap money for sure. Um, all of those things are kind of going into reverse. So this, the, the fact, the situation you've had for years where the default was, if anything, inflation fell, or was below target, there's quite good reasons to think you wouldn't be in that world now, even if you hadn't had President Putin and even if you didn't have COVID. Um, Jonathan, one of the things that characterises UK inflation last year, the Prime Minister has been reminded of this quite frequently, he was talking about the need for labour markets to adjust, we needed a high wage, high growth economy. Um, we've seen since then uh, the fact that while payroll employment, as I think the Prime Minister actually said mm. yesterday, yeah. is at record levels, employment isn't, and we've had this mass rise in inactivity. Um, you know, have we got a labour market problem that's adding f fuel to UK inflation? We've seen the great resignation in the US, but maybe that's slightly different. I mean, we have a, a labour market problem relating to the growth in inactivity which has been higher here than in most other countries. Um, that is an economic problem. It's probably more of a social problem, actually, because of, of 
lower income people being squeezed, you know, not returning to the labor market and not having adequate pensions, possibly moving on to disability benefits. We've been through all that before. It was a disaster the last two times around. We don't want from a social point of view and to a lesser extent from an economic point of view. Um, I'm not convinced that that's you know, a huge macro labor market problem. Um, inflate, you know, pay rises, um, median pay rises are still in the sort of four to five percent range, way below inflation. Um, we do have a pay, uh, very high pay rises for uh, um, in the banking and finance and professional services sector. Uh, those people are doing fine, um, but that's not widespread through the economy. The RMT strike this week, they've been, you know, is it for you know, they've been offered 3%. Uh, um, it's hardly surprising uh, that, that they're not terribly happy about that in, in current circumstances. I don't really see any significant evidence as yet of this sort of wage price spiral feeding into expectations um, in the UK. Uh, so, um, you know, I, again, I think it's, it's not, the, not the main concern. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I think it's it's harder to say what will happen in the medium term, and particularly Stephanie's point of are the sort of forces which have kept inflation down over the last 20 years going to persist. Um, I think it is perfectly credible to make an argument that actually you know there's that that, that we will go back to something like normal. And I sort of disagree a bit with. Well, you know, Stephanie's right. This is a real shock, not a nominal stroke financial shock, and in that way, it's different from the financial mm -hmm. crisis and more like the 70s. But a lot of the evidence seems to suggest that slightly, you know, bizarrely, economies recover much better from real shocks than from financial shocks. So in other words, you, know, you have an earthquake or a war um, and you destroy lots of real capacity. Um, surprisingly, economies sh sh snap back remarkably quickly. Whereas if you have a financial crisis with just involves a lot of electronic money chasing itself around and being destroyed. Well, you'd think you'd snap back quickly, but actually, of course, after the financial crisis, we saw 10 years of really, really weak and mediocre growth in this country, but also in most of the, the, the rest of the advanced economies. Um, we don't really understand, but, but that is sort of what history teaches us. And, and you know, I, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, I said, well, this is a real shock. Um, and therefore, I expect us to recover quite quickly. And indeed, in real terms from COVID, I think that is exactly what's happened. Okay, that's very interesting. It sounded almost like an essay you might set your students indeed. in your uh, whatever. <laughs> yes. uh, King's College London. I just wanted to, we're coming to the end of this. I just wanted to ask, pick up one point. I was, just, I was really hoping you would end on the positive. I thought this was, yes. was great that Jonathan had well, given I'm, us a yeah, great I'm being point. Optimistic. Stephanie, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a track. I'm not going to be derailed now. <laughs> uh, I was going to pick up a point you made about the G20 and the problems with some of these things. We've got this whole big welter of quite difficult problems, lots of questions, lots of questions coming in about equitable transition, distributional issues, both within domestic economies, but also globally, which is one of the sort of big issues going forward. Just one sort of sentence from each panelist so we can end on time, very aware of the previous panel ending exactly on time. Um, do we have, you know, do we need to reboot the institutions we have for international economic governance are the sort of you know Bretton Woods institutions World Trade Organization are they going to work or do we have to have a world where actually we just have to assume that they're a bit non-functional Rathin are we do we have good enough global economic governance is there anything we can do to improve it well as Mahatma Gandhi said about Western civilization it would be a very good idea I don't think we ever have had good economic institutions for global economic governance the UN system doesn't do the trick. The World Bank is a bank, uh, and banks, with respect, are limited in, in their transformative possibilities. And the IMF is simply a mechanism to make sure that people don't fall permanently to banks of payments difficulties. Uh, the idea that you can coordinate global intervention, I think, is, is extremely limited. We will have to see whether we can cooperate across Westphalian borders better. I want to make one point about inflation, then I have to run. I apologize to the audience. I have a back-to-back -back meeting mm. with the Church of England. You can't keep people in holy orders meeting. So uh, the, the, uh, the point I wanted to make is I think banks, central banks, and economic regulators will have to start looking at relative prices much more carefully. Simplistic theories of macroeconomic change based on changing interest rates are not going to work. I'll give you an example. If food prices go up, but people spend less discretionary consumption 
on services and on uh, downstream products, then inflation does not go up. Can policy make that happen if, if high food prices are given? Uh, I think we will have to start calibrating economic models to do that far more than we're doing at present, because the real problem today is taxation. It's not inflation. It's the fact that you're getting high price, you're getting price growth, but you're not, you're not growing along with that. So uh, that will, I think, be the difficult task. There isn't much economic theory that is completed and finished to help us, but we'll have to move there. Thank you. And I must uh, switch off. You've got to go. Time. I know you've got to go. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us, Ratin. That was brilliant. Jonathan, do we need to reboot that or do we need to change our models and way of thinking about economics? Uh, I, I mean, very briefly, I, I agree with Ratin's general mm. point that he's never worked mm. terribly well. I mean, we need, you know, some way of managing um, the sort of economic interdependent stroke conflict between China and to some extent uh, um, India and other emerging economies and um, the US stroke EU. Um, I don't know what that looks like, um, but managing that without having the sort of the politics and the economics feeding into each other and leading to, to a degeneration of that relationship seems to me to be the, the, the key challenge. Stephanie. Well, I mean, I, so I mentioned it in my remarks. I mean, I do think it's challenging. And I think that the, 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 the issue is that there was a kind of illusory, potentially, agreement or an uncoupling of economics from politics in the, in the time that we had the G20. And I was at the US mm. Treasury when we started creating the G20 and realized we needed that kind of institution, even just at the economic level. Um, but I think it was, it was sort of of its time that we thought, well, you know, we can disagree on all these mm. basic political models. Um, you know, China may not be a democracy, mm. but we can, we, can, we can all agree that we're moving towards this kind of open market mm. system. And, you know, that bet didn't turn out to be mm. accurate for China or indeed large parts of the global economy. And that's becoming quite clear now. So I guess, the, you know, the only thing I'd say mm. is, at least we can understand the depth of the challenge now, and it can't be another organisation, and I, you know, I was part of the institution that did this, another organisation that sort of has that classic US approach to foreign policy where it just decides the world it wants, or you know, what it wants China to want, and then kind of creates institutions that somehow will make that happen. You know, there has to be some sense of, yeah, but what's China going to get out of this, and what are all these other countries going to get out of it? Helen, final word. Well, I think if you looked at last autumn, you could actually see some areas of cooperation between the US and China, even though Biden hadn't completely repudiated his predecessor's um, strategy towards China. You could even see, actually, coordination between the US, China, India, UK, South Korea, I think, as well, over releasing um, oil from the National Strategic Petroleum um, Reserves. And, that was quite a moment, I think, and not particularly remarked upon um, at the time. But this is what I think the war has changed. Um, it's changed the geopolitics of the US-China relationship because China is now in a closer axis with Russia than it was prior to the war. And China's choices have a consequence, have been transformed, I think, on a number of levels um, by the war, both its options in relation um, to, um, sorry, to um, Taiwan, um, but also um, how it deals with um, Russia over a set of financial issues, um, including the possibility of what currency payments from China to Russia are made. So that, I think, is what makes it really harder, and that is what the world we now um, live in, is, is the bits of things that were in place for increased US-China cooperation, I think, have been taken away, or at least made much more complicated by the war. OK, that's, I'm afraid, a depressing, mm. I think, point to end. I should have clearly yeah. ended five minutes ago. <laughs> but, uh, but I thought it was a really interesting, interesting set of answers nonetheless. So thanks very much to Rathin Roy, who's had to go off. But thanks very much to Jonathan, Stephanie and Helen for giving us that. Uh, only announcement is lunch is served where you went for coffees and pastries if you were around earlier. Uh, back at 1.30 where we're going to be talking about the EU. Uh, what's that? Anyway, so come back. Thanks, Jim. Nice to see you. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, <clears throat> it's very good to see so many of you back. Um, and we, having gone global, we are now uh, talking uh, European. And I have an excellent panel with me. Um, I'm not going to give their full bios because they are already extraordinarily well known and you want to hear from them and not me. But on my right, I have Eric Jones, director of the Robert Schumann Centre at uh, EUI in one of the most beautiful places in the world, uh, which, for those of you who don't know, is in Fiesole in the hills above Florence. So he has a difficult job. Um, and on my left, I have um, Baroness Claire Fox, uh, director of the Academy of Ideas and uh, well known for her uh, work on Brexit, who works in the House of Lords, which is quite nice too, but still not Florence. And um, on down the line, we've got Fabian Zulig, um, Chief Executive of the European Policy Centre, and he's in Brussels, um, enough said. Now, um, we're talking about uh, matters uh, European, and I want to just open with a rather general question. Um, which inevitably is parochial, but I promise you I'll move it uh, on beyond that, which is how is the EU changing uh, without having the UK as a member state? Um, Claire, do you want to start? I think it's really quite difficult to know whether um, the EU has changed substantially since the UK has left because the UK left, because since effectively... Um, Brexit only really happened, um, you know, not very long ago. It's not the six years anniversary in some ways. I think that some of the changes that we've seen are from other events. So one of the things that I wouldn't mind us having a bit of a chat about is what we learned about the EU during the COVID period, because I thought that brought out some strains and stresses in relation to the apparent harmonious unity of the European Union. There was definitely tensions. We've also heard this morning, I think it was Helen, or earlier on, that Helen made the point, um, which I think came around with the vaccine rollout, but Helen made the point about energy, which is you have nation states fighting their own corner rather than a kind of uh, a, a collective uh, approach. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the, the only other comment I'll make at this point is that the Ukraine situation has also um, revealed something, which is that in the build-up to and subsequent to the referendum, the, the people that I knew who were most enthusiastic about the European Union staying in, and then again when I had my very brief moment in, in, in Brussels as an MEP, if you said that you were pro-nation-state, that you believed in national borders, that sovereignty was a hugely important concept. You were told, more or less, that you were some kind of mad dinosaur who was not up with the programme, that borders weren't that important, that nation states had to recognise a kind of globalist world and so on and so forth. That was the argument. But, you know, when we talk about Ukraine, we then notice that sovereignty is the one thing that the Ukrainians are fighting for, that their borders suddenly do matter, and that we're all told that this is the forging of a new nation state, and that that nation state, even earlier on, must be able to make decisions about what kind of peace it has. It can't be imposed by someone else. And I think, there we go. Um, uh, fair enough. That must have a kind of existential impact on the Federalist project in relation to the EU, I'd have thought. Not because of Brexit, but Brexit lurks there in the background. Fabian, impact on the Federalist project? Yeah, I, I think one of the effects certainly I've seen is um, that the debate in the UK um, has removed itself even further from the realities of the European Union since Brexit. Um, there seems to be very little understanding in some quarters of what is actually happening in Europe. Uh, what the underlying processes are like. Um, and that in the end, despite the challenges which are there, and those challenges are tremendous, and Brexit is by far not the most important one in those, 
uh, that overall that cooperation in a much more contested world, in a world with very significant uh, global uh, instabilities, uh, the European Union has become more important rather than less important. Um, I think there is uh, a reflection also on uh, the impact uh, the UK leaving has on the European Union, certainly in some policy areas. Uh, there is a negative impact. Uh, there are also positive impacts. Uh, for example, when we look at the recovery and resilience facility, um, which for the first time allowed borrowing at the European level, uh, this, in my view, wouldn't have been possible with the UK still as a member state. Uh, equally, on some of the vaccine procurement, I cannot see how that would have worked with the UK inside. Um, so it is a much more balanced um, picture. But my broad conclusion would be that, um, frankly, the EU has moved on from Brexit, uh, Brexit, uh, which was never the most important issue on the agenda, but it certainly has become a rather minor issue within the discussion. And the focus is now much more on how do we deal with uh, the fundamental challenge which comes uh, from Russia, from this changing global situation, and how do we ensure that cooperation within the European Union functions to address these challenges? Uh, because it is a tremendous challenge we have to address. It is um, a Zeitenwende, a watershed moment, uh, which um, doesn't mean everything will be different um, from now on. Um, but certainly Brexit um, is a minor consideration now. And just on that point, just before I move on to Eric, could you want to just say anything about the EU's response to the UK government's tabling of the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which I love to learn at lunch from our wonderful colleagues um, in uh, uh, Westminster, is going to get a second reading on Monday? Well, the EU, um, in a sense, has um, provided the Commission with the ongoing support that uh, it is the Commission which deals with the agreements which are there. Um, but uh, there is also a broader subtext um, which is present not only in the institutions, but as far as I can see in all of the capitals. And I would not exclude, uh, as some commentators in the UK have done, the Baltics or Poland, um, actually the EU member states continue to be very united on the issue of Brexit, um, that this simply is not acceptable, um, that this is a breach of international law, that this is um, a way of torpedoing the cooperation which is there, and that if the UK insists on doing this purely for internal political reasons, nothing to do with the actual um, issues in Northern Ireland, then there will be a response. And that response uh, is going to be determined um, because in the end, this is an agreement which has been freely signed by both sides. Uh, it is a commitment which has been made and there's an expectation that any country will um, fulfill its commitments uh, which have been entered into. Okay, thank you very much. Eric, go back to the just the, ba the basic um, exam question, which is um, what effect has um, the Brexit had on the EU working together? So <clears throat> first I should start out that from my accent, it's probably hard to realize I've been living here since 1988. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and in the arc of those 25 years, the way that the European Union has been organized from European community to European Union has changed quite significantly. And the language with which we understand the European Union has changed quite significantly as well. And, and worst of all, we use the same words to mean very different things depending on where we are. Okay? So if you're in Belgium and you're a federal, federalist, that means you want to decentralize political authority, right? Not centralize it. So, so Belgians not only love federalism and they love sovereignty. So when they decentralized political authority with their constitutional change in 1993, they gave to the region specific powers, including the power of procurement. And, and, and so the, the Belgian Walloon region was supposed to buy some buses. It had two different bids on the contract. One was from a Flemish firm that made buses and the other was from a French firm that spoke French. 
And, and, and so, of course, they gave the contract to the French firm. And, and, and when the Flemish firm came in and said, you know, this is not right, you can't do this under European procurement rules, um, the Belgian state stopped and said, wait a minute, we can't solve this problem because the regions are sovereign in this regard. And so they passed the Von Hole bus case down to the Walloon region, and the Walloon region said, no, actually, we did everything right when we looked at this the first time, so that's the way it is. Now, that notion of federalism and sovereignty is actually really important because I think that if I were to look at the early response to the pandemic, what I would see is the reassertion of national sovereignty. The Italians are saying they're going, you got to help us. And the Germans are saying, we're going to count all of our respirators and make sure we're not sending emergency medical equipment outside of the country. That's the discovery that we made, uh, was that despite all the rhetoric about open markets and free movement, what we ended up with were national governments that behaved like national governments. Uh, and, and so what they needed to do was to say, is this really the best way to respond to a pandemic? And, and quite quickly, they did two different things. One was that they empowered national governments to keep doing what they were doing, so they relaxed the rules on competition policy, for example. They relaxed the rules on fiscal policy. They did that almost instantly. Um, and the other thing is they said, okay, now that we've relaxed the rules and let you be able to do these things as national governments, now we need to figure out a way to make sure that you don't make the situation worse by doing so. And so then they introduced common procedures for procurement that allowed them to make sure that they weren't actually competing against one another and driving up the price for everybody loses, which is what we did in the United States at the state level, because we have the same sense of sovereignty that the Europeans have. It's just that it's operated by even dumber people than there are <coughs> on the continent. And, and, and the reason that I want to tell that story is because when we think about European integration, there is this notion of sovereignty that they keep insisting on, right? Uh, which is European sovereignty and strategic autonomy. But that's not meant to be a sovereignty that takes away from the member states. It's meant to be a pooling of decision-making resources so that they are powerful enough to stand up to the tech giants. That's why European sovereignty is listed in the commissioning letter for Margrethe Vestager, who's responsibility for competition in tech, right? She's not the nuclear defense lady. She's the competition in tech lady they need her to be able to express sovereignty because the firms she's taking on have G <coughs> turnovers that are larger than anything Europe has ever had to deal with. Um, and, and, and what we're looking at right now is ways that they can do that in the context of geopolitics. That's going to be a lot tougher because sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis Google is nothing compared to sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis Putin. Uh, and, and, and we're figuring that out. Well, thank you. And uh, there's a question come in, and I would urge you all to use the Slido to submit your questions, but um, which joins up some of the dots. And the question is from Ralph Cunningham, who says, is being sovereign and an EU member state mutually exclusive because Ukraine wants to be both? So do you want to start with that, since that's, you were touching on the different meanings of sovereignty? So all member states are sovereign. Right. If you go back to the March 2017 white paper on Brexit that, that uh, Theresa May circulated, there's this wonderful line in it that says, of course, we were always sovereign when we were member states of the EU. It's just sometimes it didn't feel that way. Right. Um, <clears throat> and, and to give you the counter example, my accent is a little weird. I come from Texas. Texas joined the United States. Right. And then 12 years later, decided that wasn't such a good idea and tried to leave. Um, and, and they were conquered. Their political leadership was replaced and they were reintegrated into the country. Right. That's what it means not to have sovereignty. Uh, and, and, and that's not something that any European Union member state will ever face. If anyone wants to leave, they can leave. It's just hard. Right. It's just hard. Claire. Um, I think that sovereignty is compromised by being in the European Union. Um, it is also the case that because I respect the sovereignty of other countries, if any country wants to join the EU, I'm not going to say that they shouldn't be allowed to. Um, I might not think it's a good idea, but you know, Ukraine wants to join, that's fine with me. If they're a sovereign state, there's no, that's the deal. I think that the, the way that sovereignty feels strained I mean, this is not an issue that I think that we need to be uh, concerned with now because we have actually left the European Union, but would be if you look at, for example, what's happening with the tensions around countries like Poland and Hungary, where they are basically told that they'll be fined because they're not sticking to the rules that the EU dictate, even though they had national elections where the priorities in those countries were different to those which the European Union considers its core values. 
And so that's why you have tensions around sovereignty. I, it was interesting that, that, that Fabian made the point um, in relation to the, uh, um, the, 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 the thorny question of the protocol. Um, he, he made the point, you know, that um, the protocol uh, was being sort of done for, you know, that the, the UK government were doing things in the interest of, for it internal, for domestic audiences, you know, uh, why were they doing that? Well, you know, the whole point is, is that nor and not in the interest of the Northern Irish people. The point is, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. That's the whole problem, in a way. And if it's therefore treated separately or differently, then that does compromise uh, the sovereignty question. And that's one of the reasons why the Protocol Bill is even on the table, um, so as to defend that. But at the heart of sovereignty, of course, is that you have, as a, an electorate, as a citizenry, as a national citizenry, you have your politicians accountable for decisions that they make, that you have the ability to cancel them, get rid of them, vote them out, which you do not have if decisions come to you from the European Union. Even if those decisions are ones that you like, that you support, I mean, often, when I was in the, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, it's not that everything the EU does I don't like. They might well have a policy that I prefer to what my fellow citizens think, but I can't cheat in a democracy. My point is they've got a better policy than the one we've got, but I have to be able to persuade my fellow citizens of the virtues of that, not say you've got no choice, it's coming from uh, uh, Brussels. That, that was, for me, what the whole issue of Brexit was always, always about. So can I just push you a bit further on the sovereignty issue? Because if you take the sovereignty debate to its logical conclusion, it means not only um, leaving the EU, but also leaving uh, the Council of Europe, and dare I say, even the WTO. So why is it we haven't gone well, down that route? Well, I, I think that there are question marks about the use of transnational organisations as a way of ring-fencing off decision-making from the electorate. I mean, that's uh, effectively where the nervousness is about a number of international uh, uh, organisations. I think those issues might well come to the fore. And I, I certainly think that the World Trade Organisation, there may well be questions, you know, but there's all sorts of ways it happens. I mean, even with the uh, World Health Organisation recently, where there's been an argument that there should be a, um, a, 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 a deal signed by everybody that would say that there will be the use of lockdowns in, in, in uh, uh, if there's ever a, a, a pandemic again, that everyone will sign up to it. These are things which then get removed from any kind of democratic accountability. So I think there is a question mark there. But where I would disagree is the idea that this is an isolationist position. For me, it's a democratic position because the implication was, was uh, Fabian actually made the point where, you know, um, the, the, the UK is now further removed from understanding what's happening in the EU. Well, you know, that's partly the deal, you know, which is, is that I'm not, so what, you know, that was the deal, right? I'm like, fine, get on, uh, carry on, me, do your bit. Um, but what it does not mean is that you can't have cooperation. I mean, we should be able to and can have international cooperation without signing up to international treaties. It is also the case that you can, and because we will keep referring interchangeably between the EU and Europe, and I would just say that um, I consider myself to be European. I am pro-European and pro-solidarity with European countries, and actually have been very interested in what's happening in Ukraine way before it became fashionable to be interested in what's happening in Ukraine, and they weren't in the EU. I mean, I was kind of have mates there and have been following the situation for some time. I didn't go, oh my God, you know, you have to be in the EU or out there. I mean, I just was interested in that region. That's the way I look at politics. Thank you. Fabian, can I just turn to you? Clearly, you're still a national of a country which has surrendered sovereignty to the EU. Is that how you Shared. Say not, not surrendered. I didn't say surrendered. Compromised. Compromised. Uh, I think the... Um, first, I, I wanted to just pick up one point um, from what Claire just said. Um, I think this idea that you can have meaningful international cooperation between sovereign states without signing international treaties, um, I find a bit of an illusion. I cannot see anywhere in the world where that is the case. Uh, international cooperation 
is based on international treaties which are signed by those states which want to cooperate. All of the institutions we've talked about are uh, based on those kind of treaties. Um, yes, the European Union is a different beast. It has different types of institutions. But the idea that you cannot um, uh, sign up to international co cooperation if you don't sign up to treaties essentially is an isolationist policy because you cannot have meaningful cooperation if that is the case. On sovereignty, um, frankly, I don't share the obsession with sovereignty. Um, I think, um, in my view, most of the population doesn't share that obsession with sovereignty. They care about other things. They care about accountability. They care about effectiveness. They care about what is being delivered. But um, abstract political or legal notions, in my experience, don't carry very high uh, importance when people make decisions. Uh, but even if you look at that, I completely disagree with the characterization that uh, European countries somehow have compromised their sovereignty. Um, I find it interesting that apart from the UK, all other countries, despite the problems, despite the debates which are there, seem to be um, in, according to Claire, in the illusion that they are fully sovereign nations uh, who make sovereign decisions who are also fully democratic. And I find it a bit problematic to make this assumption that just because they have joined an international organization, somehow they have compromised uh, their own decision-making power or their own uh, legal power. Um, on top of that, I think the reality um, is that we live in a world where sovereignty, and I mean here not legal sovereignty, but effective sovereignty, is constrained by the environment in which we live in. Uh, and this is precisely why a country like Ukraine knows full well that by joining the European Union, it does not give up sovereignty, it gains sovereignty. It has the ability to defend its sovereignty by cooperating with other nations which have the same degree uh, of importance um, put on making their own decisions, defending their own values, defending their own interests. And of course, this will not always be a harmonious um, uh, discussion. There will be differences in opinion. There will be differences in interests, uh, and that will have to be sorted out. But that's exactly why we have created a mechanism where we can sort out those issues between sovereign nations within a framework where we end up having those negotiations at a conference table rather than on a battlefield. Thank you. Um, so just before I move on to my next question, um, a brief commercial break to say, I'm sure you're aware of our State of the EU report, which is published today. It's marvellous. Um, don't <laughs> just look at um, Anand's uh, brief uh, summary of it on Twitter. Uh, it's um, far, there's far, far more rich things in the report. Please read it. That brings me to my next question, which is we've, been, we've looked at the thing, the question from a rather parochial basis, what's the effect of the UK leaving the EU? What we, I'd like to look at now is obviously Ukraine has already come up in the, in the conversation, but the, the quite remarkable changes that we're seeing in the EU at the moment over um, common foreign, foreign and security policy. Eric, do you want to tell us a bit about uh, where you think this is heading? Do you think this is sustainable? And um, picking up on one of the questions that come in, if the EU is going to have a proper foreign, uh, common foreign and security policy, does that mean far more centralisation of power and greater political account accountability in the EU institutions? So I think that's a, I, I think that's a really good, good question, because if you imagine Europe as being some kind of military entity, right, with an army and a joint chiefs of staff and some political leadership to say, go fight there, or don't go fight there type thing. Um, that's really, that's heavy lift, right? I just don't, I don't see the Austrians buying into that. You know, the Irish, not so much, you know. We, we can get the Swedes and the Finns into NATO, well, if Turkey will let us, but, but <clears throat> we can do that. But, but forging some kind of really effective, you know, I'm going to send the troops abroad, I just don't see it. 
the best, when you talk to Europeans about defense cooperation, the best that you can usually get out of them is a sense of what we're going to do is, is coordinate defense procurement. We're going to enhance interoperability of defense systems. We're going to strengthen our industrial capacity to meet sudden needs. Um, and, and, and along the way, we're going to reduce our dependence on foreign suppliers of critical components so that we don't find ourselves caught on the hoof, right? There's a brilliant book you should read by John Allen and Ben Hodges called Future War and the Defense of Europe, and it looks at the amount of effort that would have to go in for Europe to replace the United States as decision maker in chief in, in all this foreign and security policy type stuff, okay? Um, and I just don't see that happening. I just don't. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to cry over that because I don't think that would be a good thing for European integration. I think it would be a bad thing for European integration if Europe tried to forge itself into some kind of giant polyglot Wehrmacht, right? <clears throat> and, and so in that sense, I think we have to ask ourselves, are there things that Europe can do in foreign policy that are nevertheless still important, right? Imagine if we did not have interconnectivity in electricity grids and gas mains in Europe right now. Just imagine. If we didn't have that, then Putin would have been able to get us over in an instant because there would have been no alternative to Russian hydrocarbons. There would have been no way to redistribute energy across Europe's economies. So, game over. That's actually quite powerful and significant. We, we also have NATO, right? And, and the beauty is the Europeans can coordinate within NATO, which means the United States doesn't just call the shots willy-nilly. And that's important because I, I hate to break it to you guys, but the United States doesn't always call them in a good way, right? Just look at Iraq and the many gifts that has given us since 2003. So I think we need more European participation at that level. And I think we can get that. Will that violate European sovereignty? No, and maybe that's the problem, right? Maybe Europeans are too obsessed with their own little pet defense industries and projects and whatever. But I think we have to live with the fact that that's the way Europe is. And, and if Europe can be more resilient, can be more robust, can be more effectively coordinated and work more effectively with the United States and a division of labor that helps to push back, not just against Russia, but also against China, and we might talk at some point about how European attitudes toward China are changing in the context of this Ukraine conflict. If we could get that, I think that would help to make the world a better place. So you, you mentioned um, Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Dilip has asked, does that indicate a lack of confidence in the evolving uh, European Defence Union? No, I, I, think it's, I think it's realism, right? I mean, you know, think about command control, <coughs> communications and intelligence, right? The United States dominates in that area. Um, so you need to work with the United States to, to be able to coordinate your operations in the field. Think about strategic lift capability. Again, the United States dominates. So it makes sense for the Swedes and the Finns to come in because what they want is American strategic lift to go all the way up to the border of Finland, right? I mean, we pretend we're gonna do that with Estonia, so we better pretend we're gonna do that with Finland. And, and, and in that context, I think it's important that we show the capability. And by the way, if we can do it for Finland, then that makes Estonia safer as well, right? So I think that this is all about creating a European strategic and defense identity, but within a context where there's one global superpower that's going to help, right? And I don't say that as a kind of, yay, hooray, America's great, because I lived through the Trump administration, right? And, and I worry about what's coming down the pipeline. Um, I don't like this situation, but this is the situation we have. Thank you. Can I just now turn to Fabian? Obviously, I'd, we'd like to hear your, your views on the evolving EU's defence capability. And I'd like to ask a very specific question. If I was Latvian or Lithuanian, should I have confidence in the EU's response so far, or should I actually be worried? <coughs> Uh, I, I think, firstly, uh, I would like to address a myth uh, that somehow this is about replacing NATO, replacing uh, the American role with the European role. Um, I don't think anyone is seriously talking about that uh, anywhere. This is about uh, creating complementarities and, in a sense, also addressing the uh, 
I think, right uh, demand from the United States that Europeans will have to take more responsibility for their own security. Um, and I think that is also the context in which we should see uh, the Swedish and the Finnish decision. Uh, in, that's the context in which we should see also the Danish decision. Um, let's not forget that Denmark uh, actually voted with a two-thirds majority to stop its opt-out um, from uh, security uh, uh, arrangements at the European level. These are not in contradiction with each other. These are complementary. Um, and when it comes to dealing with this situation, um, then the reality is that we have to act on so many different fronts in so many different ways um, that uh, the general concept of security as narrowly being defined as how many tanks you have in how many different places doesn't work. Uh, we will have to address dependencies, for example, on energy. Um, that is not something NATO can do. That is not something where the United States will have a major role um, within the European Union. We have to address questions around common procurement, uh, around how we organize defense sectors in a different way. We have to address questions around uh, membership. I mean, right at this moment in time, there's a discussion around uh, Ukraine's membership uh, why? Because it also has a security component. Um, and clearly that is seen in Ukraine. Um, that is one of the reasons why Ukraine does want to be a candidate country and eventually a member state of the European Union. So these are intermixed issues which cannot be uh, separated very easily and shouldn't be separated very easily. So if I look at this from the Latvian and Lithuanian point of view, um, of course there are some things which some countries have also publicly complained about they would like to see more. Um, they would like to see certain member states um, also stepping up to the plate. But overall, when you actually look at the response, uh, there has been a remarkable unity, a remarkable amount of decisiveness when it comes to what is being done in the short term. But my real worry is not about the short term. My real worry is about what is going to happen in six month time, in nine month time, when we have to face some of the structural decisions, some of the more long term decisions, when we have to set strategic goals. Uh, that's when a unity is going to be strained, unity within the European Union, unity uh, with Ukraine, unity with the US, um, because those are the much more complicated and the much more difficult questions to be addressed. Thank you. I, I, I smile wryly that, we're, that um, six to nine months is now no longer considered um, short term, but it's long term. We can see what sort of world we're living in at the moment. You want to just respond briefly and then I'll come to Claire. I just wanted to say this point that Fabian made about the security element of EU membership is worth underscoring. Because in the Treaty on European Union, there's a clause that was lifted from an original treaty that was drafted in 1948 for the Brussels Treaty Organization, a treaty that was meant to provide security for West European countries against the, the threat of German remilitarization, right? Uh, and the language in that treaty was unbelievably strong. Any attack on any member state will be regarded as an attack on them all, and they're all obliged to do anything in their capacity to respond. By contrast, the treaty that was written a year later, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Treaty, the NATO Treaty, says that any attack on any member state is regarded as attack on them all, and each member state will decide to respond with the means it believes to be appropriate, right? So, so when you think of the contrast between what has crept its way into the Lisbon Treaty from 1948, right, boilerplate, um, you have, if Tur uh, Ukraine comes in, a firm commitment to do everything you have in your capacity to protect Ukraine against Russia that does not exist if Ukraine were to join NATO, for example. So that security component that Fabian alludes to is quite significant, at least in treaty terms. Thank you. Claire, um, obviously I want to hear your views on uh, the evolution of uh, defence capability in the EU but also specifically the implications for the UK in that there is every chance that we will be excluded from uh, the m massive procurement that will follow. Uh, well, first, first of all, on the, on the, conf the confusion between what's short term and long term. <laughs> uh, I do appreciate there's great excitement about um, today's announcement about Ukraine. 
Um, but you know, if you want to, if you want to know short term and long term, it's likely to take a decade before they're anywhere near getting in. So if they have to wait for that to join the EU for the EU to protect them, um, they're they're in for a while, right? I mean, this is not an organisation that's stealthy, to say the least. Its lack of flexibility uh, uh, takes some beating. Uh, ask the others uh, ahead of them in the queue. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I mean, look, I, I, because I feel anxious about the fact that I'm not um, interested politically in spending my life critiquing the EU. Um, I, I am interested in what's happening in Europe, which is different because, you know, I'm not a, an obsessive EU hater. I didn't want the UK to be in the European Union. This is a different set of priorities. And I am interested in the fact that there's been some slippage within the countries who are in the EU. There's been massive changes. I mean, Germany is now militarised. This is a huge shift from what has happened in the past. That should be of interest to us all. It might be of some concern, but it might be of some joy. Whatever it is, it's massive. It's a m major change. President Macron, who um, we have to remember, you know, only in the French elections in the first lot, the, the presidential elections, you know, we had uh, almost like a direct EU intervention into those elections with uh, 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 Costa Sanchez and Scholz's letter in, 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 in Le Monde actually saying that, you know, everyone should vote for Macron to defend our common European values. And great excitement that he got elected as the president, although the recent elections would indicate that's not quite as secure a position. Um, and actually, if anything, he was humiliated. Something else is going on. As it were, that populist moment has not quite worked. And Macron may have got the presidential elections, but he's not a popular guy. But in the meantime, is he the reliable ally for Ukraine? And some people will say he's playing the right decision to go and talk to Putin. That's, a, uh, that's an argument, you know, uh, that, that's a pragmatic thing. All I'm, uh, the point I'm making is, for people in the UK, we should be looking at what the nation states are doing as much as what the EU is doing. Whether there should be a, an EU military force, a, a mili whether the EU should be seeing itself as a military power, as a military force in that way. I mean, th th there, was, there was something which I thought was misinformation, by the way, when amongst people on the leaving, leave the EU side, where people would say, oh, there are people in the EU federalists who want a European army. And I always thought it was a bit scaremongering to say that. Um, and, and, and I still think those kind of things were a little bit over the top. But what I, what I would say is, is that if you were to have the notion of a kind of European army, I'm not saying that's exactly what's being suggested, but I, I do know that some people are at the moment talking about it, requires that you have a sense of European citizenship that will collectively say that they'll join the European army. We heard earlier in that fascinating opening session or the second session on Ukraine that one of the things that's really marked out Ukrainian resistance to the, to the brutality of the Russian invasion is their absolute passion for their nation and for their nation state. And it's almost like they've gone superhuman because they believe in what they're doing. And it seems to me that there's a deficit at the heart of UK, of, of, sorry, at the heart of European citizenship, which is, I don't think it has any content. I think in the end, you will fight for France or you'll fight for Germany or what have you. And the, the, the only counter to that is the very important point that Margaret Macmillan made, which was really this war in between uh, UK, between Ukraine and Russia is a war about the West, right? And the West is not a geographic entity. It's not confined to the EU. It's not those people who are in the EU or out of the EU. It involves America, it involves Australia. It's the West, Western values. And I'm very much on the side of the West and Western values. And you don't need to be in the EU to want to fight for that. So therefore, the idea that we need the EU to fight off the threat of Putin, I think is completely misplaced and, uh, and not appropriate even. So thank you for that. Just picking up on the point about um, UK being cut out of any procure defence procurement, this is one of the consequences of Brexit. How do you respond to that? And relatedly, and I don't know if the others will want to have uh, an answer to this question, and more positively, what about reconstruction of Ukraine in a post-world world? Yeah, well, actually, I mean, on the procurement point, um, I mean, just feel, I don't know. It feels slightly technocratic to care. I mean, it might well be that we'll be cut out of that, but I, I, 
of all the things that I'm worried about at the moment, it's not being cut out of some procurement deal. I mean, I just think there's so much at stake at the moment that you don't want to... Be, I mean, it just feels petty to me. It might well be, yes, that might be a consequence. Um, just on the, on the reconstruction, I, I hope that there will be a Western effort to do everything it can to help Ukraine in its reconstruction bid. And I don't think, again, I, look, you can say all sorts of things about the UK government, and God knows I do. And I'm no fan, remotely, of Boris Johnson or the Tories. I just wanted to leave the European Union. It was as simple as that. I didn't realise it was going to turn me into an international pariah in my own country, right? And everyone was going to kind of think I was all sorts of... Um, I just voted in a referendum that was called by the government. You know, I thought it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, and, um, but the, the, the point about this government is I could spend hours waxing lyrical on what is wrong with them, right? Let, believe me. But as it happens on Ukraine, not bad. Do you know what I mean? I don't care why he's doing it. I don't care whether it's doing, he's doing it for any... I don't care. Not bad. And I think that there is something in the fact that Zelensky has made that point and people should be gracious enough to say that. I mean, you know, the UK is doing well and I hope that the UK is one of the leading forces in the reconstruction of Ukraine. But sadly, we've got a long way to go till then. Thank you. Do either of you want to say anything on the reconstruction of Ukraine point? Um, go on, Fabian. Um, I, I wanted to pick up a couple of points uh, and then also comment on the reconstruction. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting when we talk about the European army, uh, when we talk about European democratic legitimacy, that um, they are, the EU is seen as a major problem, but nobody actually talks about NATO and uh, what democratic legitimacy that cooperation has. Um, I'm fully in favor of NATO, so don't get me wrong, um, but I think there are different standards being applied to different types of cooperation. Um, but I don't think that in any case we are talking about a nation state army. We're talking about cooperation between nation states, exactly the same as we have cooperation between nation states within NATO. And I don't see why that is in any way a contradiction. Um, but what I do think, and I say that also as a German myself, if you look at the remilitarization of Germany, I am very glad that Germany is in the European Union and that within Germany, there is no question that that kind of policy development has to be seen within the context of European integration. I would be far more worried if Germany was doing this on its own uh, without having those kind of corporations and controls in place. Uh, on Ukraine, of course Ukraine knows that this is not an instantaneous process of joining the European Union, but maybe we can also give them credit and not only listen to what Zelensky says if it suits our narrative, what Zelensky and the Ukrainian government is saying very clearly is they want to be in this process, they want to be recognized to be in this process, and they want to have the clear political signal that they belong to Europe. Um, so I think it is exactly the right thing that we're giving that signal. Uh, and yes, we have to also then have a realistic discussion around how is that process going to work, how long is it going to take, and that is also the context in which I would see the reconstruction of Ukraine. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the vast majority of the funding for the reconstruction is going to come from European Union countries. It will have to come from European Union countries. Uh, the vast amount of the reconstruction of the economic fabric of Ukraine has to be seen in the context of economic integration with the European Union. It doesn't make sense in any other way. So this is an enormous task, and we will also have to help the Ukrainians to rebuild institutions, to rebuild infrastructure, to rebuild uh, the controls which are necessary in a democratic country uh, to also deal with issues uh, such as uh, corruption. And we have to do all of that 
with a high likelihood that there is some form of ongoing conflict or certainly ongoing instability in parts of the country. Um, so this is an enormous task and all of the world will have to work together to achieve this. But I think the greatest burden without any shadow of a doubt will fall on European Union countries. Yeah, thank you. Um, Eric. Two things really quickly. First, we had an opportunity to help Ukraine rebuild after the Orange Revolution in 2003, and we didn't take it. Second, we had another opportunity to help Ukraine rebuild after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and we didn't take it. So I believe that there's a lot of goodwill to take that opportunity now. Whether we really get that opportunity remains to be seen, but I'm not holding my breath. The only thing that's got me completely obsessed is the, the impact on world food prices if we don't act. Um, and this is the second point I would make. I think Claire made a really important point about this being a thing about the West, right? And the West standing together with Ukraine. But if you go to the global South or, or if you go to the East, their narrative about what we're doing is totally different. They accuse us of provoking this conflict. They accuse us of ensuring that the conflict is destabilizing world energy and food prices. And as this conflict gets worse, we're going to have a huge public relations campaign with these other parts of the world that we're going to have to deal with. If we don't pay attention to that, then I would not be surprised to find that at the end of this conflict, we're the villains and not the heroes of the peace. Thank you. Um, my uh, final block of questions, and a number of them have come in on, on Slido, is um, essentially about the EU's neighbourhood policy. Um, and how it's going to manage, dare I say, improve its relations with its neighbours. Uh, the, um, of course, uh, on one side you've got the uh, UK and Switzerland, but you've also got uh, those who are in the EEA and those who are just south of the um, EU, so um, North American countries. We know that um, Macron has uh, tentatively proposed uh, something fairly uh, imaginative. Do you think there is any prospect of that working? And do you think the EU would accept some sort of lo looser confederation? And do you think those countries would accept being members of some sort of looser confederation? Fabian, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, I think firstly, uh, our neighborhood policy in the broadest sense has already changed fundamentally and will continue to change fundamentally. Um, there is no prospect in my mind um, which would have been there for Ukraine membership before uh, Russia's invasion. Now uh, we are just about to grant candidate status, so that already is a major change. With that candidate status, we are extending the same to Moldova. Again, this would not have happened uh, before the invasion. Uh, we are talking about the Caucasus, which uh, many people would have thought will never happen, uh, would never even be considered. Um, and this is also leading to a new debate on the Western Balkans, where uh, the European Union, in my view, has um, made a strategic mistake over the last years by leaving the Western Balkans essentially uh, to the influences of countries like Russia and China, rather than seeing this as a strategic priority. So we are going to have to rethink how we interact with accession countries. We have to rethink the enlargement process um, because it cannot work the way it has done before. And that also means making changes within the European Union. The enlargement process has always been and some might even argue it's even more about what happens within the EU rather than what happens in the candidate countries. It is about putting the reforms in place which make the EU work effectively also when it comes to certain challenges which have come with enlargements. Um, apart from that, we also have the redefinition of our friends, neighbors, allies, um, enemies, because we also will have to think about what is our long-term relationship with Russia. Uh, how is that going to look like, both economically and politically? Um, so all of that is in the mix at the moment. Um, I think what uh, I would conclude at this stage um, 
And I think it is a moving target. Uh, we will see a lot more changes in the next years. But what I would conclude uh, at this stage is that it certain has, certainly has unblocked certain discussions, but it has also um, re-emphasized what the European Union can actually provide. Um, so the question of having some form of affiliation with the European Union um, is seen by the vast majority of neighboring countries as essential and not optional. So we will have to think about how we organize that, um, what kind of involvement that means in different policies, whether it means economic integration, political integration or both. Um, but these are all questions which now will have to be answered. Um, and uh, we are going to see uh, also a big challenge in that because um, for those countries which want to join the European Union, they have to recognize that the European Union has become a moving target. now. The changes are so profound within the European Union that uh, we are going to see a, a continuing uh, mismatch between what is happening in some of the candidate countries and what is happening within the EU. Okay, thank you very much. Eric. Um, so the neighborhood policy was created in the early 2000s to bring together our conversations initially about Moldova, uh, Moldova Belarus, Ukraine, um, but then it, it extended around and it was laying alongside an enlargement strategy that, that included the Western Balkans, but also extended to Turkey. Um, and, and the difficulty with this policy is that it never really worked the way it was supposed to work. Um, as a result of which we didn't stabilize those countries in the east, we didn't stabilize those countries in the south, um, and, and we never really figured out what we wanted to do with Turkey. Um, and, and as a consequence, oh, and I think Fabian is, is absolutely right, we made a strategic decision in the Western Balkans not to per pursue enlargement aggressively, and that was arguably a mistake, right? Um, so now the question is, is, how do we rectify this 20 years of accumulated negligent or neglect um, and, and the answer for right now is, oh, wow, the big problem is in the east because that's where the Ukraine war is. That's where the Moldovans are absorbing all these refugees or all these people coming into Poland. We need to figure out how we're going to settle them and rebuild their economy so we can send them back. But, but next autumn, we're going to get another wave of migration from sub-Saharan Africa uh, and, and from the Maghreb. Uh, and, and so I don't, I, I just, it's, a, it's a big walk and chew gum at the same time problem. We're, we're going to be facing so many different crises. Uh, and, and let's face it, our relationship with Turkey has not improved along the way, and we've got to fix that. So I think I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm grateful that there's this political momentum to recognize the seriousness of the issue, but I'm worried that this political momentum is subject to profound distraction when the next crisis emerges in, in six to nine months. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I, I, one thing that, that is... It, that is really interesting at the moment is that kind of shift towards suddenly looking at the East, which has obviously happened, I mean, beyond the kind of neighbourhood policy as a policy. Because if you consider at the moment, you know, Poland is almost being considered as heroic. It's taking in all of the uh, Ukrainian refugees. I mean, actually, Hungary is as well, but it's harder for them to be um, embraced as heroic. But I mean... I, Poland has, within the EU, often been treated as uh, a basket case, right? And, 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 and Hungary, too. I mean, I've found that very difficult because it doesn't matter what I think about what the Polish voters vote for or, or the Hungarian voters because I believe in sovereignty. Remember that one? Um, but it, certainly while I was in that, in that brief time that I was in the EU, but even um, before because I've been interested in, in, in Eastern Europe in particular, you know, the, the contempt with which they were discussed in public by the EU for their flouting of the values of the EU and the fines and the threats and, and, the, and, and what they themselves would describe as demonization meant that there was always a sort of unhappy relationship in relation to the East. Anyway, things have changed, right? Things have now changed. And then you've got those neighborhood uh, countries, as it were, and um, now where everyone, you know, uh, uh, Fabian rightly says, uh, perfectly reasonable, that Zelensky wants to be part of the process of, uh, of joining the European Union. These other countries do too, right? 
And uh, I, was, I was merely making the point, it's not going to be fast. But it's also the case that you felt as though they were in some kind of endless waiting for Godot room, you know, that it was never going to happen for a lot of people. So I think that there is a shift eastward and it will have to, the European Commission will have to think a little bit. I mean, it was very distasteful that they were still issuing the fines to Poland and Hungary in the midst of the crisis. But anyway, they might have to think a little bit about toning down the rhetoric in, in terms of attacking the East. That's one thing. The, the, just in terms of the other point that was made, though, I, I, I'm absolutely... I mean, the migration crisis is going to be a big crisis for the EU. I mean, we already know it's a source of huge tension here in the UK. And obviously, Turkey was used as the country... I mean, there's lots of upset here about the Rwanda situation. <laughs> I was prior to this, uh, the Rwanda situation, outraged at the outsourcing of migration by the EU to Turkey and the camps of Turkey or the, to the camps of Libya, right? I mean, you know, it hasn't been a, you know, there's an iron ring around the EU when it comes to migration of non-Europeans. Freedom of movement only extends to Europeans, you know, not those other people. And they've kind of all been shoved away. Well, there's going to be a much bigger crisis coming up. And I think, therefore, as if I can say it once more, I think the EU is not the organisation that has the flexibility that can deal with these problems, but certainly problems they will have. For me, however, these are European problems that extend beyond the EU. They are Western problems that are like, we are now seeing the greatest shake-up of geopolitical change. You know, this is the one. We're living in the history bit, right? People thought Brexit was big. Nothing, right? This is a big shift. We're on the start of something. And there's all to play for, a lot, which, when we might not win, as it were, not just in terms of a technical war with Russia. There's a lot going on. So I would prefer to agree with Fabian. The EU aren't that bothered about Brexit and they should basically sort out the protocol as quick as possible and get rid of the UK from the European Union. The UK should get out of the orbits of the EU totally and if that requires a, proto -bill, a protocol bill, all to the better. Uh, uh, because it will be necessary. But the big problem we all face is not whether the EU or the UK are having a fight over uh, uh, Brexit, but what we as nation states of the West are going to do about the much bigger problems that face us down the line. Thank you very much for that. Now, just before we finish, um, I am conscious, and this is what Slido tells me, there is the most popular question that has come in. And you have, I will time you, um, less than five seconds to answer it. <laughs> Does the panel agree with Lord Frost's claim this morning that the world will judge the EU harshly for its mistreatment of the UK? No. OK, thank you. <laughs> Fabian? Utter nonsense. Thank you. Claire? The world will cheer that the UK took a decision democratically and stuck with it. And that's what history will remember from the Brexit period. And hoorah for that. Uh, no, I said five seconds, if you're ready. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, many thanks indeed for the wonderful questions that have come in via Slido, both from the audience here and online. Huge thanks to our wonderful panel who have fielded a remarkable range of questions. Uh, please don't disappear because there is going to be a magnificent session at three o'clock, a question sty time style session with indeed people who have appeared on question time so they know what a gruelling experience it is. And in the half an hour you've got between sessions, please make sure you read our uh, report which was published today uh, on uh, Europe. Thank you very very much indeed. See you in half an hour.
I do. <sighs> Get your camera ready. Yeah. <laughs> Are you falling off the edge? Yes. I'm, so I'm, I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to G. It was very funny, but that looks very I'm dangerous. Going to shimmy it. <laughs> um, so, where are the guys at the end? So, Guy's going to give me hand signals, which we can wait about. Thank you. Yeah, that would be very cool. I don't know whose that is, but it's uh, a bit legacy. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. I need to get the, oh, right. get the clip <laughs> Because the stage wasn't <laughs> raised last time. The only problem this time is loads of people couldn't make it in because of the trains. I was so confused. I was absolutely confused. Right. Anand, can you get that open? Because I can't. I'm hopeless with technology. It's the date of the referendum, Jill. I know, but I can't get the I can't get the thing to slide up. Yeah, it's gone. I know it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Sort of two election <laughs> things <laughs> <are. It's happened laughs> in the meantime. I once had oh yeah, take that away. Yeah, I think. It feels more like about sixteen years. The whole thing went off, and for security reasons, I hadn't been let in. So I just had to leave. Either at all. Maybe it's quite addictive, I don't know, because it's a bit of a soap opera, isn't it? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final panel session today. I'm still Jill Rutter, and I'm going to be introducing my excellent panel. Uh, on my far left is Dr Nathaniel Copsey. Nat uh, works in the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office, as it's now known. He's Head of Europe Strategy and Expertise Department. And uh, Nat is obviously a civil servant, but is today representing the government. So you will find out absolutely nothing about Nat's personal views, <laughs> but he is channeling his inner Liz Trust. So uh, just treat Nat like that. But obviously there may be some questions that are off limits that you might have a go at if he really, really were a minister. So I will protect him from that. Um, then immediately to my left and speaking very much for himself as well as for the Labour Party uh, and will get no protection whatsoever <laughs> is Stephen Kinnock MP. Stephen is Shadow Minister for Immigration and uh, also a member of the European Scrutiny Committee in Parliament. We might talk to him a bit about that. Um, on my immediate right, delighted to have Sophia Gaston. Sophia is Director uh, of the British Foreign Policy Group and on my far right is some complete non-entity we don't know and I'm not going to bother to introduce to you, uh, but some people think is the director of UK and Changing Europe. That's so right. anyway, so how this session is going to work, this is very much more a session for you in the room. I've been around uh, during the break soliciting some questions uh, from some of you, uh, not from all of you, apologies for that. Uh, we do have a roving mic owing to the COVID meets rail strike meets Glastonbury conjunction, triple whammy. Uh, we only have one roving mic, I think we might have two. Uh, so do put your hand up and what I'm going to do is I've got some questions I'm going to kick off with. We might run out of them, but I am going to ask for interventions in question time format. I am now Fiona Bruce, just as Nat is uh, Liz Truss. I think his Liz Truss is better than my Fiona Bruce. but. Uh, <laughs> If you want to say something, ask a question to one of the panellists about the topic we're talking about, uh, then put your hand up and we'll try and run around and get a few of those questions and get them to bounce off the panel. So we realise we've all made you be incredibly quiet. And I'm... Hello, Slido. If you want to ask something, you know, get, have a go. And if I can read it, then I will do that. But anyway, focus is on in the room. So I'm going to ask a question, first of all, that was put to me by... Professor Margaret Macmillan, who those of you at the start will have heard of. And she asked, uh, she actually asked this much better than I'm going to ask it, but actually 
are we any clearer now about exactly what global Britain means? Uh, ministers talk a lot about global Britain, uh, but uh, we've seen various things. And he came up with some excellent quote from Dominic Raab about how it was going to turn us into a whale, in, from a whale to a dolphin. So are we now dolphinly like navigating through the roads rather than lumpishly going like whales do and breaching once or twice and then going underwater for a long time? Sophia, do we know what global Britain means? If anyone should, it's the British Foreign Policy Group. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me here. And um, I uh, am looking forward to us getting into the weeds on, on global Britain because it is something that is uh, has been sort of nebulous. It was a slogan that uh, really was actually one of the few things that carried on uh, with continuity from the uh, May to the Johnsonian era. And that is because it was actually sort of really first something that came to life um, during the Brexit referendum itself. Uh, it is uh, as broad a slogan uh, as you can imagine to allow it to be something that has been able to adapt to the changing political winds and also something that is sort of more clearly coming into focus as the government sort of starts to really move ahead with the hard work of um, the strategic articulation um, of the project. Uh, of course, the sort of primary strategic instrument that we've had thus far is the integrated review that was published um, in March last year. Uh, that uh, document itself, I think, uh, in many ways embedded flexibility as a kind of doctrine in and of itself, which is why I think, you know, a lot of the fundamental architecture of that uh, has remained sort of sound and, um, and uh, resilient even through the pretty extraordinary period that we've had over the past year. But a lot about Global Britain still very much needs to be fleshed out. And that's partly because we're moving into the implementation, which is where you have to really, in a way, uh, take some hard choices. Um, the integrated review very much sort of set out the frame of, of the uh, choices that we were facing. And now we have to sort of actualize that by coming down at various points. Um, one thing I would say about uh, Global Britain is something that is happening at the moment is not just that the kind of broader geopolitical environment is very dynamic and volatile, um, but the reality is that the implementation of Global Britain as the implementation of the domestic project that came out of Brexit as well, requires significant state resources um, and capacity in all sorts of ways that are currently being tested um, in, in new ways in real time uh, every month as we go on. So I think the, the environment for the articulation and implementation of Global Britain has become more challenging since it was launched. Um, the, the architecture itself is so broad that I think it is able to adapt as we go on, but we are starting to get to the pointy end. And I will just say as, as, as a final point in terms of the British people, we've just done some polling on this and um, only 12% of Brits say that they uh, both recognize the term Global Britain and fully understand what it means. Um, and I'm not hugely surprised by that, but um, certainly it's, it should be on the government's to-do list. Stephen, uh, will Global Britain survive into a Labour government? Are you on board with Global Britain? Would it go May, Johnson, Starmer? Um, I think it was Winston Churchill who uh, famously spoke about Britain's foreign policy after the Second World War and talked about these three, what he called majestic circles, which was the relationship with Europe, the relationship with the United States, and the relationship with the Commonwealth. And of course, our place in the world has evolved uh, since the Second World War, and certainly the relationship with the, with the Commonwealth for many of absolutely the right reasons uh, became a very different relationship to what I'm sure Churchill was thinking and of and talking about at that time. But there's no doubt at all that our foreign policy, uh, our commercial policy, our diplomatic uh, outlook was fundamentally defined by the transatlantic relationship and the relationship with Europe and what the the, the coal and steel community and what came after it. Um, Brexit has, of course, profoundly damaged that policy and that strategy. Because if you have a strategy which is based on 
uh, two or three very important pillars and you do deep damage to one of those pillars, your foreign policy is going to have to be completely changed and rethought. And the question then is, do you seek to repair the damage to the pillar or do you do everything you can to continue to alienate, antagonize, insult and patronize uh, the people with whom you're supposed to be having good diplomatic relations if you still believe that you need those two pillars. Now, if you think that you can live in a world which is uh, based on trying to get better relationships with democracies in the Indo-Pacific region, thousands and thousands of miles away, not our backyard by any stretch of the imagination, and starting from a very low base, that's fine as a, as a long-term ambition, but it strikes me as total delusion if you think that that's going to be the basis of your new foreign policy. So if that's what global Britain means, then global Britain is a delusion because you cannot have a global Britain policy without good, strong, constructive, productive relationships with European Union and European governments. And uh, tragically, uh, since uh, the 2016 vote, uh, we've seen nothing but a kind of campaign of, of seeking to chip away and undermine at that. And, and you know, I think fundamentally we, we have to say it, it's, it's been disastrous. Uh, so I think what you would see from a Labour government is an attempt actually, ironically, to channel our inner Churchill and to say global Britain has to rest on those majestic, majestic circles. It's time to have some grown-ups in the room who are actually going to take that policy forward. And if that's what global Britain means, then absolutely I'm on board. But global Britain without a Europe policy is simply a delusion. So, Matt, we talk a lot in government, uh, when we're nerding about government, about silos. You're head of Europe strategy and expertise at the FCDO, but you presumably have colleagues who are geopolitics, global, global people, you know, how does the FTTO reconcile this sort of our answer Stephen's challenge that actually you can't have a sensible global Britain strategy when you have a strategy that at the moment is quite antagonistic towards the European Union? What would the Foreign Secretary say actually makes us all cohere as global Britain? Or is actually there's just a phase we're going through, we have to get over that, both sides, as David Frost said, have to learn to live with each other in UK, EU to realise the full vision of global Britain? Thank you, Joe. I think, I mean, I think we are learning to live and work alongside each other collaboratively, the UK and the EU. Clearly, we have um, a disagreement at the moment about how best to reform the Northern Ireland Protocol to make it work. Um, but as we've seen from the excellent cooperation between the United Kingdom and its European partners and the United Kingdom and the European Union since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, um, the two sides are capable of working together to provide the Ukrainians with everything that they need to win be that um, weapons, be that diplomatic support and the crucial votes that we saw in the United Nations that the UK was um, uh, crucial in, in delivering to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, be that um, coordinating with our European Union and European partners through the G7 and through the UN, be that through the bilateral agreements that we've recently signed with um, Sweden and Finland to support their application for membership of the European Union, be that with the accords that we've signed with the Poles and the Ukrainians. So bilaterally and with the, Europe, and with the European Union itself, uh, the United Kingdom is working together very well to give the Ukrainians the support that they need, which falls clearly under the moniker of, of Global Britain. And I would say, and the first question that came up, it is clearer now what Global Britain is, as we've seen from our support for uh, the people of Hong Kong, people of Hong Kong wishing to settle in the United Kingdom, to the AUKUS initiative, for example, uh, through Chogham, which of course is taking place, Commonwealth heads of government, the UK's leading role in that. So we are, we are by no means the only global European power, but we are perhaps a little more global than the average. And Global Britain's been quite clearly set out as a strategy, as a, as a concept, and the tools to deliver it through the integrated review. Part of that, Jill's asked a bit about machinery of government changes, um, has in, resulted in a reconfiguration of the, the Whitehall architecture, a larger foreign commonwealth and development office folding into that, um, the former Department for International Development. And the government strategy is to bring all of our foreign policy mm -hmm. tools under one single umbrella so that my colleagues out in the, in the network 
um, are speaking for all of government so that we are working together um, collaboratively and effectively to deliver for the British people overseas. So Stephen, just to come back to you, I mean, that's, as you painted, quite a good picture that notwithstanding sort of arguments about the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, bits of trade friction and things like that, actually, you know, when it comes to the big issues, and what Claire Fox in our earlier session might have called the sort of big issues going on, actually the UK is working quite productively, both bilaterally in Europe, but also with the European Union as a sort of institution. Do you accept that, or do you think that's... Well, I think we can't really get away from the elephant in the room here, which is the uh, disagreement over the Northern Ireland Protocol. And the real challenge with that is that it goes to the heart of um, trust and whether you can build your reputation as a country that is a country that respects the rule of law, uh, that practices what it preaches, all of the things that you need to do in foreign policy um, if you're seeking to take a wrecking ball to an international treaty that you yourself signed uh, a very short time ago. So th I think if, if we can get over the issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol and find a resolution to that, which doesn't end in a trade war with the European Union, then it may be possible to work more effectively. For example, you know, I'd really like to see... Uh, the Lancaster House Accords, the military cooperation with France being deepened. Uh, you know, France is the only other uh, significant uh, military power in Europe, and, and we should be seeking to really deepen that. And it's been great to see the end of the kind of naivety and complacency around the way in which many European governments have, have uh, dealt with Russia, and of course our own government in particular, with London becoming uh, awash with Russian money, with mm -hmm very large uh, donations to the Conservative Party from uh, people with very close connections to the Kremlin. You know, I'm, I'm glad that we're seeing the back of all of that. Uh, and that's the basis for better cooperation. But when you have a fundamental um, blockage in the relationship, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol, it's very difficult to see how you move on to uh, better and greater strategic dialogue uh, in that context. I mean, it's difficult to see how we get around that obstacle at the present time. So, Anand, is the Northern Ireland Protocol row really acting as a big block? And actually, if it wasn't there, do you actually think that the UK and the EU have a view of how they strategically like to work together on some of these uh, bigger issues in the future? I mean, yes, the protocol is a massive block <coughs> because uh, it's reducing contact, it's reducing trust on both sides. It's reducing a willingness to collaborate more than they absolutely have to. In the unique circumstances of Ukraine, that's holding up quite well, but more generally, there's no conversations going on about foreign policy. Uh, so I think if that were resolved or if that were not happening, then at least the two sides could, sh could talk about what they have in common and they have all their vital interests in common. Uh, the one sticking point, I suppose, would be uh, whether or not the UK needs an institutionalised foreign policy relationship with the European Union. And on that, I think the jury is slightly still out. There are some advantages to having it. Uh, the UK maybe misses out on having a sort of institutionalised forum within which to talk foreign policy with the European Union. On the other hand, the European Union doesn't really have an offer for a, a state the size of the UK. So, I mean, do you want to talk more generally about Global Britain? or just so, Talk about more generally about Global Britain. Actually, on Global Britain, first thing I said, the first time I ever did question time, just as we were walking out onto the stage, a, a producer tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's always a really good idea to mention the name of the questioner in your answer. So I nodded. And about five seconds later, as we literally started walking, he grabs me from behind and said, but for Christ's sake, don't get the name wrong or you're going to look like a prat on television. Uh, but happily, I know Margaret. So Margaret, <laughs> thank you for your question. It's the first time I've dared to use a name for a questioner. Two, I suppose a couple of things to say about Global Britain. Firstly, it's a fantastic slogan. Say what you like about these governments. They have come up with fantastic slogans. Leveling up's a great slogan. And Global Britain was a great slogan for a time when people thought Brexit meant we were turning in on ourselves. I mean, it, it was meant to send a signal. And the answer as to whether or not we know more about it, I suppose, is yes or no. Yeah, no in the sense that no strategy survives first contact with the real world. And my God, has the integrated review had contact with the first world in the shape of Ukraine. But yes, in the sense that 
We now know what is meant by the Indo-Pacific tilt. It is things like AUKUS. It is things like being aware of the, the challenge posed by a rising China, while at the same time, as the integrated review says, our priority is your Atlantic security. So I think, I think that the Ukraine crisis and the, and the UK reaction to it has reassured a lot of our allies uh, that we're not turning our backs on Europe. So I think in that sense, it's clearer. I think Brexit has made it more important for the government to be active in foreign policy. There's nothing we've done post-Brexit that we couldn't have done pre-Brexit when it comes to foreign policy, nothing at all. But there's been more of a political will because the, <clears throat> the government's had to show that we are still there despite Brexit. And on that question about <clears throat> whether uh, we need closer rela <clears throat> relationships with EU states, I think, yes, my real fear about what happens with us being outside the European Union, actually, is that we are going to miss out, and we are starting to miss out already on a lot of key conversations that are now taking place between Washington and other European capitals because of the heft of the European Union. And I think those contacts with Washington are going to be the crucial things that we miss to an extent rather than anything specific with the Europeans. So, Anand, so this week, one reason why Nat is stepping in so nobly into this ministerial vacuum is that it's summit week mm -hmm. in the world. So we have Commonwealth heads of government about to meet in Rwanda. We follow that up with the G7 in Berlin and then on to Madrid where everybody can fry to death uh, the NATO summit, uh, which will probably be very hot. Um, so these are three places where the prime minister can go and really push forward and say something distinctive as Global Britain. No need for boring EU coordination or anything like that. It's never very big in any of these four anyway, but very much striking out. So what do you think the prime minister might be aiming to get out of those three summits? What should he be aiming to get out of those three summits? Uh, well, I think photo ops and good PR, first and foremost, like all politicians at these meetings. Uh, I mean, I'm going to answer that question with an anecdote from yesterday. I was on a panel yesterday at the Resolution Foundation with Maureen Khan, who is an econo uh, economics journalist at The Times, who used to work for the FT in Brussels. And she said something that I found rather terrifying, which was that she'd done an interview with von der Leyen. Uh, where von der Leyen had said to her, you know, at these, at these multilateral summits, we'll talk to our friends, but we absolutely won't talk to countries that are on our shit lists in a sort of informal manner. And the UK is on that list. So there'll be no marginal conversations of any note with the United Kingdom. So I think in that particular sense, the rather bad state of our relationship with the European Union is going to get in the way of us doing the kinds of business at those summits that we might But, does that do. just mean that, uh, you know, the Prime Minister doesn't get a sort of frosty 25 minutes with Ursula von der Leyen, but does talk to Olaf Scholz, does talk to President Macron, or is that sort of like a unified EU front of shunning Britain? That is not at all clear to me, to be perfectly honest. But I think at the moment, given the Northern Ireland Protocol bill, and how fractious that is, it's going to be hard for him to talk substance. Other than Ukraine, I think Ukraine is, is in a different box to everything else because it's so immediate. It'll be hard to have those substantive conversations with other European leaders at the moment, I think. Sophia, what would you be advising the Prime Minister if you called you in and said, I'm just brainstorming, you know, advisors, mm, want some outside ideas of what I should be using this mega diplomatic week for? What would you be suggesting he should try to get out of it? Well, you've got quite distinct aims for each of those different summits. I mean, I agree. I think together as, as a package, it's a pretty uh, unique opportunity for global Britain. Um, and we have to remember as well, we had um, the very uh, good fortune and timing last year as well to be hosting both the G7 and COP26 in the kind of first year after the publication of the Integrated Review. So we've done pretty well out of these sort of platforms and this combination of three things, I think in a way, will highlight some of Britain's kind of unique roles, um, not just in Europe, but globally. At Chogham, I mean, I think really there's a need to sort of steady the ship. Um, there have been obviously challenges around the leadership, uh, which we will be wanting to resolve there, but um, also just kind of move on and, and uh, try and reinvigorate uh, the whole sort of structure and efficacy um, and, and strategic relevance of the Commonwealth moving forward. I think p certainly in a post-pandemic and COP environment um, and with our new international development strategy having just been published, I think there'll be a lot of conversations around that. At the G7, um, 
I think it will be uh, difficult to avoid the question about um, the looming American midterms. This is a key opportunity to get Biden uh, ahead of that, um, committed to some things, shoring up some foundations for what could be a more turbulent period. Uh, because I don't think in the G7 we've quite had the reckoning yet about how we can have effective decision-making structures when America is not going to be always the driving centrifugal force in pushing things through. And at NATO, I think, you know, it, it will be an interesting demonstration of the UK. I mean, the UK said we want to be the leading European power in NATO. So we will obviously be wanting to signal that. But um, what will be interesting about that is um, it will reveal the complexity of NATO's decision making structures. Uh, there will be many areas in which the UK will align with Europe against America. There will be areas where we align with America against certain countries in Europe. There will be obviously many areas where uh, the French are against everybody else. And um, <laughs> obviously this trip to Turkey has been essential in kind of bridging some of that and some of the prep work. So. I think, I think we need to be really um, clear about the nuances in these things. The idea that Britain will be isolated, irrelevant, ineffectual because we have blockages in some of our relationships, I think is, is really um, a non-argument. There are plenty of other ways in which we will remain strategically important in those forums, not to mention the bilaterals that will be happening on the side in all of those different settings. I'm going to come with her. Please put your hand up in the audience if you'd like to come in. We've got a couple of people. Right. OK, we're going to take some questions to Stephen. So we've got a, a crop of people. So one sentence each. And I will cut you off ruthlessly if it's more than one sentence. So let's go to all the people here who are all sitting together. This looks like a conspiracy. But anyway, so, when, uh, this, uh, yes. so one uh, sentence. Can, uh, uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, I have about 10 commas to put in, if that's all right, to extend the sentence. So, uh, But I'll keep talking for as long as I can possibly keep thinking. And great to see global Britain, Britain in its place, uh, as what can it bring to the world. And I want to mention Afghanistan, and there are still people on the list who were promised um, and who worked for the British state in Afghanistan and who were promised to be brought home. And in the middle of Afghanistan, hasn't been mentioned today yet, in the midst of a pretty horrific earthquake, many, many right. casualties. Okay. Right, got that. Thank yeah. you. We'll do Afghanistan, yes. Um, I'd just like to raise the issue of, uh, ironically perhaps, immigration policy as being a, a positive uh, result of Brexit in terms of opening up the country to I increased immigration from outside of Europe. Now we can restrict the numbers from the EU. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Um, can you comment upon the contribution to global Britain of the trade accord with Liechtenstein and compare that to the trade accord with Australia, which is supposed to add, on the best assumption, 0.04% to GDP? Question about trade deals. And then one more question, and then we're going to... How much more difficult is our global uh, foreign policy made by uh, our dear leader, who the London ambassadors will report home, has a very flexible relationship with the truth. OK, that's an uh, interesting issue that came up in our first session as well. Stephen, we had a couple of questions there about um, Im refugee immigration policy. I realise they're not the same. Um, what do you think about, I mean, we're not really talking about Afghanistan. As we said, you know, earthquake yesterday, the Taliban appealing for help. Um, very interested to know whether you think we should be offering assistance to the Taliban. Obviously, you know, much less support going in as aid programs cut. And you know, what do you understand really is the problem with the Afghan resettlement scheme, which seems to just be an absolute bureaucratic nightmare? Yeah, uh, gr great questions. You know, we owe a debt of honour to those thousands of Afghans who did so much for the UK effort in Afghanistan, both defence, diplomacy, uh, and development, and many of them have targets on their backs because of the work they did for us. So this is a deeply moral issue. Um, it's been deeply disappointing to see that many of the Afghans who came under the Arab scheme, which is managed by the Ministry of Defence, are languishing in hotels, still not being properly processed. We have 12,000 Afghans languishing in hotels in, 
uh, in here in the UK. The Afghan Citizens Resettlement Scheme has only just opened. Mm -hmm. The promise was that it would be for 5, 000, up to 20,000 people, probably around 5,000 a year. Um, it, the statement that came out last week has magically cut that number to 2,000 uh, for the first year. It's difficult for me to see how they're going to get to the 20,000 target. So it's, it's duplicitous. It is uh, deeply um, immoral, in my view, not to do absolutely everything we can to support those brave Afghans uh, that did so much for us. And I wish that the Afghan Citizens Resettlement Scheme had actually been opened when it was supposed so to have been opened. Stephen, do you think it's, um, you know, as an ex-civil servant, I don't like to use this word, but do you think it's sort of incompetence or is, or do you attribute some of these things to months? Because obviously all the government is trying to run Afghan resettlement scheme. Nat mentioned the Hong Kong visa scheme, which has gone quite well. We've got the Ukrainian visa scheme. And meanwhile, anyone just wanted to bring their fiance in is finding you know, a bit of wedding lottery because it's very difficult to get a normal visa for anyone else out of the home office at the moment. And I know from Labour Party conferences that the cost of all of these is a big issue for a lot of, lot of Labour members, but it's the cost that allow us to have the capacity that we have. So would Labour just basically make us all visa processing officials to unblock this? Or quite, what is your solution to this? It seems yeah, to be we, quite we, bottlenecks. On, on the asylum, I mean, I, I don't know how far you want to go down into the, root, the weeds yeah. of the asylum issue, but in a nutshell, um, we have a kind of boring technocratic plan for this, which is A, open up the safe and legal routes, the Syria routes yeah. being closed down, Afghan route way too long to get sorted. Um, deal with, you know, there's also an issue around the highly centralised way that um, safe and legal routes operate through the UNHCR. We think there's a much better way of running that. Sit down with the French and the European Union and get a returns agreement in place. We have to put some skin in the game. That would be a negotiation so that we have a deal with the French and the rest of the EU, which makes it clear that if anyone comes on, an early, on, a, on a small boat, they get sent back straight away. But I absolutely recognise that the French and the EU are not going to accept that unless we have some skin in the game. So we have to sit down and negotiate with that. But of course, none of that's going to happen when there's a kind of endless war of words between the UK uh, government and the European and Union. The so we're back to square one, which is fundamentally, because we don't have a relationship mm -hmm. with the European Union, it is blocking right across the board. And that is really where I take issue with what Sophia was saying. I think the point with uh, uh, Churchill's mm -hmm. majestic circles is they're interconnected. And if you lose trust and engagement in one of those circles, you will lose it right across the board. And that uh, goes to what um, Anand said about what uh, von der Leyen was saying, is influence and trust and reputation are very, very difficult things to build. They take decades to build. They can be destroyed overnight. And I think that's what's happening at the moment. So Anand, um, this question, I mean, we're in a segment on global Britain here. Do you think that the, you know, acceptance of the government's new immigration policy shows that actually the people of Britain are more comfortable with a genuinely global Britain with a very different composition of the nation in terms of the shifts we've seen in non-EU migration and perhaps the, uh, the sort of losing salience of migration, inward migration, as a political issue. I think something very remarkable has happened to public opinion over immigration since 2016. Uh, and obviously, it seems to me that ending free movement is a key part of why that has happened. Uh, I'm not sure I'm entirely relaxed about the public remaining quite so calm about immigration, given the levels of non-European immigration we're seeing at the moment. I hope it does. Uh, but the, certainly there has been a sea change, and certainly there are real opportunities in the new immigration system. Uh, it's worth saying that there are also costs to ending the old immigration system, as many a farmer will testify to. So, I mean, there are downsides to this as well, but there are definitely opportunities to be had from the new immigration system. Sophia, I want to come on to the uh, other part of the question about Afghanistan, about sort of help. Um, what should people who cut their aid programmes and support to Afghanistan do in the light of the Afghan earthquake? I mean, should people be rallying around and giving money to the Taliban? to help with humanitarian relief in the light of the Afghan earthquake? Or you're allowed to have no view on that, by the way. Do, when you say, do you mean people as in the British as people in or the state? As in governments, the state. as in governments. Should we, should we say, actually, we make a humanitarian exception there? I'm quite difficult to Afghanistan since the Taliban took over. 
it, it is really challenging and um, there's no easy way around it. I think this is where our excellent uh, development and aid sector can be leaned on uh, to take the lead uh, because they will always prioritize need um, and uh, can be slightly less attuned to the diplomatic uh, imperatives and, and complications. I, I think it's very difficult for governments to say uh, that we will go ahead. I mean, the, the Taliban themselves is, is seizing this opportunity to actually reinforce its sort of claim to be a, the legitimate governing body in Afghanistan, which of course it is not formally recognized as. Um, so I think we need to be very aware of that. Um, look, we, we have to be aware that that whole process involves mm. levers on both sides. We are trying to extract concessions on human rights, which are absolutely fundamentally essential for the people there, particularly the women of, Af of Afghanistan, to whom we owe a huge responsibility, um, having been uh, involved in facilitating their freedoms and then um, having uh, overseen them being taken away. So I think we need to be very aware of that. I, I think the only way to get around that in the short term is, is for us to be sort of channeling money through these very effective development organizations, mm -hmm. many of which are, are based in the UK or, or have strong links with our government or receive a lot of government funding. Um, in, in the longer term, there is going to have to be some kind of solution, but I think it will be a, an ongoing process of negotiation. Can I just come back yeah. just quickly yeah. on, on, on Stephen's point? I absolutely agree that we are in a suboptimal situation in our relationships mm -hmm. with Europe. I mean, I think it's, a, it's extremely unfortunate, unhelpful. It, it is an obstacle to all kinds of um, cooperation that, that frankly, uh, both sides absolutely need to be moving forward with. Mm -hmm. um, I just contest the idea that we are not effective at all in those forums. I think that there are still ways in which we, we are still effective, not least of all because the EU itself is often divided, um, as we will see uh, in, in the NATO summit in some ways. Nat, I want to bring you in on trade deals. We were talking a bit there about uh, UK, Australia, obviously, this is one of the Brexit prizes, is the ability... Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein, uh, Australia. Liechtenstein, you probably know more about than Australia because you've got Europe in your job title. So where's the government going on trade deals? Oh, uh, thank you. I just wanted to, there was a, another comment yeah. that uh, some of the other yeah. panellists have yeah. made on contact with the EU and yeah. European governments as well. I just wanted to, um, to pick up on, uh, if I may, um, and just to say that... Um, from what I can see, from everything that I can see, there has been no uh, drop in the frequency and level of contacts between senior mm -hmm. officials and ministers and the prime minister with their European counterparts. There's been a very no, high that level. Can't be weeks. Tr that can't be true because you used to go to working groups all the time. People were always on the sort of Eurostar Since going over there. Ministers were sitting in councils on a... Yeah, they might have not wanted to go that much, but <laughs> by and large, they <laughs> did. They were in the room. Up. Yeah. I mean, you, you make a very good point about institutionalised meetings uh, there, Jill, but it, it is true that the frequency of bilateral contact, telephone calls between, the, between our ministers and their European counterparts, EU counterparts, between the Prime Minister and Mrs. von der Leyen, between the Prime Minister and Mr. Macron, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Draghi, and so on, remains at a very high level. There is so much to talk about. The food security, um, how to get grain out of Ukraine, sustaining Ukraine's ability to resist uh, Russia's invasion. Um, there's an enormous amount on the agenda, and, and those will be um, the points that the, uh, that the Prime Minister, that the Foreign Secretary and other ministers will be picking up on in the summits, of the, in the margins of the summits that are taking place this week, just as they always do. So I'm, I'm afraid I must, I must very politely say that I, I don't recognise that, and I think that is perhaps not quite entirely accurate. Coming back to the Northern Ireland Protocol, though, it is important. Of, of course we do not agree with the European Union um, on what next to do with the Northern Ireland Protocol. There are areas where we agree. We both agree it needs to be revised to make uh, work better. We both agree that some kind of mechanism needs to be put in place to triage goods as they go into the province from the island of, of, of Great Britain. I think where we'd probably disagree with the European Union is that if we disagree on one issue, in this case, Northern Ireland, that we can't talk about anything else. I mean, and we probably take the view, I think, that decisions need to be taken on their individual merits. So for example, if you take the United Kingdom's participation in EU programmes like Horizon, mm. we would say we, we should probably think about what is best for the advancement of human knowledge and science rather than our disagreement over Northern Ireland. Um, 
but that is a matter for the European Union, and we will continue to uh, to, to 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 take our. Uh, to argue that we should look at these issues separately rather than linking everything together. But there hasn't been a diminution in contact. On the trade deals front, um, the Prime Minister is off to uh, Japan, where he'll be talking uh, to his Japanese counterparts on exactly that issue. Um, we have round four of the UK-India FTA negotiations taking place, negotiations with the Canadians uh, this week too. Um, the gentleman's point about the, I mean, Liechtenstein and, and, and honourable um, uh, participant in the European family, of course, is very well taken that it is, it is quite small, but it is important that we, that we complete um, our arrangements, um, and including even the smallest European countries. Um, so, trade, so trade talks go on, um, and this is a long haul. We've already concluded a great deal. We aim to conclude a great many more. One of the advantages about being outside of the European Union is that the process is a little bit quicker because we don't need to move at the pace of the slowest EU country. Another one, of course, is that those agreements can be um, concluded in the interests of the British economy alone rather than taking into account a much larger single market. So there are some, there is a, there's a balance of things to take into consideration, but that, broadly speaking, is progressing quite well. So I want to come on to uh, another question. Uh, this is provoked by, uh, by a Mark English, who's in the audience. Oh. Um, it's about Brexit. David Frost this morning said Brexit's working. Mark, conversely, has asked, is it sustainable for UK firms to be at a long-run competitive disadvantage versus European firms? Anand, is the TCA here to stay? Uh, is it sustainable long term? Probably not. But what makes firms com uh, competitive is going to be a mixture both of trading arrangements and regulatory arrangements. And the missing bit, for instance, from that uh, Resolution Foundation study yesterday was what impact uh, regulation might have. And you can see a case where in emergent sectors, the UK government regulates more quickly and more effectively than the European Union. And you see, I mean, one of the things, one of the striking things about the Resolution Foundation report yesterday was the fact that uh, the UK is still top of the league in terms of foreign direct investment for European countries. Uh, that Europe is still attracting enormous amounts of foreign direct investment, which implies that there is something still about this country that will attract that money in. Uh, so I, I think. Obviously, the easier you make trade, the easier it is for companies based in this country. But I don't think you should see it simply in terms of the terms of trade, to be honest. Stephen, would Labour renegotiate the trade and cooperation agreements up for review? You might hope to be the government by the time it's up for review. What would, uh, what, how different would it look? Well, we're, we're forecast to have the lowest growth in the G20 next year, and we have the highest inflation. And... There are a range of reasons for that, of course, and there are global drivers, but uh, compared to our to similar competing economies, that is where we are, um, you know, lowest growth apart from Russia. Sorry, I should have said. Uh, so, you know, there's one clear reason that differentiates us from the rest, which is that we have put up barriers to trading uh, with 500 million consumers on our doorstep. And... Uh, the, the trade agreement that really matters is the TCA. We can do deals with Japan and Australia. Uh, it's going to make a minuscule difference. Um, we do more trade with Ireland than we do with China and India combined. So, you know, let's actually get real. Let's have a reality check about this, which is the only way to really, in terms of, there's many ways that we need to drive growth and productivity up. But one of them is absolutely clearly to remove friction with your biggest trading Partner. It's been a fundamental part of British economic policy for decades that we trade openly in order to drive up productivity and as a vehicle for growth. So everything that's happened in terms of the form of Brexit that this government chose uh, has militated against that and has been disastrous for our economy, disastrous for growth, disastrous for exports. So the answer to the question is we need to sit down and have a grown-up discussion with the European Union about sanitary and phytosanitary checks, about better alignment on rules of origin, about a veterinary agreement, about professional mobility agreements, so that we can begin to remove some of these frictions. Now, I, there was a very sort of abstract uh, statement uh, by one of the previous panellists about sovereignty. I knock a lot of doors in my constituency. 
not a single person in my constituency has used the word sovereignty. And there was people sort of talking about take back control. But what they want is a good job that pays a wage that they can raise their family on. And fundamentally, I think the big choice we have to make is, are we going to continue to obsess about abstract concepts or are we actually going to do something about the economic crisis that we find ourselves in? That's what a Labour government would do, is sit down, have that grown-up discussion and try to improve the TCA so that it actually delivers growth and jobs and productivity. So Labour wouldn't support Theresa May's checkers package, which sort of offered alignment, a common rule book on goods, uh, which arguably would have eased some of the problems of the Northern Ireland Protocol and had the backstop of a UK customs area. You decided not to support that. Meanwhile, the EU also made it clear that they didn't like that because they regarded it as totally unacceptable cherry picking. There is obviously the offer that the UK could potentially argue for re-entry into the single market and the customs union. So, so why would it be different with a Labour government that would enable you suddenly to go back and say, hi, actually some bits aren't working for us, we know it's working quite well for you guys, uh, you know, that frost didn't do a very good job, but can we have these bits that we rather like back? You know, why on earth would the EU agree to that? Well, as you know, I, I did not support Labour's policy for a second referendum. I felt right from the outset that we had to accept, I regret the Brexit decision, um, but I felt we had to accept it, and I argued in favour of a what became known as Common Market 2.0, effectively membership of the single market, I think, which would have reflected the very close result of 52-48 plus a whole... Is that what you're pressing to be as a manifesto? Is you... uh, I'm not, because I'm a realist, <laughs> and I think that... Uh, I think we have to go step by step. The, the relationship is so bad, uh, the destructive behaviour of the government has, has been uh, so pernicious that we have to start from where we are, which is a very low base. So let's be realistic and let's look at those issues, uh, do the, the hard yards in terms of sanitary and phytosanitary checks, alignment on rules of origin uh, and the other measures that I mentioned, and let's get that moving as trust building measures, confidence built building measures in any negotiation. You've got to start, if you're starting from a low base, get the confidence going, get the trust going. And who knows where we could go from there. But the reality is we're not, you know, we have to walk before we can run. Well, Nat, I'm not going to ask you to comment on, uh, on the sort of substance of the question because uh, I think we know what the government would say. But I'm just quite interested. Um, TCA up for review, even Lord Frost has said, you know, that there were areas perhaps where the UK was too ideological on mobility, things like that. Is the UK government doing any thinking, I don't have to tell us what it is, about the TCA review? Is there a little unit somewhere beavering away thinking, actually, where might we be worried, where might we want to see improvements? I mean, it's part of its Europe strategy, perhaps. Um, I mean, we, we, we know that the, t that the TCA is, of course, coming up for, uh, for review, but, of course, the priority is the Northern Ireland Protocol um, at the moment. And I think I would also probably... I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the discussion has been about the quality of the relationship between the UK uh, and the EU. And I think one of the things that I would observe from all of the engagement that I've done on the Northern Ireland Protocol with my European uh, friends and counterparts over the last few years, and I've done a lot of it, is um, I, I, I think that they're a lot less, and regrettably, they're a lot less interested in it than we are. You know, we would like our friends across uh, the European Union to take more of an interest in the problems of Northern Ireland because what I've found over the years is that when we can actually sit down and explain uh, carefully and, and factually and dispassionately the nature of the difficulties that the province faces, both in terms of getting the unionist community su to support the protocol politically, uh, and in terms of the difficulties that businesses face, then, you know, they are, they are very interested. We, and there is more work to do there, I think, in getting those arguments across. But having observed the uh, slight evolution of the Commission's position, we are guess it, moving in the right direction. Haven't gotten far enough, but, you know, we're not um, necessarily um, a million miles away. So um, there will be a question in due course as to, to, to look at the TCA, where it's working well and so on. 
Um, you mentioned the question of, of, uh, of, of what else could go in it. I mean, that will be a matter for the government of the day, of course, and it's a highly political question. Um, I don't want to stray too far into suggesting what things might be on the table and why, what might not. I think I might just permit myself to say that, yes, Jill, we are indeed thinking about that, um, but I'm not going to speculate as to what things could be dialled up, for example, or what things we might want to scale back in that um, in that relationship. There were many things in the negotiation where we would have liked to go a little bit further, but the EU was a bit reluctant, such as the mutual recognition of professional qualifications, which, frankly, we think would be in everyone's interest. Um, but, uh, but there we are. Um, the very same Mark who I fingered for that question. Hi. Um, I'd just like to come back on um, something that Anand said about trade and regulation. I know that both are important. But I think to use a phrase that's been used a few times today, the jury is out on how far UK regulation will diverge from EU regulation. And if it does, what good that will do to the UK. Mm -hmm. Most existing EU regulation is based on a wide consensus and on common sense, and the UK voted for it. So why would the UK want to change it now? And if it did, what would be the benefits? And how can that, my kind of follow-up question, how can that compensate for making it more difficult for any company in Birmingham to deal with a company in Bratislava or in Berlin than it is for those companies to deal with each other in terms of delays, red tape, extra costs, etc. It just okay. doesn't seem to me possible. I'm going to push that back to Anand. Do you want to take that one on? I think it's going to be more, as I said, in emergent sectors than in existing sectors. So it's not a question of diverging from rules. It's a question of in new sectors doing things first and doing things well. But that's not uh, what I'll... Jacob Rees-Mogg is inviting everybody to no. comment on on his famous website. And no. David Frost was waxing lyrical about the need for a strong sunset, which I should, is all I'm the existing I'm surprise stock. you now, Jill, by saying I don't necessarily agree with everything Jacob Rees-Mogg says. <gasps> OK. Breaking uh. news, everybody. <laughs> Go file your uh, copy now. This, this, this discussion is separate from the discussion about retained EU law. Uh, this is uh, a discussion about things like driverless cars, about gene editing technologies and things like that. And there, ultimately, the hope is that we can attract inward investment and regulate well enough to persuade the EU to follow the sorts of regulatory path we lead in. I mean... I'm not, I'm not for a moment saying that this is definitely going to happen. But what I'm, all, all I was saying in answer to you, Mark, is it's partly a question of how well you do things at home and partly a question of your trading arrangements abroad. And I'm not for a moment denying the importance of the latter. I'm just saying that you've got to look at the two together to get an overall picture. And for the moment, at least, I think particularly in a lot of manufacturing sectors like the car sector, people are just waiting to see what happens and not making decisions about relocating or anything like that. Stephen, if the government finds, if Jacob Rees-Mogg gets an entry into his uh, mailbox, which comes up with a regulation that genuinely would benefit UK firms really quite a lot, um, doesn't have any downsides in terms of regulatory outcomes, but would potentially be seen by the EU as unlevelling the playing field, what would Labour do? Assuming you get some sort of vote, because it's probably done by secondary legislation, which you can't do much about anyway. But assuming you got, uh, got a vote, where would you be? Would you be saying, no, nope, nothing, because we want to basically stay aligned and make it easy to do all these deals we're going to do if we get back in? Or would you say, we'll take the competitive advantage now? I think politics is always about priorities, and pragmatism, right? And, and it, in my view, it is anyway. It should be. It should be about what is actually going to deliver the most possible benefit for the British people, and particularly to that point about uh, jobs and, and putting bread on the table. That's the key consideration, in, in my view, rather than arcane and abstract discussions about sovereignty. So um, the answer to your question is you have to look at the impact uh, through that prism of what will deliver the greatest possible benefit. And if you're going to essentially bite off your nose to spite your face, cut off your nose to spite your face, sorry, by uh, doing something which might deliver some short-term benefit, but in the long term is going to make it more difficult for British small and medium-sized enterprises who don't have reams and reams of people to fill in all the forms and the mountain of red tape that they're currently suffocating under, then you've got to do what's right for uh, those those businesses. You've got to do what is right for the long-term 
uh, smoothness of the relationship, removing as much bureaucracy and red tape as you can. In that has to be the priority. But and divergence, yeah. divergence is a political choice in this case. I mean, if we're talking about the Northern Ireland Protocol, I mean, 80% of the Northern Ireland Protocol issues could be dealt with by an agreement on uh, sanitary and phytosanitary checks. So that's the pragmatic solution that we should be aiming towards. It's clearly a political choice by this government. They don't want to go down that road. And so it's politics versus pragmatism. And, and will Labour's view of trade deals depend on whether they make it harder to do a, an SPS deal with? Again, I think it's about the numbers. I mean, the reality is, as I said, we do far more trade with Ireland than we do with China and India combined. So you can have as many deals with China and India as you like. You fundamentally have to prioritise. It's the law of gravity, isn't it? The one, the one thing that all economists seem to agree on is that trade is defined by the law of gravity. And that means proximity. Geography is destiny. Whether you like it or not, our trading relationships with our neighbours, 500 million consumers on our doorstep, are always going to be deeper, richer, and more uh, productive and prof profitable than they are with countries thousands of miles away. It's the basic law of gravity, and not even this government can defy the laws of gravity. Economists always aspire to be real scientists. But anyway, Sophia, I wanted to come to you uh, with a sort of question. Nat has put a very reasonable position around about the Northern Ireland Protocol, because he's very good, a very good diplomat. Um, but quite a lot of other people think that, uh, particularly the way in which the government justified the Northern Ireland Protocol bill last week, uh, it's calling on this law of necessity, grave and imminent danger, etc., really was riding pretty roughshod around uh, rule of law and the UK's reputation as an upholder. We hear in other fora about the UK as an upholder of the rules-based international system that's part of what global Britain is about. Do you think that that's something we should be worried about or actually does everybody else think actually the EU, yeah, this Northern Ireland Protocol, it's a sort of yeah, a little local difference between the UK and the EU and they're both equally bad? I think the fact that the UK-EU relationship was sort of excised from the rest of our foreign policy and the kind of development of the global Britain agenda and sort of physically living in another um, part of government uh, for a while uh, was hugely problematic and I'm really relieved that it has been repatriated back into the Foreign Office and I think that that is going to improve uh, our foreign policy on many different dimensions in the round. Um, <laughs> But it, you know, I, it is impossible for us to not draw comparisons and, and uh, highlight interdependencies between our behaviors in different areas. Um, and I think what is very much a developing trend at the moment, and this is partly just due to the internationalization of media, is that the visibility of domestic actions um, in, in a kind of governance framework are, are, are becoming very much linked to kind of a foreign policy uh, political theater. And, and that's something where, you know, that we perhaps didn't have as much visibility in years gone past, and now we do. We can watch what's going on in America, there can be somebody, um, you know, in Australia watching the fact that, you know, we're putting this particular bill through and, and taking decisions around that. So I, I think we have to recognize that the way in which foreign policy is being made now is in an environment that is much more um, uh, exposed to, contingent on, um, and, and codependent with our domestic social and political situation, but also that there is an international audience that um, is, is much more attuned to the decisions we're making domestically, um, and that those are taken into account in our actions as a global actor. But I, look, I always come in somewhere in the middle in these sorts of things, which is, you know, I really, I, I, do not subscribe to the idea that Britain has somehow fundamentally, in every single way, damaged our reputational credibility in the same way that, you know, redu mm -hmm. temporarily reducing our um, international development budget from 0.7 to 0.5% of, of GNI, you know, 
that still has left us one of the leading global donors um, in, in development funds internationally. And I think, you know, this, this hyper-polarization in our politics where we sort of either, you know, with absolutism and the ideology is not going to help us anywhere. So um, I, I do think that we need to be attuned to our international reputation. I do think it really matters. It is particularly for a country like Britain where we... Um, we are specifically skilled <laughs> and, and given an opportunity and legitimacy to lead through our capacity as a convener, as a diplomat, as a broker. Those things really matter for us. But I do not think that we have sort of irrevocably damaged that in every way. Uh, there's no call for complacency. Uh, we need to be really careful about it. But um, I do still think that we are... Um, by many, many partners around the world um, considered to be very responsible partners. I mean, I think, to be honest, the, the, the just justification of the bill in terms of international law was pretty risible. Uh, I don't think the necessity argument carries any water at all. Now, I mean, Sophia's right. Will that completely undermine our ability to do international politics? No. Will it be used against us when it suits the interest of other states to use it against us? Absolutely. Might it damage our relationship with the United States, which strikes me as the big question? Yes, quite possibly. And I think for that reason alone, we need to be careful when thinking about this in terms of our international relations. OK, I'm going to move on to uh, another question. It's based on something that Simon MacDonald said in the geopolitics session. He was talking about the cost of intervention in Ukraine. And it was a bit of a question, you know, would the West still continue to foot the bill, he clearly thought we should. Uh, Sophia mentioned the aid cut, the cut from 0.5 to 0.7. Clearly, uh, Rishi Sunak said that the 0.7 would be restored, though maybe the economy will save him from having to do that by not performing quite as forecast by the OBR at the time of the budget in the autumn. But we also have pressures on defence budgets. Um, Stephen, um, Labour presumably has lots of ambitions to spend on lots of domestic things that people would like to see, as uh, backlogs right, left and centre in a lot of critical public services, but they're clearly sort of, you know, quite big pressures as well for much more spending on defence, security, potentially restoring the aid budget, and just the cost, actually, of keeping a Ukrainian war going for whatever. You know, do you think the government and the opposition should be a bit more honest with the British public that they are fundamentally going to have to foot quite a big bill for a much less secure global environment? That means they're going to have to just cut their aspirations on what they can have in terms of pay or in terms of public services? I think we make the case that um, the distinction between foreign policy and domestic policy is becoming increasingly difficult to see. Uh, what we've learned, for example, from COVID is how exposed we were and how lacking in resilience we were, how our supply chain, so complex and distant, so much of our national infrastructure owned by the Chinese government, for example, you know, 33% of Hinkley Point, 10% of Heathrow Airport. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've had decades of policy which has, um, well, certainly over the last 12 years, I think, turbocharged this uh, of, of selling off the family silver. And uh, I think that there's an appetite out there in the British people, amongst the British public, I hope there is anyway, to recognize that the lessons from COVID and from what's happened in Ukraine is uh, that we've got to get our own house in order and we've got to be prepared to invest in manufacturing and building more resilient um, critical national infrastructure and uh, not being ex massively exposed to risk uh, through having uh, often hostile foreign governments. Uh, fortunately, we're not as reliant on Russia, Russian oil and gas as as other countries. And I think this has been a learning point right across the board. We've been profoundly naive and complacent in the way that we've uh, dealt with, with governments such as the Chinese and the Russian governments. And that has to stop, that complacency has to stop. Now that is not going to come for free. It, we have to make the case that if we want resilience, if we want a strong uh, national security and defense, if we want to stop millions of, of Russian mon money washing through uh, London and and also we want to defend our democracy 
uh, we have to be ready to uh, pay for that. We also have to be understand the massive strategic value of our development program. You know, DFID is the gold standard of, of development across the world, and, and that's why I just think it's tragic uh, that we uh, haven't recognized that, the role that it plays in our soft power in building our international influence uh, and in dealing with one of the things that came up earlier about immigration and asylum seeking. I mean, so many of the, you know, we need to be working to stop the push factor. So it makes no strategic sense whatsoever to have this sort of false economy of cutting. I mean, so Labour is committed to getting the army back up to the level of 10,000 soldiers have been cut over the last 12 years from our army. We've committed to that. We're committed to having a development aid back up to 0.7. That's what global Britain means. That's what a Labour government would deliver. I very much hope that we can win the argument, but we've got to make that argument in bold terms and say, look, let's learn the lessons from the last decade or so of, of this complacent approach uh, and uh, let's move forward together, actually united. Uh, I think there's a really powerful narrative that we can put to the British so you, people on so that basis. So you've already won the argument with Rachel Reeves. So is the argument with the British people that they're going to have to pay higher taxes for all of this or that they are going to have to see longer hospital waiting lists or you know, less catch up in schools or whatever? Well, it's about growing the economy. So it's actually about creating jobs that are going to pay more tax into the exchequer to pay for our public services. Uh, that means having an active industrial policy so that you have, let's take the steel industry, for example, employs 4,000 men and women in my constituency, is also vital for our own supply chains, vital to our defence industry, vital to our sovereign capability and vital, of course, to the transition to net zero. We've also said that we would invest £28 billion a year uh, in, a, in a green investment pledge, which will be about I insulating people's homes and uh, in getting far more offshore and onshore wind so that we have a green industrial revolution. None of that's going to happen overnight, but I think if you've got a, a plan for the country, a mission, you can get people to say, OK, uh, we see the future in terms of growth. We know that that's going to generate more taxation uh, through growth and that's the way to pay and that's the way to get out of a recession the way to get out of a recession is not through false, through false economies and cutting and more austerity we've seen that that does not work and in the current turbulent and dangerous world in which we live it has real national security implications as well as economic security okay anand is that where the public is we were told that <laughs> One reason why uh, Mr Sunak was quite keen on the aid cut was it focus grouped well. Um, that mm -hmm. may not be the best way of running your foreign policy or indeed your economic policy, but uh, is there a public appetite for spending more on all of these things that Stephen's just outlined as well as on core public services? No, I don't think there is, and there certainly isn't at a time of a cost of living crisis. I think mean, Stephen's absolutely right in saying that there is a massive and close link between what happens in your country and what happens outside it. I don't think the public are there. As Rathin said in the earlier panel, you know, if we're going to pull out of Afghanistan and leave them to their own devices, we better increase the number of flights to Rwanda because the two are causally linked. And I think actually part of this is about having the conversation honestly that what we can do at home and the problems we face at home are linked to what happens in the world. An insecure and unstable Ukraine is bad for us here. An insecure and unstable Afghanistan as it happens is bad for us here but part of it too is about having an honest conversation about what we can do individually and what we have to do together and the scale of the problems you were listing Jill and there are an awful lot of them means we have to find ways of working collaboratively and constructively and in a proper burden sharing way with our allies uh, and having that sort of collaborative network, not just with the European Union but with other partners as well is absolutely fundamental so a bit more honesty in the debates and a bit more creativity in how we tackle things together, I would say. Nat. Thank you. I just wanted to say a word or two about international development. So the former Department for International Development has been folded into the new, a new department, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, but we preserve the expertise that our international development um, experts, um, valued colleagues have brought with them, and we haven't seen an exodus of personnel. The government has also set out um, a plan with two simple tests to restore international development spending back to 0.7% of GDP. It set those out last year. And um, they are, first of all, that debt to GDP should be falling 
and secondly, that um, we, the, bad, the, bu the budget is balanced on current expenditure. So those are the two rules. When those conditions are met, um, international development expenditure will move back up to 0.7%. But as Sophia has said, the UK remains one of the world's um, leading um, international development assistance donors. And just a final word, because I think, um, I think it's very important, Mrs Truss would certainly, and the whole government will want to emphasise this point, Winning, helping the Ukrainians win the war is going to be extremely expensive. It will be expensive in terms of the development and assistance and support that we su so have to supply. It will be expensive for the British people in terms of having to pay more for their energy and the resultant cost of living crisis that comes with it um, and the supply shock and so on. It, it is going to be expensive. Nonetheless, the government, together with our allies around the world, are committed to doing this because it is the right thing to do and because the cost of a Russian victory in Ukraine is far too high. And that was apparent to me when I went to work in the Russia-Ukraine crisis centre on the second day of the war. That was a decision that ministers took immediately. It's clear, it's obvious. Come what may, whatever it costs, the United Kingdom uh, will be, have to pay to put its hand into its pocket to help the Ukrainians. And one of the reasons that we're confident that our Ukrainian friends will eventually get to victory is because they have so many allies around, powerful, rich allies around the United Kingdom, who will do all that they can, uh, short of actually going to war with Russia, to help them. The United Kingdom, the United States, the European mm -hmm. Union, Japan, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the UK has been and will remain at the forefront of holding that coalition together, which is going to be difficult as the cost of the war continues to bite over the course of this year. But we will do that and we will stay the course with our European friends because it is the right thing to do. I mean, Nat, there was an incredibly critical NAO report, National Audit Office report, about the way in which the aid cut was implemented. The fact that you went from 0.7 to 0.5 so quickly meant that you basically just had to cut wherever you could shredded some bilateral programs, had to pay loads in contract breaking terms and things like that. Does that not cause concern back in SUDO that actually just going 0.5 and then turning it back to 0.7 is actually an incredibly inefficient and bad value for money way of running the aid program? I mean, it, it's, it, it, the, um, clearly there are some transition costs um, that are involved when you move from one policy position to another, but we will, if, at the point at which those two um, rules are met to increase spending back to 0 0.7, there will be adequate time to plan how you spend the money in a way that delivers value for money for British taxpayers and improves the conditions of uh, people living in the poorest okay. countries around the world. We'll have to, we'll have to hope that. Uh, I think the lady in pink wanted to say something. Um, just picking up on something that Anand said, I think about immigration. It's been a hot topic during the referendum. It's moved to the back burner. Wondering uh, if you could see any circumstances where this might turn into a hot topic again. Resentment rising perhaps with the economy doing uh, yeah. not well, uh, unemployment rising. And also a question, if I may, to um, you at the Foreign Office. Um, <laughs> taking back control was obviously, and taking back control of the borders was a very important topic. Now, you've opened the door wide to people from Hong Kong, and I really sympathize with the people, but what is the criteria there? Everybody can come in, 3.6 million people is my understanding. Okay, now, do you want to say anything quickly about the Hong Kong policy? Um, I mean, I think Anand mentioned that he thinks that the non-salience of immigration might not continue forever, mm. and those sorts of circumstances could be what leads it to kind of natural. I think uh, what 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 um, what both the Prime Minister and Mrs. Truss would say on the point of immigration is not that the British people were opposed to immigration per se, but they wanted to have mm. a degree of control and a say as to how that is managed, and therefore for their government to be able to make decisions. Mm. And if you cast your mind back to the days of Mr Cameron, that, that was quite problematic actually when it became difficult to, to look again at free movement of persons. And so within that mind, uh, with that in mind, the British government has chosen to provide a pathway to citizenship for um, Hong Kongers meeting certain criteria related to 
um, when they lived in, in Hong Kong in the days when it was a British overseas territory. So that's, that's very important. But we see that in other areas, again, with the Ukraine uh, settlement scheme, the Afghan settlement scheme and so on. But that's a, that is a political decision for ministers to take, which they, they are accountable to Parliament, to their constituents and to the British people for. And if the British people disagree with the decisions that ministers have taken, then, of course, um, they can express that discontent through the ballot box. OK, Sophia. Um, I'm writing a paper at the moment about uh, several areas uh, of public opinion that are very dynamic uh, in light of the cost of living crisis at the moment. They, they are immigration, uh, border control, and also the refugee pathway schemes, uh, net zero transition, and, and international development spending. Uh, my very recent focus groups suggest that these areas where we've actually had kind of majority support um, are starting to come under a bit of pressure. We should expect that they would because the circumstances that we're in at the moment in terms of generalized insecurity is not dissimilar to the austerity post-financial crash kind of mindset and environment and we know that one of the consequences of that is you start to have competition around access to scarce resources and there's very much a perception at the moment that the government's state resources are under a lot of pressure and state capacity is very constrained so I think we need to be very attuned to these areas and and we've already seen the government responding to that in some ways around the choices around net zero so um, definitely not something we can be expecting will remain very static. I would expect a lot of dynamism over, over the coming okay. months. Watch this space. I'm going to ask one last question. I'm going to exempt Nat from this question because uh, I think it's... Come in. <laughs> you can put your pen um, down there. This is a question. <laughs> Uh, we've got the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill coming up for second reading, as Catherine said earlier, on Monday. Um, so just completely unconnectedly, what role do we think former prime ministers should play in public life? Um, she said. I can't think why I made that connection. Stephen, ah, you've well, got some ex-prime ministers lurking yeah. around. I think the Tony Blair, I should be running Britain Instead conferences next week. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what role should former prime ministers play in public life? Well, I'm married to a former prime minister. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, I don't know whether that qualifies me it or disqualifies me. From, um, well. Being married to a former Prime Minister, I would clearly say you should do whatever a former Prime Minister tells you to do. Um, but from the more serious and political point of view, look, I, I think uh, people like Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, John Major as well, I think, you know, John Major has, has made a really uh, useful and constructive contribution to uh, the political discourse in our country um, since he left number 10. And uh, I think that it's, it's good. Um, it, it, we need people who've actually been there, who've been in the room, who can speak with experience uh, and can actually point out that so often there are unintended consequences, sometimes intended consequences that can be deeply damaging. So I, I would support it. I, I don't think that uh, former prime ministers should meddle too much in party politics. Mm. I don't think they should get too involved in giving uh, current leaders of a party instructions about what they should or shouldn't be doing. But I do think that they're a very good source of um, briefing and information about statecraft. Sophia, you're Australian. I've not said that before, but a lot of former Australian prime ministers rock up over here and give us a lot of advice. What do you think former prime ministers should do? Should I'm also British. <laughs> um, I, I mean, look, uh, Australia, uh, uh, Britain is, is sort of where um, it, it's both a sort of refuge and reinvention pasture for um, Australian politicians. Um, so you get uh, the good and the bad over here. Um, and always worth uh, just checking in how uh, some politicians are, are actually perceived by the Australian people. Not always, uh, they're not always uh, given the stamp of approval the ones that come over here and have the loudest voices. Um, but look, I, I, I think it's um, really good for people who've been in really senior positions to still be able to contribute intellectually. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it actually has been a rather unfortunate mm. development of recent years in British politics, this idea of a sort of real cleaning out um, when, when you have leadership changes and people resigning mm. and you're when not just losing 
PMs, but we're losing chancellors from, from Parliament. And, and there is a sort of counterfactual of sort of imagine if we were going through Brexit when we, if we still had more of these people actually um, there in the House. So I, I, I think in general it's something that uh, we actually do very well in Britain is accommodating the intellectual contributions of, of former leaders. Um, but uh, yes, I, I would also say that it's very important that we look to the future. Anand, Boris Johnson may be wishing on Monday that Theresa May had uh, had sort of taken the uh, peerage or decided to go and pursue other interests, uh, but she didn't. What role should former prime ministers should they put up and shut up, or should they? No, I think. I mean, I think the key is that they should intervene little enough that when they do, you take notice. Uh, which I think differentiates them from many former officials on Twitter who simply go on too much. I think, you know. If you really feel moved to speak on something, it, it makes a lot of difference if you're not often doing it. OK. Speaking as a former official, I'm therefore going to shut up and <laughs> thank my very excellent panel for that question time. Thank you for your participation. Thank those of you who gave me questions during the break. But thanks very much to Nat, particularly. Very well done. Yeah. Stephen, Sophia and Anand. And David Lammy should be imminent. Anyway, thank you all very much. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, yeah, thank thanks. You. Getting off home. No. I'm half tempted to sort of delay another couple of minutes because we're so proud of ourselves.
Secretary of State for, Commonwealth, for Foreign Commonwealth and Development Affairs. He's going to start off with a talk and then is willing to engage in answering questions and discussing what he said. So, David, without further ado, over to you. Thank you very much. Very great. We clapped David Frost before. Oh. If you clap David Frost, you've certainly yeah, got say. to clap me. Um, uh, look, thank you very much um, for inviting me here today. Um, you and colleagues uh, at the UK in a changing Europe um, are a really important resource um, uh, on these issues that we've all navigated for the last few years. Um, and it's been great um, to work with you, to be with you at what is a hugely important moment, I think, for the relationship between uh, Britain and the European Union. Um, and that's particularly true in relation, of course, to European security. Uh, we're now six years on from the referendum. Uh, the world has changed vastly uh, over that period of time. Um, there's been some progress. Uh, let's not forget that on the week of June 2016, England lost to Iceland um, in the Euros. Um, but to say that the years since haven't been challenging uh, globally would be an understatement. Back in the summer of 2016, the Trump presidency was just a danger on the horizon, not a surreal nightmare that we live through and which continues to put American democracy under threat. The Taliban, were on the fringes of Afghanistan, not in power in Kabul, and very few of us had heard of coronaviruses until a novel variant took millions of lives and froze economies across the world uh, and forced so many of us to miss out on the close relationships that we depend on. And now, of course, Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine has marked a return to large-scale war uh, on our continent. The last six years have upended many assumptions, exposing us to new threats and shaking the foundations of the international order. Uh, we face this from a new settled position outside of the European Union, but without a clear direction set for our foreign policy. The series of crises that we have lived through have made the world less stable. But I'm afraid the Conservatives cannot hide from the fact that their choices have left us more damaged uh, almost than any comparable economy. There is a consensus amongst economists that the government's poorly negotiated deal with the European Union has contributed to the UK lagging behind the rest of the G7 in trade recovery and except for Putin's Russia, which has faced unprecedented sanctions, the OECD predicts that next year the UK will have the lowest growth in the G20. The Office of Budget Responsibility still predicts that the government's badly negotiated deal will reduce the United Kingdom's gross domestic product by a staggering 4%. That's 100 billion a year in lost output. The Conservatives have turned us into a country of high tax and low growth. And the interrated review of foreign and defence policy that was trumpeted by Boris Johnson as the British tilt towards the Indo-Pacific uh, scarcely mentions uh, Europe beyond, of course, NATO. Just months after Boris Johnson claimed the old concepts, and I quote, of fighting big tank battles on European uh, land mass are over, he was proven tragically wrong. And the government's mistakes in foreign policy go beyond uh, Europe. It made short-sighted cuts to aid when global humanitarian need has never been greater. 
abandoning a cross-party consensus and a manifesto commitment, undermining our ability to tackle climate change, conflict and future pandemic. Billions of pounds of the defence budget have been lost in mismanagement and waste while the British Army faces further cuts. Instead of investing uh, sufficient resources in renewable energy at home uh, to reach net zero, Boris Johnson has moved from dictator to dictator with his cap in hand to beg for fossil fuels. Too often, the Conservatives have turned a blind eye to security concerns and human rights in our relationship with China, and Boris Johnson's government have done everything in their powers to damage the, the UK's historic reputation for upholding international law, from its reckless plans on the Northern Ireland Protocol to its unethical, unlawful and unworkable plan to send refugees back to Rwanda. The Conservatives have made the UK less trusted and more isolated on the world stage. The war in Ukraine is a turning point for European security. We have stood united in Parliament in our support for Ukraine's sovereignty and defence and our opposition to Russia's bloody war. But Putin's imperialism has exposed just how dangerous it is for the Conservatives to spend decades cozying up to Russian oligarchs, allowing their dirty money to pollute the UK economy, our politics and institutions. It also should remind the uh, government uh, what was always obvious. Even though we are outside the European Union, our geography matters. What happens on the European continent is fundamental to our security and our prosperity. We share mutual interests and democratic values with our European partners. Building and sustaining relations of influence and trust with them is in Britain's national interests. Even though we are outside the European Union, the British public recognises we need to be working closely with our closest partners. But instead of recognising that reality, Boris Johnson's Conservatives are stuck in a fever dream of 2016, picking petty fights with our closest allies instead of moving on and negotiating solutions. The government's position is that the situation in Ukraine is so serious that their law-breaking Prime Minister must remain in office, but apparently not serious enough to stop us starting a diplomatic fight with some of our closest allies. With inflation soaring, uh, with the country facing a cost of living crisis, with war on the European continent, this is the worst possible time for this bill to arrive in Parliament, and we're told it's arriving on Monday. Let us be clear, the dispute over the protocol is about the terms of the deal that the government negotiated, signed and campaigned on. And the government are now trying to convince people that their flagship policy was not a negotiating triumph, but a deal so flawed that they cannot even implement it. It was Johnson's deal that introduced barriers in the Irish Sea after he promised it would not. And there's no getting around this. I hope you held uh, Lord Frost to account for it. It was clear from the outset. Uh, it was by design a choice this government made and they must take responsibility for that. The situation in Northern Ireland is serious. Stormont is not functioning. Unionists feel their place in the UK is threatened. But taking a wrecking ball to the agreement will not resolve it. The protocol introduced to this House last week breaks international law. It risks the integrity of the Good Friday Agreement, one of the proudest achievements of a Labour government that brought a new era of relative peace and stability to Northern Ireland. It divides the United Kingdom and the European Union when we should be pulling together against Putin's war on our continent. And it risks causing new trade barriers 
in the midst of a cost of living crisis. It's not even enough to get the DUP to commit to return to Stormont. The only people that this bill satisfies are the ERG. The government's approach is not diplomacy, it's in the absence of diplomacy, the failure of negotiations, an ugly attempt by the Foreign Secretary to posture in front of backbenches, nearly 75% of whom, by the way, have lost confidence in Boris Johnson. The Northern Ireland Protocol will only make finding a resolution harder, and one of the most troubling aspects uh, of all of this is the dangerous legal distortion that's used to justify it. The doctrine of necessity is not an excuse for states to abandon their obligations. It exists uh, to do the opposite, to constrain the circumstances when states can legitimately claim their hand has been forced. It requires this action to be the only way possible to resolve the issue. But the government has not used Article 16 uh, and still says a negotiated solution is possible. It requires a grave and in peril, uh, a me imminent peril. But the government has chosen a route that will take months, months and months of parliamentary wrangling. It requires the invoking uh, state not to be, not to have contributed to the situation of necessity, and it will leave the rest of you to judge if the government may have possibly played some role. A doctrine of necessity exemplified 55 years ago in the crucial emergency action taken by Harold Wilson to tackle the oil spill from the Torrey Canyon uh, is now being used by Boris Johnson deliberately and needlessly to pour petrol uh, on the flames of this row. The solemn promise of international law depends on countries acting in good faith and upholding their commitments to treaties uh, that they have agreed. How would we react if a country we negotiated with did the same thing to us and just disregarded the commitments we had mutually agreed upon them? I have no doubt that Liz Truss would dismiss necessity as an excuse if an authoritarian state used it to justify its actions in breaking a treaty in the way that the UK is now proposing to do. And since she became Foreign Secretary, the Foreign Office has issued countless statements or press releases urging others to meet their obligations. Iran, under the JCPOA. China, under the Joint Declaration on Hong Kong. It just last night, the Foreign Office rightly publicly called on Bolivia, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Russia, Nicaragua, South Sudan, Eritrea and Ethiopia to meet their international obligations. To dress up her own treaty violation with this flimsy and transparent legal distortion damages Britain's moral authority and political credibility, undermining the international law like this runs counter to Britain's interests. It risks emboldening dictators and authoritarian states around the world. This protocol bill is a charter for lawlessness that serves the interests of those who want to weaken the rule of law. The government must take responsibility for their failures on the Brexit deal that Ney negotiated, but solutions are still achievable. A sensible and serious Westminster government would work with all parties to solve these problems because there is no unilateral solution. Only a deal that works with the UK and the EU, and most importantly, the people, communities and businesses of Northern Ireland will last. In government, Labour would seek practical solutions to reduce any checks to their absolute minimum, negotiating in good faith. We should be pursuing an agreement on food and agricultural standards that could drastically eat checks between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We want to see a data agreement to improve how we share trade data in real time. We should be negotiating for, the, for a risk-based approach for goods entering Northern Ireland from Great Britain. One option is to pursue uh, uh, in a proposal that goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland should be treated according to their final destinations. In negotiation based on good faith, it could be achievable for the UK and the EU to agree a Northern Ireland approved goods designation which could exempt products moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland 
from regulatory checks and customs requirements, as long as these goods meet specific mutually agreed conditions. This would not mean all goods escape checks. All other goods from Great Britain that are traded with Ireland and the rest of the single market would still face uh, checks, but it would greatly reduce the volume, number and frequency. Both the European Union and the UK would have to compromise to make this happen. But the last Labour government was able to broker the Good Friday Agreement, and we're confident that with trust and goodwill, we would be able to achieve it. Of course, it will take flexibility, uh, and I'm not one of these people that believes only the UK government needs to show that flexibility. The European Union must also be less rigid. But I've been told frankly by EU partners that if there were, uh, uh, was a partner that they could trust, they could show more flexibility. Instead, we have Boris Johnson, who lies, breaks the law, and never keeps his promises. And with a change of prime minister and a change of government, the UK could build a stable and mutually beneficial relationship with the European Union over the long term. We could operate in a new cooperative spirit, recognising our common interests, the new relationship we have, and adapting for the unique circumstances in Northern Ireland. We cannot keep being held back by this government's desire to pick fights with the European Union for domestic political reasons. The question this country faces is no longer leave or remain. We have already left. The questions people are asking is how do I pay my bills? How do I put food on the table? How will I afford heating this winter? How do I get an appointment to see my GP? What jobs and opportunity are there for my children? How do we keep our country safe? And only Labour wants to leave behind the binaries of the past and make our relationship with the European Union work. And to do it, we must look honestly at what's going wrong with the government's deal. It's not just problems over the protocol, difficult and important though they are. It's becoming clearer as we emerge from the pandemic and it recedes into view that the rest of Boris Johnson's deal is creating problems. Problems for exporters looking to access the uh, EU market. Problems for companies seeking to hire talent. Problems for industries and their supply chains. Investment is draining. Businesses are facing barriers. So a Labour government would seek to improve the deal, not by reopening it or renegotiating it. Keir Starmer has been clear. The questions that divided us for half a decade have now been settled. We will not rejoin the single market or the customs union, uh, which is why we need to be creative in building on the government's existing deal that we will inherit. As Keir told the CBI conference last November, Labour will work with business on a transparent and honest analysis that exposes all the holes uh, in the Prime Minister's deal and finds practical improvements that help businesses, help our economy, provide greater investment and opportunities. A Labour government would seek an agri-food agreement to improve the flow of food and help our exporters. We would seek regulatory equivalents for financial services, which is such a significant part of our economy. We'd strengthen mutual recognition of professional qualifications. It's an issue I saw close up in my last brief as Shadow Justice Minister. And because we need to give our world-leading financial and professional service businesses the ability to grow further, we would also aim to maintain Britain's data adequacy status so that our data protection rules would continue to be deemed equivalent to those in the European Union. This would make UK digital services companies more competitive and more successful. We would negotiate an improved long-term deal for UK hauliers to ease the supply chain problems that are holding us back. We would secure association to the Horizon Funding Programme so that we can restore our leading role in scientific collaboration. 
and restore visa-free touring for musicians so our cultural impact on the world can continue to be oversized. These steps are common sense in the national interest that make it easier for us to do business with the world's largest single trading bloc on our shores. And it's not only our economic relationship that must be improved. The next Labour government will prioritise working more closely with not within the European Union on foreign security and defence. We're proud in Labour that Britain is NATO's leading European nation. Britain's never uh, been signed up to the French-led concept of strategic autonomy or back to European army. NATO is Europe's defence alliance. Euro-Atlantic security will remain anchored in NATO and our commitment to the alliance is unshakable. But we can complement those NATO bonds with a new UK-EU security pact. We can stand firm in defence of democracy to deter Putin's imperialist urges. We need to tackle new threats in cyber and information warfare and cooperate on new frontiers like artificial intelligence and autonomous technologies, just as the uh, AUKUS pact uh, intends to do. And we can work together more closely on sanctions to maximise their effects, bear down on the dirty money that sustains kleptocrats and the tax evasion that denies funds to our public services, tackle cross-border threats like organised crime and human trafficking, ensure deep and effective police, crime and terror cooperation to keep people safe and negotiate a replacement for the Dublin Agreement. We must also work together to tackle the drivers of the global refugee crisis and in the fight against global heating, we can cooperate to accelerate climate action, improve energy security and end dependency on dirty fossil fuels. There are different models for how a security relationship could work. What matters most is how we can improve the security of the British public. It's now more important than ever to have a good and constructive relationship with our European partners. In a cost of living crisis and while war continues to rage on our continent. The last thing that the British public needs is a government issuing a charter of lawlessness to pick fights with our closest allies. It is in the national interest to build on the government's poorly negotiated deal to leave the European Union so that we can do more business with Europe whilst outside the single market, solve the problems created by Boris Johnson's protocol and make our whole continent safer with a UK-EU security pact. This is not just about foreign policy as traditionally conceived. It's also about how politics outside of our islands affects us domestically. To be secure and prosperous, we must tackle global corruption and illicit finance, work to build a fairer, global trading system, stand united in defence of democracy, human rights and the rule of law, values the UK and the European Union both share. A Labour government will end the era of acrimony with the European Union and start a new constructive relationship with our neighbours based on security, prosperity and respect so that Britain can once again be a reliable force for good in the world. Thank you very much. David, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Uh, we're getting questions in on Slido, but let me just kick off. I mean, it's the anniversary of the referendum today, which always makes me sort of look back a bit. And in the light of what you've just argued about we need a closer relationship, we need to avoid the problems of Northern Ireland, didn't Labour make a catastrophic error in not backing Theresa May's deal? I don't think it's helpful to look back. I really don't. Uh, I was there. I've got the scars on my back. I helped lead the second referendum mm -hmm. campaign. Um, I, we've just got to move on. The Labour Party at the moment um, is positioned as a party. And I thought it was, you know, trying not to be partisan 
I'm not sure Theresa May would have put herself in a position as she negotiated a deal where she stood outside number 10, as Boris Johnson did, and effectively said, I'm now going to lead the country and I'm just going to lead it on behalf of one side of this argument. Now, that has been deeply depressing to watch. The Labour Party is determined uh, to move on from Brexit, to govern on behalf of those who voted leave, those who voted remain, those who've changed their mind, those who are indifferent. Um, I just don't think it's helpful to go back. We are where we are. Um, uh, I have to say, as I've been around Europe, been to Germany twice, um, Finland, Sweden, um, it's clear to me that they're just aching to get back, to calm this thing down, to get back to a degree of normality, to get back to partnership and close working. And that's what the prospect of a Labour government represents. And that's why I've outlined some of the areas that we can work on. Clearly, as I said, as night follows day, as the pandemic recedes, um, as a cost of living crisis and inflation hits, likely there'll be a recession in the UK. And sadly, there'll be a recession in the European Union. Um, people will begin to deep dive in far greater ways and economists with big minds, businesses also looking at these issues, focusing on what the consequences are of being outside the European Union, both for Europe and for us. And indeed, it will be for Labour to respond to those issues as business particularly um, says that this would, this, would, this would help us, this would help us. But, but we're, only, we're only just coming into that zone now that the um, pandemic is receding. And I, I've outlined the areas where I think we can make a difference as of today. No doubt there will be more over the next two years or so. Okay. But I mean, I suppose the, lo the logical extension of that, I mean, if I, owned, if I owned a business, I'd say, David, can we rejoin the single market and the customs union, please? Because that is the simple best way to uh, help our economy at this moment. So yes. What, but Two years after that Britain has made a different, well, six years on from the decision that Britain's made, uh, I've made it clear that we're not, enter, we're not going into the next election mm. uh, saying that we will enter the single market or the European Union. You might not like that. I understand why you don't like that. But Labour is, de is determined to govern for the entire country. We cannot have a rehash of people in constituencies like mine that have a particular view. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I don't know, I, I really don't know if all business share that view. If that view becomes bigger across the country, and if the British people appear to be in that place, then we can have that conversation. But I recall another conversation. Mm -hmm. It was a conversation about skills. It was a conversation about our labour market. And I knocked on doors in Yorkshire. Um, and in fact, I knocked on doors in Wakefield last week. And people were raising. Um, issues of immigration and the labour market and them not being able to access jobs. That, as I said in Parliament, in a, in a pretty well, in a, in a speech that went virtual, that is a, we have to do better on skills in this country. Well, now as a government, we can get on and do it. Perhaps when we've done that on behalf of those people um, who voted leave, uh, there might be space for a different kind of argument. But I suspect I will be out of Parliament at that point. So, I mean, I don't want to mischaracterise your position, but is it basically that in your heart of hearts, you know that in economic terms, being in the single market in the customs union will be best, but in political terms, it's unsellable? Is that essentially what you're saying? I, I'm saying that the British people have made a decision and we have to honour it. Okay. Uh, we went over that several times. We're not going over it again. Uh, and I'm afraid psychologically, folk have got to come to terms with that, as hard as they may find it. Wouldn't the sort of things that you're proposing almost put us in the worst of all worlds? That is to say, we're going to be outside the European Union, but we're going to be a rule taker. I mean, for instance, why would a financial services sector as effective as ours, if we're not round the table making the rules, isn't the worst of all worlds to be out and accepting their rules under some sort of equivalence arrangement? Well, that's a, that's a process for negotiation. Um, um, and, 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 and compromise. That's an area in which we might make that compromise, but that's where we've, I think we, there are areas where we have to work together. Financial services, the service economy is about, it's over 70% of the UK economy. It's hugely important.
And just on the protocol, I do want to move on to foreign policy. I'm not going to sort of get bogged down in this. But just quickly on the protocol, it seemed to me that the one missing element from what you talked about was the DUP. Uh, what if your proposals weren't enough for them to go back into a power sharing ar arrangement? What would you do at that point? Well, that's a sort of what if question. Yeah. Uh, they don't seem very happy with what the government are proposing. Um, I, I think that there's an absence of leadership full stop in relation to Northern Ireland and that, you know, I think that there was a a position, not that I wasn't just under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, it, it actually, um, John Major exemplified it as well, but honest brokering uh, with all parties in Northern Ireland and we seem to have lost it. Um, as I say, if, you, if, if we can negotiate a Good Friday agreement, surely we can negotiate agreement, uh, the lion's share of which will be solved by a veterinary agreement. And then we can work with hard graph on the remaining 20% or so of issues that remain. Um, I, I'm really confident that we would get a deal. Um, and, and a deal that, of course, we all want to see the DUP come back to the table. OK. Now, you talk about this sort of tripartite arrangement in security where we have the UK, the EU and the United States. Is that a reliable model in a world where we might get a second Trump presidency? Well, look, I mean, I think that um, just to step back a second, I, I do think that um, Donald Trump coming back into the White House represents a change in certainty mm -hmm. in the United States um, that has been consistent through Republican and Democratic uh, presidents. Um, uh, and if he were to take up the postures he's taken previously, um, that is obviously a threat to NATO. Uh, and he took uh, sort of historic positions in relation to Putin and Russia that I think sit outside the general mm -hmm. established norm. Um, that's an elephant in the room, and it's in part not just because of the uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine by Putin, that there is a, a lively debate um, um, in Europe about what more European partners can do. Um, and I think that's also, as we look also at some of the issues around modern warfare, and we learn um, when you look at the sanctions regime, when you look at the consequence of energy dependency and moving on uh, in terms of energy and climate, uh, when you look at cyber, uh, there are issues that are not traditionally within the purview of NATO. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, clearly, the, the UK has taken a historic position that's been a bridge between um, Europe um, and um, our colleagues in North America. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an Atlanticist. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I studied at Harvard. I worked um, in the United States. Um, uh, so I think that there is a position for us. We have to be in the room on security and cooperation. By the way, with the Zeitenfender that's taken place in Germany and their huge um, vault fast in relation to spending. There are also significant procurement issues. We don't want duplication across um, France, Germany, um, the United Kingdom. We want to work in partnership and play to our um, various strengths strategically in the areas of defence. So for all of those reasons, I think that this is um, a new pact, is, is one important approach, but of course uh, this is something that we would went into negotiation. I do recall um, and uh, that um, there were suggestions of this kind uh, as part of um, the Brexit negotiations. They were dismissed uh, by this government. Um, um, again, you see how they may well have been out of step with what could or could not have emerged um, in, 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 in Europe. So I think that um, a Labour government would seek to be as close as we can to our European partners on issues of security. And I think that there is a conversation and a development now beyond NATO. So you, you would do what Theresa May was going to do and which Boris Johnson refused to do, which is to have a formal security arrangement between the UK and the EU? That's what I'm indicating. Yeah. And what, would that, how would that benefit us? 
I mean, there are some well, I people think it who benefits say, all of Europe, where it's a very no, dangerous but, time. No, sure, but there are, there are some people who say, actually, in the area of security and defence, because most of it is intergovernmental anyway. Well, I know you've traditionally been a skeptic in this area. I'm a skeptic about everything, and that 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 that's fine. Um, uh, but I uh, and, and you would have kept your, you would have had a skeptical position prior to the invasion of Ukraine. I'm suggesting that the Ukrainian UJ may have changed mm -hmm. the nature of that conversation, notwithstanding what Theresa May was seeking to negotiate, uh, and the nature of war in Europe, how that's taking place, th the implications. Uh, that go way beyond NATO's remit are significant. Um, we're not in the European Union here in the UK, but of course we, we need to be in those conversations in relation uh, to energy, to sanctions. There'll be other issues going forward. So that's the added value, I think. Um, that's the conversation that European allies are having. Uh, the question is, does the UK want to be part of that or does it sit out with that? That would be a peculiar decision given that we... Uh, alongside France and then Germany um, in about a decade, 15 years' time, uh, are such a significant military power. It would be strange for us to sit outside of that. Okay. I think, I, I think the other mention, of course, which, which, which strategically is to recognise um, in this multipolar world, uh, uh, China and the Indo-Pacific, and clearly the United States is going to be considerably stretched. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the other reason why I think this debate has taken a renewed momentum. I mean, there are a lot of questions on the slide, which I'll summarize as, isn't Labour going a bit easy on the government in criticizing its approach to Brexit? And why isn't Labour making more of this? Do you think that's a fair criticism? No. You think Labour are... Well, I don't, I mean, look, I've been in politics 22 years. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and let's look at the empirical evidence. Uh, uh, we've had a pandemic uh, that has dominated the, mm -hmm. na the, the national conversation. Uh, we've then had a war in, Uc in, 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 in Europe, most of which, well, has just been horrendous and many of us have thought to be unbelievable. Um, I think there was tremendous fatigue uh, in the UK uh, after... Uh, bre after Brexit and the decision to leave the European Union. Um, and uh, I was very clearly on one side of the debate. I recognise that many in this room are on one side of the debate, but relitigating the debate doesn't change the outcome of the debate. So it's not about Labour being quiet. It's about Labour wanting to focus on issues that people on the doorstep are raising. And I've got to tell you, I think I probably knocked on more doors than most of the people in this room, and they are not raising Brexit. They just aren't. They're raising their kids' schooling uh, and recovery over the pandemic because their kids have been out of schools. They're raising their children's mental health. They're raising cues in the NHS, uh, getting cancer treatment. Uh, uh, those are the sorts, they're, they're raising crime in their neighborhoods. Those are the issues that they are raising. And if, the, and if Labour isn't talking about those issues, it's not coming back to power very quickly. Okay, now given all those issues, we had an interesting conversation in the last panel about the fact that, you know, we live in a very unstable world, the challenges facing us are huge, and the challenges facing us are potentially incredibly expensive. And, you know, in, in your speech you talked about the need to do more on development aid, the need to do more on military spending. Are the public ready for expensive, I mean, you know, rebuilding Ukraine is going to cost a lot of money over a long period of time. Do you think the public are ready for those sorts of incredibly expensive international commitments now, or is the focus very much internal? Do you think you can win that argument with the British public? Well, I mean, clearly, significant problems without passports are issues that have a profound effect on the UK economy. Um, climate uh, and Boris Johnson's botched leadership of COP26 has a significant effect on our economy. And by the way, it drives migration, uh, particularly from the Horn of Africa um, and the Middle East. Um, the war in Ukraine will clearly, um, and the blockade of Odessa particularly, um, will clearly drive mm -hmm. um, a serious problem in terms of global hunger. Um, cutting UK aid by 37% um, and Handy, uh, and, and of course, alongside that, uh, increasing the share of money that 
clearly is going to Ukraine at this time, does not, is seen in the global south, does not win allies. I think there is a changing debate on aid and development. Let me give you an example of this. Um, when I came into this post in November, much of the discussion was the inability uh, of the global south and particularly uh, 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 many countries in the continent of Africa to vaccinate their own populations. There are still some countries in Africa that have got to about 20% of their populations with one vaccination, never mind the four or five that we have in our own country. Now that is in part about the, the, the generosity uh, of the West, but it's also actually uh, 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 raises a bigger question which is about manufacturing capability mm -hmm. and IP in Africa. Well, in a forward-looking country like the UK, with the science base that we've got, with the, with the innovation we've got, with the higher education, we've, ought we not to be in better partnership with initiatives that are taking place in countries like South Africa to actually get Africa that manufacturing capacity? So I don't think it's just about aid in a conventional sense. Mm -hmm. It's about innovation as well. Okay, we have been beaten by the clock, but I'm going to ask you one more question, which requires a one... I mean, Vijay always accuses me of ignoring his questions, and the handy thing about this question is I know how you're going to answer it, and it's a one-word answer, and I'm not quite sure why he's posed it. I'm going to pose it to you. Who should people vote for in Wakefield today? Oh, that's a great question. I suppose Lib Dems is two words, so if you go for them, then... <laughs> Look, I... Um, I think that... Tomorrow morning, I suspect that there will be a very rich discussion on why the Conservatives have done so badly in these two by-elections. I think Boris will be back on the ropes. And by the way, um, I think by Monday afternoon, when he introduces this outrageous bill, as I've signalled, we're going to see rebellion in his own ranks. Uh, in relation to this decision to tear up international law and step away from an agreement that they've negotiated. And I suspect there'll be some pretty heavyweight figures on the Conservative backbenches that will be raising those issues. So I suspect we're in for a few days of unrest. Uh, it's not for me to predict where that will lead, because I'm not a Conservative. Um, uh, but I do know, historically, that they can be pretty ruthless at getting rid of their leaders when they do when they no longer appear to be vote winners and my sense is um, uh, whilst i recognize that boris johnson and has has had a certain kind of charisma historically not one that i found very attractive but i've got to concede he has got a certain kind of charisma um, his ability to be a vote winner um, is fast losing ground and that's why I think he's on the ropes in his own party. So, and, and I've, my feeling is, having knocked on doors in Wakefield, that they're going to send a resounding rejection of Boris Johnson. But let's wait and see. Polls close at 10 o'clock. David, I'm sorry that this has been so short, actually. There are, I've got a hundred more questions I could have asked you, but we're due to finish here at five. So can I just thank you very, very much indeed for coming and speaking to us today. <laughs> Before we wrap up, let me thank all of you uh, for sticking with us all day, for asking your questions on Slido. Just to flag, uh, we've got a series of events in July on the back of a massive survey we've done of people's opinions about levelling up and what it means and what it should mean. And you'll see details of all that on our website. But for the moment, uh, enjoy what looks like the last 24 hours of summer. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks.